All right, everybody ready? We are live on the streaming. Uh, and so I will call the meeting to order. It is 5.04 p.m., uh, a special meeting of the governing body on November 30th, 2022. Uh, let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councillor Cassett. Salute to the New Mexico flag led by Councillor Merriworth. Invocation followed by remembrances led by Councillor Chavez. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really wanted to, we had a wonderful holiday um, beginning, thanks to our city clerk's office with the lighting of the trees. And so I just really wanted to focus on the holidays um, this evening and the fact that it is my favorite time of year. However, this year I had a loss, um, a cousin of mine that kind of brightened up our holidays. Um, and as I connect with people around me, coworkers, friends, I'm often reminded that as much as I love the holidays and how um, I kind of go crazy, I'm like a little Christmas elf my, myself, it is a difficult time. Um, the holidays are a very difficult time. Um, there's a lot of burden, there's hardship, there's the weight of the world. Um, I have been reminded by all of this and the feedback I've received from community members during this time. Um, that as beautiful and joyous as the holidays are, for many, they also come with sadness, loss of love, or what once was, loneliness, financial burden, hopelessness, helplessness, and heaviness of the expectations life throws at us. However, the light to this holiday darkness is connection, and I wanted to remind us of connection, something we are all capable of giving, a check-in to say hello, a smile, an offer to help, an invite to a holiday party, sending a holiday card, or even the reminder to someone in need that it's okay to not be okay, but that they're not alone. It's something we are all capable of giving. I wanna take this opportunity to remind our community of the power of connection and love during this holiday season. We all need it, and we all can be healed in so many ways by giving it. Remember to shine a little light this holiday season so we can brighten the season up a bit for those who need it most. I have made a commitment to do this myself the best I can and have been focused on a quote from Mother Teresa. She said, spread love everywhere you go. Let no one ever come to you without leaving happier. Tis the season for giving and the greatest gift you have to give is free. I challenge our community to spread the gift of love connection, care, compassion, and kindness to others this holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Um, remembrances, let me just see a hand. Yeah, Councilwoman. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, I was gonna say Amanda, <laughs> because it was so personal. Thank you for the, the blessing. And I just wanna recognize my cousin um, who passed recently, um, David Davy Griego Jr. Um, he was such a generous person, um, always affectionate with his family and friends, and always caring of others. And he had his struggles, but always had a loving heart and always um, gave that generously to others. And just wanted to send my love to my family and his friends and just want to recognize Davey and now that he's at peace. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have two remembrances. One is the anniversary of the passing of my cousin who um, passed on Thanksgiving two years ago, three years ago, three years ago now. Um, and we, we miss her every single year. Um, this year was very bittersweet because her sister gave birth to a little baby girl who she named after her sister. And it was uh, really beautiful to see that and to see her her legacy carried on. Um, I also want to recognize the passing of Mikey Ray. Uh, many people know Mikey as one of the artists of Meow Wolf. Um, 
I was, I was actually trying to remember, you know, when did I first meet him? He was just kind of always part of the landscape of my Santa Fe. Our families, um, our families, you know, would, would go on these large vacations this, to spring break and, and his family was part of that. Our brothers played sports together. He was just kind of always there, but really where we kind of, you know, connected was when we were both at school together at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. Um, for those of you who are unaware, Portland is very, very rainy <laughs> and we're two desert kids. Um, that can be, that can be a little tough. Um, and so I, I was a couple years older. And so when I first saw him at campus, I said, you know, when it gets gray, don't worry, I've got green chili. So every time I would see him, like, how you doing with the weather? Don't worry, I've got green chili. Don't worry, I've got green chili. And finally, there was one of those days where he said, you know what? Yeah, I really need some green chili. And um, came over and we made quesadillas because that's about what you can make in dorm room. Um, and talked about, you know, how much we missed home and the things, you know, it's his first year gone. And so missing fiestas and missing Zazobra and um, the fact that the rain doesn't smell right here and it smells green and that green actually does have a smell, which most people don't think it does, but it does if you go to Portland. And he just always carried that New Mexico sunshine with him. And I, and I just remember seeing him around campus um, and especially those really dark days in February when you're pretty sure the sun was never gonna shine again. And seeing him there always just really lit my heart. Um, it was so wonderful to see him back in town. I know a lot of people will be speaking to the immense talent that he has. I recommend everybody, you know, go online, take a look at his artwork. He really had this, this wonderful quirky sense of kind of calling out the world that I just really love. Um, and he will be deeply missed. And, and my condolences to all of his friends and to his, his really incredible, beautiful family um, that I know that I'm sure their hearts are breaking. So thank you. I'd like to mention three people we lost. Um, Diana Albert, uh, was the municipal judge at the village of Los Ranchos de Albuquerque and a former Los Alamos counselor, former Mayor Joe Valdez, who held office between 72 and 76 and was a founding member of the Caballeros. And then a dear friend of mine, uh, some days gone by, Mike Perchuk, who lived here, but he spent much of his life in Washington, D.C., where he was chief of staff for uh, the legendary senator from Washington State, Warren Magnuson, head of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, without him, we would not have cigarette warning labels uh, on our cigarette box. Mike was a giant and, uh, and a great, a great contributor to our community. So, three people we regret losing and want to remember tonight. Let's take a minute and just keep the keep people in our minds who we. Uh, care about who we love who are either asked or we need to pray for their healing and their their wellness overall let's take a sec thanks everybody <laughs> madam clerk can you uh please follow the roll Yes, I can, Mayor. I do apologize. I have more of a voice today than I have had for a week, but I'll try not to be too squeaky. Um, Mayor Weber? Present. Councilor Cassett? Here. Councilor Chavez? Here. Councilor Lee Garcia? Here. Councilor Michael Garcia? Present. I will note that Councilor Lindell and Councilor Rivera are both excused. And Councilor Merworth? I'm here. All right. Councilwoman Virail? Present. You have a quorum, Mayor. Very much. Um, while we have a pause in the action, if you could uh, silence your phone if you're in here now, it, it's uh, kind of a distraction for everybody around when it starts ringing. So either set it to stun or just turn it off uh, or do something appropriate. Uh, we uh, can I get a motion to approve the agenda, please? So moved. There's we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. Opposed. Motion carries. Um, Madam Clerk, items taken off of consent. Uh, Mayor Weber, item A was removed from consent by Councilor Cassett. 
Okay, and is that the only one so far? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? So moved. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Um, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll on the consent agenda? Yes. Uh, Councillor Cassett? Yes. Councillor Chavez? Councillor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councillor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councillor Mara Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Varel? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Consent agenda has been approved as amended. Thank you. Could you take us to then the first item under presentations 8A? Uh, yes. Our first presentation tonight is item 8A. It's So Proudly She Served Portrait Series. This is presented by the New Mexico Veterans Legacy Grant Program. And our presenter tonight is Mr. Ken Dettelbeck. Um, if Ken would like to come up for the presentation. Sir, you have the floor. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Ken Dettelbeck. You couldn't tell that I am a Vietnam vet, um, a two-tour Vietnam vet. And I want to thank you, uh, Mayor Weber, uh, uh, and the city for uh, uh, getting behind the Veterans Legacy Program uh, and Council as well. And we thank you for the resolution you gave us some time ago. Um, uh, about four years ago, uh, I was contacted by Washington and asked if the state of New Mexico would like to have the Veterans Legacy Program. And I said yes. And because of COVID, we started it last year. And it uh, uh, has grown from a contract to a grant. This year, it's a $500,000 grant for the state of New Mexico, um, which uh, uh, is being run through the Santa Fe Community College uh, for administration. And we have a committee uh, that we put together. And I'd like to discuss that a little bit. I also gave you all handouts that'll fully explain it and give you the website that we're on. Um, uh, what is the vet Veterans Legacy Program? It's very simple. It's to tell the stories of those that are buried in our national cemetery on a national basis and national social media, national websites, Library of Congress. And um, um, uh, you have the website on what I handed out. And when you go to the website, you'll see everything that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, it was four years in the making. I put together a committee. Uh, one of those people on the committee is Gary Donato here, and uh, he'll give you a short presentation on the exhibit we just put up in the hall, City Hall. Um, so four years ago, we started this, and the committee is composed of provosts and deans from colleges, Midwest colleges on military campuses, uh, genealogists, uh, historians, teachers, um, uh, veterans. Um, and uh, IT and uh, also uh, graphics people. Um, the committee is now 10. It'll grow to 20 this year, I think. We just uh, put, uh, most of you know George Rivera. Uh, George is now on the committee. He's on the cemetery committee. And the program allows us to um, tell the stories of those that are buried in our national cemetery this year as well, those that are buried on uh, Native American lands. Okay, and next year, uh, I expect that we'll do all cemeteries. There's a lot of small cemeteries in the state of New Mexico. Um, we have a long way to go because in our national cemeteries, there's 70,000 plus veterans that are buried. Um, so I went to a higher institution, uh, and it's now called the Santa Fe Community College Veterans Legacy Grant Program. Um, we have a group of community partners now, 13 of them. Uh, one who has both feet in the bucket with us is uh, Phil Casayas and uh, um, Henry Lopez and Robert Knott over at the Santa Fe New Mexican. They have just worked with us all the way. Uh, and I included one of the articles in the handout that they've done. They've done several articles. Uh, so how do we do it? Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, we engage the school systems. Uh, the 12th graders. Last year, I uh, gave pro bono six classes through the Santa Fe school system. And we engage the, the 12th graders, we pay them, we train them to do research, we train them to go out and interview families of those that are interred in our national cemeteries. And it's part of their classroom work. 
So they get it all the way, and it's a wonderful kind of a thing. And then we take them, and we take them over to the cemetery, and we uh, put them in front of headstones of a particular war, like the Civil War, okay? And we have a class on the Civil War, but we use those that are interred uh, in, in the National Cemetery, in the Civil War section, for example, uh, and we explain the war through those people that we uh, have full knowledge of them. And uh, if you go to the website, you'll see our first year of operation uh, in terms of the number of people from code talkers to, to uh, militias to so forth. Okay. Um, uh, and um, I wanted to mention that we also pay those students to do the interviewing. Um, we do events. We do exhibits. We brought an exhibit here today, uh, th thanks uh, to you, Mayor Weber, uh, and supporting a, a veterans program. Uh, and it's called Proudly We Serve, and Jerry will talk to it just a little bit. Um, this year, uh, we will focus on women in the military. Um, there are 17,000 veteran, women veterans in the state of New Mexico. We just had a reception out at the college for this exhibit that we brought down. And we had five women generals, including um, a former uh, DVS cabinet secretary, uh, Judy Garcia. So um, we were very proud of the number of people that we had there. And thank you, Mayor, for coming out and seeing that. Um, um, we do events, uh, lectures. Most of them will be at the cemetery. Uh, and we'll train these kids and let them know that New Mexico has a huge history, okay, in the wars of the United States, as well as those prior to New Mexico becoming a state. Um, so uh, we will concentrate this year on Native American lands and cemeteries in Native American lands. Uh, uh, in Vietnam, there were 51,000 Native Americans that fought side by side. So, um, and, and they are very much a part of the military today. So I would like to introduce Gary Donato, um, my partner in crime on the committee. <laughs> He'll talk to you for a minute or two on. Thanks, Ken. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, Ken. And I would like to thank you, Mr. Mayor, and the council members, especially those from district number two, Council, Councilman Garcia and Councilwoman Romero Worth, uh, which is my district where I live, uh, for allowing Mr. Dettelbeck and I to present to you both the Veteran Legacy Program and most especially the Proudly She Served uh, Showcase of Women Veterans. As a 22-year Navy man in submarines, one of those in the case, uh, I am both honored and considered it my duty to present this project. As an educator for 27 years, I emphasize the outreach of our programs to the greater community through the council to their constituents. I was also a campaign manager and strategist, so I know how the um, politics works, and directly to the community. What you will see are portraits by Steve Alpert, the artist who transitioned to painting with a special interest in military art, uh, specifically portraits. With no personal experience in the military, he felt drawn to, quote, in his words, create images that bring honor and respect to the lion-hearted individuals who serve others, extolling the virtues of ordinary people who deliberately put themselves into extraordinary circumstances, end quote. I commend to you the images here in City Hall. We just posted those today. Um, so you should take a walk down and just take a look at them and read the biographies of each, but also to the website for more information on the project artists, and those selfless women who proudly served. Both the exhibit and the website are but a small sampling of these remarkable women. According to the latest VA data, Veterans Administration data, almost 11%, 2, 2.1 million of our nation's 19 million veterans are women. Here in New Mexico, 16,600 of our state's 148,300 veterans and women, also 11% of the veteran population. What you may not realize is that New Mexico, I just moved here from the Boston area about a year ago. New Mexico has the highest per capita veteran population in the country. 
And that's, that's something that we should really be proud of. Uh, this project, as well as the Veterans Legacy Project, project establishes that strong connectivity between City Hall, those who roam these hallways, and, though, and through our joint efforts, the community at large. Additionally, the inclusivity displayed through these portraits provides all of us the necessary understanding and appreciation of those still serving and those interred in our national, state, and local cemeteries. These women exhibit and some of them practice the courage, strength, resilience, and selflessness of their lives. We are proud. We should be proud. Again, it is my honor and duty to introduce this project to you and our fellow citizens, your constituents. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Thank you very much. Ken, did you want to wrap up? Yes, sir. Um, uh, outside of the program, we're also interviewing those that are living today. I just got some. Oh, sorry. Should I look over my shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little gun shy. Um, <laughs> uh, I just got done interviewing for two hours uh, with the help of the Santa Fe, New Mexican, a 98-year-old man, uh, Placito Borregos. You might know him, or you might know the Borregos family. Uh, uh, he was in uh, the invasion of Europe. Uh, he was in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he was in Patton's army as a 105-millimeter uh, uh, gunner. Uh, and he was the first, the first to enter the death camps of Germany. And through this interview, okay, I had 26 of his family members there. And hopefully Placido lives forever, okay? but. When he is interred in the National Cemetery, we will, we will be publishing these interviews on the website. And so I encourage everyone, including every council person, go to your constituencies, tell them we exist, okay? Tell them that if there's families that wanna tell their story because it's been hidden in a drawer, okay, of those that are interred, we're here for them. If there's people that uh, they feel they should get a story from so that that story can live. And there's an old statement, an old statement that we have, and that uh, uh, veteran soldiers uh, can die twice. Once when they lose their breath, okay, and once if we forget them. Thank you, Ken. Thank you both. Appreciate you. And I do highly recommend the exhibit that's now in City Hall as a remarkable piece of work and a great testimony to women who have served proudly in our armed forces. Anybody, comments, questions? Yeah, Councilor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dettelback and Mr. Donato for the presentation and bringing this fantastic exhibit to City Hall. I had the opportunity to briefly walk by it earlier, but I'll definitely spend some time with each and every picture. I, and I would encourage everybody in our community to do so, not just breeze by, sit, spend time with the individual in the picture because that person dedicated their time and effort to our community and to our country. So in my opinion, that's the least we can do is spend a couple moments with them. Um, uh, Mr. Dettelbeck, I completely agree with you. Our, our state and Mr. Donato mentioned this as well. Uh, the impact and the legacy of veteran service that New Mexico has brought is, is, Tremendous. I mean, you you can go back to the Battle of Glorieta, uh, all the way to the present, where you've got folks like Sergeant Petrie, whose uh, monument is out front of our our city hall, and, and individuals are proud to serve. Uh, I know that we've we've had some folks that were given given this unfortunate circumstance where they had to go serve because they're drafted, but a lot of individuals took that opportunity to, to protect and serve our country. And so with that, I just want to thank you gentlemen and the rest of the veterans that might be here for your dedicated service to our country. Uh, it's, it, I, I, I'm just uh, every day grateful for that. Uh, I, I just think it's one of those things where until you've served, you don't know what it's about. And I can't actually speak to that because I've never served a military service. I can only, Thank you for your service. 
So, so thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Dettelback for two tours in, in Vietnam. I know that was uh, very courageous of you. So, so thank you. Really appreciate your service. Uh, no other comments, sir. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, go ahead, Councillor Marilyn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for um, this exhibit. Uh, I, I think it'll be fantastic to have this in City Hall and look forward to, uh, as Councillor Garcia said, spending some time uh, in the hallway and um, looking at it. I'm curious, um, you know, this makes me think of my uncles who both um, served in various wars. They are both deceased now, but their family um, certainly has stories and pictures and just wonder, do you interview only the veterans themselves or is it is it possible to include veterans um, stories who have been deceased, who are deceased, who have been under our grant? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Under our grant program, uh, uh, we can only uh, uh, tell the stories of those veterans that are interred in the national cemeteries okay. here, here in it, Fort Baird and Silver City. Uh, and the new one that will be going up, I can't tell you where because I'm sworn to silence, but there will be another one. And uh, um, and also, we we're able to get the Native American uh, the cemeteries or those Native Americans that are interred in cemeteries in the state of New Mexico. New Mexico is one of five states that have been awarded this this grant, okay, out of 26 that apply. So uh, we're very proud to bring it. Uh, Great history here, state, and what a great city. Thank you. Terrific. I Both my uncles are interred here um, at the National Cemetery, so I will uh, be talking to their family. And I'll look forward to it. Potentially, they'll be looking, reaching out. So, again, really appreciate you being here. Really appreciate your work. Thank you. And for your service. Email me. I'll be right there. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> Councilwoman. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Dettelback and Mr. Donato, for your service and also for your heading this program. I did see the portraits; they're beautiful. I didn't get to read um, any of the descriptions of their bios. Um, were there any New Mexicans on the wall? I didn't catch that. That are on that are featured. Are they all New Mexicans? Or are they just throughout the? Why don't you give us a quick? Give us a quick overview of what's on one side of the wall and what's on the other side of the wall. We have actually, it's a two-part exhibit that's there. The colored portraits are uh, general women who are, have served or are still serving. And the other one are the black and white photographs that you'll see, the black and white posters on the other side of the wall. Those are New Mexican women who are interred here in our national cemetery. Great. Thank you for that so clarity. Thank you. Um, and for those of you that get bored in our meeting, you can just walk out the hall and check out the portraits right away. Um, I also was curious because you're highlighting um, folks that you're highlighting stories of people that have served and it goes to the website. And I'm just curious, is there a way that maybe having a QR code at the cemeteries that actually could directly link people to the stories of those um, that have served and the reason why I ask that is because it humanizes people about their stories about why and what what compelled them or why they had to and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just I'm fascinated by that and would love to be able to have more access. So if someone went out to a cemetery and they had a QR code, then they could actually hear or read a story or, or the story about the person that served. Thank you for that question. Uh... That's going to be part of this grant, right. and we're as we as we develop the website and as we develop, we've already got part of the website done. There are 68 biographies that are already posted on the Veteran Legacy Grant Program, but as we expand that, we will be moving into adding QR codes Excellent. so that somebody can be standing at the tool, at the headstone, for example, and get the QR code. And and get their name and read the biography. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Good luck with the project and thank you for being here and and for committing um to to this to the program and also to your fellow veterans. Thank you for all your support as well. Thank you. Lee, go ahead. Councillor Garcia. 
Thank you, Mayor. I'm once again, yeah. Thank you for uh, what you're doing with this with this project and this program. Um, I don't think we can uh, emphasize enough how important it is to um, remember our fallen heroes and um, those that have are have died and those who live amongst us and those who will be in the future. And so um, uh, it, uh, it it goes without saying again. Thank you. Um, New Mexico has such a huge culture of, of dedicated um, people who have served. And uh, um, I don't think you realize that until you um, visit the National Cemetery, go up to the uh, Veterans Memorial up in Angel Fire, Eagle's Nest area, um, and, uh, and just the families in our small communities around the, the, the state and, and how proud they are to have generations of people that have served. And so once again, um, not just New Mexico, but uh, all of our country and uh, for having this program that um, definitely uh, keeps um, keeps it alive and keeps it in our memory and our ability to visit the past. Um, and uh, I think that's very important. And so uh, not to forget our fallen heroes. And once again, thank you guys so much for doing this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the, the uh, exhibit and program is outstanding. So keep us keep us in mind when you need some help. We'll be here. Amen. Madam Clerk, can you? Uh, we're now to the uh, item on the consent agenda that was taken off by Councillor Cassett. Could you please read that item for people who are listening or watching? Yes, uh, item 9A is request for approval of budget adjustment resolution, a bar to utilize fiscal year 22 GRT earned in excess of budget estimates in the amount of $180,000 to cover the cost of three traffic calming safety projects. Uh, Regina Wheeler, our public works department director is available for this item and Councillor Cassett um, did pull this item. Councillor, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mayor. I, I This will be very quick. I really just wanted to thank Regina and her team for these three projects. These are three projects in District 4 that um, my constituents, our constituents, are going to be very, very excited about. Um, both Cayo Nueva Vista and I believe Cayo Tajo I've, have been in the works since I was elected. Um, Cayo Nueva Vista has been a bit of a complex um, complex case. It's a, it's an interesting area that's seen a lot of development. It's become a bit more of a through street than it was ever intended to be. Um, and I know that the traffic calming on this is going to be very well appreciated. I, I actually called my constituent at eight 30 on the Saturday night to let him know <laughs> that the funding was coming through and he was very excited. Um, the Zia and Camino Pintores, I also really want to thank the entire team for their creativity around, this intersection. It's a little bit complicated because there's a lot of speeding that happens. And we know that that is still something that we need to continue to look at, but um, it's a bit of a blind corner. And so really looking for some out of the box solutions that we don't usually utilize um, was so appreciated by me and, and by the constituents. And I know that they are also very excited. I also let them know at 8 30 uh, PM on Saturday and immediately got very excited responses. So I have no questions. Just I uh, really want to thank you, Director Wheeler. I want to thank your team. I want to thank um, Leroy Pacheco um, and Eric Ani from the MPO, as I know all these individuals were really involved in getting these designed and funded and then looking forward to the next phase of actually getting them built out. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Councillor Mayor. Um, and I'd also like to recognize the communities for, for bringing these issues forward. Um, there are really going to be important safety enhancements in the neighborhoods and the communities work really hard to identify the issue, work with us through the process, um, get consensus with their neighbors. Um, and so I just really wanted to recognize you and the counselors as well, both counselors for being involved and helping us to get to this point where we're gonna address these uh, safety issues and make our communities better. Thank you. Other questions or comments on this item? I'll move for approval. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion, there's a second. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes, Councillor Chavez? Yes. Councillor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councillor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councillor Mayor Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councillor Cassett? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. Thank you for being here, uh, Director Wheeler.
Appreciate it. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you take us to the next item on the agenda, please? Yes, I can. Um, the next item on our agenda is matters from the city manager. Um, we also have John on Zoom. Um, oh. I do apologize. We're testing why his view is he's small on there, but let me go move the TV. He's not up. The, these screens are blank, as, just so you know. I don't know. You hear me? I know what's going on. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Blair. Greetings. Greetings. I, I can see you, but you can't see me. Um, just a few couple quick things tonight. Just want to flag that uh, the city has continued working on negotiations with the county over both the final remaining pieces of annexation that have been being considered over a number of years, and that we are also in the process of working on negotiating an updated version of the JPA for the RECC, um, making progress on both of those. And we also had a, a positive meeting last week with the county officials, folks from Edgewood, RECC. We had called a special RECC meeting in order to get to the point that we could confirm with Motorola that we would be moving our public radio safety system over. It allowed us to hold the contract price without those costs going up. And we were really um, very grateful for both the county and the town of Edgewood and all the officials who voted in favor of moving that forward. So we feel very positive about that. Um, I know that I have some outstanding items for some of the counselors who've asked for some um, answers to some various questions. I'm not ignoring you. It just is <laughs> sometimes it takes longer to squeeze in blocks of time during the day, uh, be able to sit and be thoughtful about that. But those are still coming back. Um, Want to just remind everyone that we're encouraging all our employees and everyone else to be COVID safe um, and that they um, do all that they can to make sure that if they don't feel well, they stay home um, and that they're taking appropriate steps going forward. Um, I am out of town for the week. That's why I'm here virtually today. And so I hope all of you have a wonderful time at the holiday party this weekend. Please, everyone be safe, make good choices. Um, and that's it for me this week, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, take care of yourself while you're on the road. There, it's not easy. So be well. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, the next item. Uh, yes, the next item is matters from the city attorney. Mr. Mayor, members of the governing body, I don't have anything. Thank you. Thank you for being here uh, tonight. Appreciate your presence. And from the city clerk, we have matters. I was going to say, and now matters from the city clerk. Um, I want to be brief, but I just want to thank everyone that joined us uh, for Veterans Day. It was a wonderful celebration on the plaza, and I really appreciate everyone that joined us, um, as well as a huge thank you to Alexandria Mares for her efforts helping us plan that event, as well as the plaza lining, uh, which is the second event. I want to thank everybody for uh, attending and helping us kind of kick off uh, the holiday season for a lot of Santa fans. And just really, um, lastly, want to thank a lot of members of my team, including uh, Isabella, Rita, Xavier, and Alex for really helping us navigate the transition of constituent services right now. So my team has been and always is phenomenal, but I really can't thank everyone enough for their kind of willingness to always jump in and help navigate everything from constituent services to special events um, and all the things in between. So that's all I have, Mayor, just lots of thank yous. And um, if you have not seen the Plaza Lights, I really encourage you to take a drive around the Plaza when you're leaving the governing body, maybe. Um, it looks beautiful, and the Parks team did a wonderful job hanging all of the lights. Thank you. Um, I believe the next item is communications from the governing body. So let's just go around the room. Uh, Councillor Garcia, you have the floor, sir. Um, nothing tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Just want to wish everybody a happy holiday season. And had a wonderful time at the tree lighting ceremony. My apologies for not being at the uh, Veterans um, Day Memorial. Um, I was at a funeral that day, a uh, dear friend. And so I was there in spirit. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Councillor Cassett. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just also want to thank the Parks Department for the beautiful lights again. I, I can't imagine how much time that takes to, to get those up. Um, 
weeks, apparently. So really, thank you guys so much because it's it's always so beautiful. And I know it really brings a lot of um, cheer and joy to everybody during the holiday season. So, um, and thank you for the production of putting it on and, and for the tree lighting. I believe that goes to your office, Madam Clerk. So thank you for that. It was really wonderful as well as the Veterans Day um, Memorial. Thank you for the planning there. And other than that, just happy holidays to everybody and nothing else. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I don't have anything this evening. Councilwoman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just wanted to say thanks to staff for all the things that we don't see you do. <laughs> it's just, there's a lot going on in the city and you know, we can't always be here to witness it. Um, so I just wanted to thank, I mean, we have a lot of staff and a lot of departments, but it's just really busy right now for everybody. And then there's short staff issues or staffing issues. So I just wanted to thank folks and I look forward to the um, staff party, the holiday Christmas party this weekend and to the team, the benefits committee that puts that together. It's a lot of work, so thank you. And also to the staff for the lighting of the trees. I didn't make it this year because I was at a wedding mm -hmm. and I was in warm Las Cruces, so it was nice to be there. But I I do appreciate um, the lights at the plaza because it brings a lot of joy to our community. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Garcia, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and maybe since you missed the lighting, Council, Councilwoman Villarreal, I would say show up about, uh, but maybe get the time from the city clerk about 530 and you can have your own. We'll go count down for you and do your own lighting. Um, but in all seriousness, it was a great event. Th thank you to the constituent services team and the parks team that it put together the lights. Fantastic. Um, recently, there was a water main break in our district. So I just want to give a quick shout out to some staff that were critical in getting water restored. So uh, Randy Lopez, Len Montoya, Ronald Romero, Lucas Herrera, Lloyd Sandoval, Pat Sice, James Calabasa, Matthew Varela, Chris Chavez, John Wuhan, the wastewater team who was dispatched for an overflowing mon uh, manhole and Orlando Mendonca from SOS. Uh, these folks, uh, they were working night and day. Uh, the, the water main broke on a Saturday. They were working two, three in the morning, Saturday night. And, and just, uh, I can only imagine the, how tired those folks were uh, after working some 30 hours plus. So major shout out to those guys. Um, and uh, I guess I want to thank the constituents for being patient with us as we got the water restored to them. Mm -hmm. Some were without water for a day or so, some up to two days, but thank you for the patience. And uh, hopefully uh, we can, uh, that doesn't happen again in the near future. Uh, with that, just wish everybody a happy holiday season as we're gearing up. Please be safe out there. It's cold. Hmm. Weather's changing, uh, which means more folks are congregating yeah. inside, which means, unfortunately, bugs and viruses are spreading around a little more frequently. So uh, everybody, please pay attention and keep everybody safe. Uh, with that, no other comments, Mr. Mayor? Thank you, sir. Councilor. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to um, start by thanking the city clerk's office and the parks division for the tree lighting. My daughter was um, performed Christmas carols, so it was extra special, and I got to dance with her. It was just it's my favorite event, um, and I feel like it never disappoints. It's beautiful. It just, I don't know, it almost grounds you um, in being home in Santa Fe, so thank you for that. I also wanted to thank the fire department um, for their Giving Tree event and their toy drive efforts and just how they are so invested in the community. And so for the fire department and city partners that are helping them out with the toy drive, um, I just wanna thank them for their efforts and for always thinking of those in need. I was very sad to miss the Veterans Day event. I was in Utah for a work conference, but I do appreciate how the city always posts everything on social media. So if you're not following their page, please do so. Um, there is a lot going on in the city, but you could always connect on Facebook. That's what I do. And so I feel like I can be a part of an event and really celebrate with them from afar. So if you're not already connected on social media, I'd advise you to do so, especially during this busy season where we have a lot of great things going on in the city. Um, and so just thank you to all the staff and community partners that make those wonderful things possible. And happy holidays.
Thank you. Uh, I'm, I've, there's so much going on in our city and we've heard so many thank yous. I'll, I'll add a few more. Uh, thank you to Kevin Bowen and the HRA for the candlelight vigil after the tragic shooting at Club Q in Colorado Springs. They put out the word and 250 people assembled on the plaza to demonstrate our solidarity with uh, the LGBTQ community and those who lost their lives in Colorado Springs and also lost their sense of safety and security. And uh, it was a rapid uh, event that they put together and, and they did a great job bringing people together. Um, another thank you to our uh, alternative response unit uh, in these cold nights and code blue, uh, looking around the streets for people who are homeless, who are, who are really exposed to the elements. The Code Blue team is out saving lives, and we're grateful to them. Uh, the toy drive uh, that uh, Councilor Chavez mentioned is a, a great community event. The goal that uh, Roland Jones and Chief Moy and the fire department have set is 2,500 toys. So far, we're at 310, folks. So uh, get a get one of those uh, tags off the tree and go make sure no no young person in Santa Fe doesn't have the opportunity to feel appreciated and uh, and have joy at the Christmas season. Uh, the tree lighting event everybody's talked about it is one of the best, if not the best night in Santa Fe, and it was gorgeous. Uh, Randy and the G-Men did a great job, again, uh, making it happen. And to everybody who was there, the 4,000 people on the plaza, uh, that was spectacular and, and really beautiful. And the people who made it happen were really grateful. Uh, thank you to the traditional Spanish market artist show at the convention center. Another uh, great Santa Fe tradition and great turnout, great works of art, great community participation. Uh, our convention center team um, made it happen, and the artists made it spectacular. Uh, thank you to everybody for participating. Uh, congratulations tomorrow to the seven officers who are being sworn in as new Santa Fe Police Department officers. Officer Alvarado, Lopez, Romero, Smith, Torres, Nymark, Vigil. With these seven new hires, our vacancy rate will be 19. Uh, really great work by everyone in uh, offering lateral uh, incentives and also sign-in incentives. And uh, it is it is clear that the Santa Fe Police Department is a great place for people to keep our community safe and to serve. Uh, congratulations to the Santa Fe Opera for being named Festival of the Year at the International Opera Awards, another world-class recognition for something that is our team doing great. Uh, today is World AIDS Day. For those who are not aware of uh, AIDS is still with us. The, it's not the only pandemic is not COVID. Uh, there was a, uh, and may still be going on there, a 5.30 event on the plaza to recognize that we still have to work to uh, eradicate AIDS and take care of those who are afflicted by it. Uh, December the 6th is our 20th year celebration of the rail yard, a true uh, celebration of a great accomplishment. And December 10th, National Human Rights Day. So we have a lot to be grateful for at this holiday season and a lot to be proud of when it comes to activities and achievements here in Santa Fe. Madam Clerk, introduction of legislation. Yes. Can I also just plug, I loved Councillor Chavez's plug for our social media, and we also have Twitter and Instagram. So if Facebook isn't your jam, you can join us in other ways. But um, I just want to put that out there. My department also runs social media, so um, we put a lot of work into, into connecting with our community that way. I will now focus, Mayor, and move on to introductions of legislation. Um, our first item is 15A. It's consideration of a resolution sponsored by Mayor Weber. It's a resolution adopting the Midtown Community Development Plan for the Midtown Redevelopment Project. Um, this will be sponsored, or this will be presented by Lee Logston, our Midtown Asset Development Manager. 
And I, um, I believe you were going to sign on as a co-sponsor on this. Uh, or yes, I, I attempted and then it didn't work. It didn't work because apparently there's not actually a resolution. Is there? Well, we'll get you on it. Um, this please sign me on <laughs> just to uh, introduce it. This we're not, we're not moving forward, but tonight is the night we introduce it just to be clear. This is an additional piece of our midtown work. There is a community development plan that is really reflective of all of the community outreach work that's been done in the development of midtown and the future of that site. Uh, the document will be uh, open for discussion and ultimately work its way through the process coming to the city. Uh, the governing body for consideration. Uh, it's it is another leg of the stool for uh, the uh, commitments to what we want to do at Midtown, Midtown, and how we want to honor the community engagement process. Item B, Madam Clerk. Oh uh, yes, item B is consideration of a resolution sponsored by Councillor Michael Garcia, Councilman Via Rial, and Mayor Weber. It's a resolution adopting a strategy for donating or selling at below market value, a property identified as Las Estrellas Track 6A to a developer certified as a qualifying grantee under the New Mexico Affordable Housing Act to develop Santa Fe home program homes, low price dwelling units or units price restricted through another affordable housing subsidy and approving an announcement to sell the remaining seven Las Estrellas lots with a local preference. Councillor Garcia or Councilwoman Villarreal, you want to introduce it? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, just wanted to say after a really long period of time of working on this resolution, um, we actually have it. Um, it's exciting to introduce it tonight. Uh, it's a resolution that would adopt a strategy strategy for donating or selling at a discount tract A of Las Estrellas development for development of homes specifically affordable housing. And it also offers a preference for bids for local purchasers and requires um, minimum criteria, which includes an offer of at least the appraised value of the seven part other parcels. Councilor Garcia. Uh, I think uh, my colleague covered it very well. I, the only thing I would add is that uh, I strongly believe that when we're working or looking at disposition of city property, first and foremost, we've got to look at how it might fit our needs of affordable housing. And I, I'm excited that we've been able to incorporate that with the potential disposition of the Las Estrellas property. Um, so many times we hear uh, affordable housing is only done on one side of the city, one part of the town. Well, should this pass, that's not going to be the case anymore because this is on the north side of town where folks say that affordable housing is never done. There's never anything in that realm. So um, I think we're beginning to walk the talk that we've always said. Affordable housing is our priority, and I hope that this passes. Um, and as well, it offers up the opportunity for uh, the economic development that that uh, hopefully would come from the disposition of this property to stay local as well through the uh, local preference. So um, just want to give a, a quick shout out because as uh, Councilwoman Villarreal said, this this we did, we took some time because we wanted to make sure we got this right. And so I just want to give a quick shout out to staff of uh, Andrea Salazar, Alex Ladd, Terry Lease, and Jesse Guillen for patiently working with us as we fine tune this to make sure uh, what we're presenting, hopefully we, we, we're on the mark. And so with that, uh, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for as well signing on. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Cassett, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to request uh, to bring this uh, resolution to EDAC at our December 13th meeting. A um, couple of reasons. One is, as Councilor Garcia mentioned, and this was what I had uh, first tipped off as, is um, that it does looking at how we increase economic development um, throughout the city with the local preference discussion, um, as well as I believe this is coming from asset management, which sits under economic development. And so we typically bring things that are impacting uh, economic development. So um, I'd like to make a motion to 
bring this resolution to add to the committee review the i believe it's december 13th is that the wednesday whatever day we have governing body december 14th excuse me december 14th um economic development advisory committee second there's a motion there's a second is there a discussion about adding edec to the review process madam clerk you want to call the roll yes councillor lee garcia yes councillor michael garcia yes councillor mayor worth yes councilman Villarreal. yes councillor cassett yes councillor chavez yes mayor weber yes um Thank our you. committee review has been amended to include edac okay and the item is introduced the next item please uh, the next item is item c it's consideration of a resolution sponsored by mayor weber it's a resolution relating to firearms, recognizing that certain city properties are used for school-related activities, which makes the carrying of a deadly weapon on such properties a fourth-degree felony, pursuant to NMSA 1978, Section 30-7-2.1, and directing the city manager to work with staff to post notice on such facilities. Thank you. Um, I am um, sad and um proud to introduce this resolution sad because we are witnessing a tragic increase in firearm related deaths uh involving young school age children uh and we are looking for ways to stop that from happening in santa fe we are constrained in so many ways by uh, the Constitution of the state and uh, other uh, straitjackets that keep us from doing what would keep our kids safe. But this is something we can do. It's legal. It is within our city's uh, rights to uh, safeguard city properties where school-related activities are taking place, where kids are present. And I'm hoping we can move this uh, resolution through the process, bring it to the governing body, and make it part of our effort to respond to the uh, serious increase in uh, tragic deaths by firearms of young people in Santa Fe. And hopefully the this will spread to other communities as well. Madam Clerk. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Garcia. Quick, quick point of order before we move on. The, the first resolution that was introduced by yourself. I don't see it in the packet. Mm, Madam Clerk, is there something missing from the packet? Uh, Mayor Weber, I, I have it on my packet in PrimeGov. I, I don't see it on mine in and, uh, and the reason I'm asking, because I always go through the public side. I'm I'm on the public side, and I, I have it on. I'll double check memo campus guidelines. If you can make sure that it's there and it's accessible, that would be fantastic. And thank you for checking it, Councillor Garcia. And, and just quick other clarification: it should have been on there by Friday. So if, even if it get refreshed tonight, uh, I guess what is our procedures is it, it again i'm looking at the, all the items i'm seeing a memo exhibit a exhibit b exhibit c exhibit d document govern body regular meeting and then item public comment so those are the only attachments i see and that would have been when I started the meeting earlier today. Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, yes, with our new procedural rules, if the resolution um, as one of the minimum documents for introduction, I believe we'd have to introduce it December 13th. Okay, we can do that. We can, we'll, we'll check into the posting of it and if we have to adjust it, we will do so. Fair enough. Thank you. Good. Thanks for catching that. Uh, Madam Clerk, item 16. 
Point of order? Yeah. Uh, also, per our procedural rules, we do not. Oh, that. it's not seven o'clock. So I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda, if possible. Please go. Uh, so I'd like to uh, amend the agenda to move to item 19 appointments, and then we will resume the rest of the meeting uh, beginning at 7 p.m. Is it 19 Second. or is it 20? 19 appointments. Okay. There's a motion to move, uh, amend the agenda so we move up appointments before we get to the public hearings. There's a second. Is there a discussion? Could you call the roll on the motion, please? Uh, Mayor, can you clarify who made the second? Yeah. I did, and then Councilwoman Villarreal did. So either way. Okay. It was a it was a toss up. This is it a nose line finish? Okay. I, I thought maybe it was just me, but I wanted to clarify. So okay, perfect. Um Councillor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councillor Romero Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councillor Cassett? Yes. Councillor Chavez? Yes. Councillor Lee Garcia? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved to amend the agenda. Thank you. So can you take us to appointments now? Oh, uh, yes, Mayor. The, oh, yes. The first appointment is for the Santa Fe Women's Commission. Uh, it's item A. We are um, doing several reappointments and appointments for this committee. Uh, Wendy Pomeroy for District 1 is a reappointment with term ending in November of 2024. Olivia Sloan is for District 2 reappointment term ending in November of 2024. Carla uh, Bacchacci is our alternate reappointment with a term ending in November of 2024. Sheila Vaughn is an at-large reappointment with a term ending in November of 2024, Gloria Martinez Frestad is an at-large appointment with a term ending in November of 2025, and Gabriela Squenker is an at-large member uh, reappointment with a term ending in November of 2025. Can I get a motion? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there discussion? Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Uh, yes, Councilor Romero Worth. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Councilor Chavez? Yes. Councilor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved for Women's Commission appointments. Thank you. Can you take us to B then? Yes. The next item is item B. It's Water Conservation Committee appointments. We have Beth Belloff with an appointment term expiring in July of 2024. Uh, Bill Roth, an appointment with a term ending in July of 2024. Autumn Leaker, with an appointment term ending in July of 2024. Evan Ripley, with an appointment term expiring in July of 2024. And Stephen Schmeling, with a reappointment term ending in July of 2024. Move to approve. Second. There's a motion and a second. Councilwoman. Thank you, Mayor. Just wanted to make sure that these folks are full-time um, residents of the city. They are. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Other questions or comments about this appointment? Adam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Councilor Chavez? Yes. Councilor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councilor Mayor Worth? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved for Water Commission, uh, Water Conservation Committee appointments. Thank you. And then item C is also uh, appointments. Yes, uh, item C is for the City of Santa Fe Liquor Hearing Officer appointments. We have Renee Barala Gutierrez with an appointment term ending in um, November of 2026 and Nathan Eckelberg with an appointment term ending in November of 2026. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. There's a motion and then there's a second from Councilor Garcia. Is there a discussion? Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes. Councillor Cassett? Yes. Councillor Chavez? Yes. Councillor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councillor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councillor Romero Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. So, Madam Clerk, we have petitions from the floor, which we try to do around seven o'clock, and we have 
public, six public hearings. Um, is there a, should we dive into our first public hearing? What's this, what's the sense? I, of, what I would believe you like to do? the motion was to do this and then wait until seven for the rest of the agenda. I don't know it's about not, that. I think it's just, I think for, it's just the, it's the, uh, but we'd have from the floor. You'd have to stop. You'd have to have another motion because the motion that we just approved was to to do 19 and then resume everything else at seven. Okay. That's the, uh, we have a bunch of people in the, uh, in the audience. Um, the, you could entertain another motion. Well, I'm looking around to see what this, what the sense of the governing body is. Do you want to take a 45 minute break and let everybody, uh, wait until we're back at seven, at which case we'll do petitions from the floor and begin the hearings. Or do you want to entertain another motion to at least begin one of our sets of public hearings? I, I am agnostic. I just think we need to, whatever we do, we all need to agree that it's the right way to move ahead. Mayor, yeah. are we going to have to eat hear each of these public hearings separately the way we did with Christus or this is just one lump? Well, it's several lumps. Well, yes, but like <laughs> you know, normally we we do presentation. And Marcos, can you can you clarify the uh, my, my? I don't want to substitute my understanding for the city attorney's office. I think there is a procedure for the uh, six items that you all have teed up for us, and it involves some lump together and moving forward uh, on one separately. I think that's kind of the organizing principle. Marcos. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the Midtown General Plan Amendment rezoning and master plan would be handled together under one public hearing, although it would require separate motions for approval for each of those. Um, then there would be a separate public hearing for the Midtown Link Amendment, because that's just legislation. It has a slightly different procedure. And then a final um, uh, public hearing for the Midtown adjacent parcels, general plan amendment and rezoning. So kind of three lumps. We'll three separate hearings, but six separate motions. Yes. So that we can do first three, one, two. Does that answer your question? Do we have to go in that order? Because it sounds like we could probably fit the link in now in time for petitions from the floor from seven o'clock. No, I think we, I think we are best served by keeping to the order. The problem is, if we interrupt, how disruptive is that yeah. to to stop? I mean, I I understand. I don't want to make these folks twiddle their thumbs, but I also don't want it to be too disjointed by getting into something and then having to pause and go back to petitions from the floor. So I I don't know what's I I I don't know what which way to go, but it's not really a clear path. Any other, you have a feeling about it one way or the other, Councilwoman? No. Councilor Garcia, you have a preference? Uh, no, I, I'm in, I think, agreement with Councilor Romero Worth. I hate to have that break. I hate that folks would be waiting, but we've got a great exhibit in the hall that we can <laughs> back out as well. And vending machines. Huh? <laughs> Mr. Brown, did you want to offer some advice from the uh, from the staff level. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, I would uh, kindly suggest maybe we start with the adjacent parcels. It's a smaller piece of legislation, uh, and then we'd have the other two uh, parts afterwards uh, after public comment. Sure. Okay. We can. Let's see what happens. We'll 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 do a little uh, test case. We'll we'll need a motion to change our order of business, and uh, and then we'll see if we can get started. So, Mayor, I'll entertain. I could... Uh, Mayor, if I could just also add one more clarification. It's me, the city clerk. Gotcha. Um, we generally try to hear um, petitions from the floor around seven. However, according to our governing body rules, it does not have to be exactly at seven. Uh, we also just, in general, like to wait until at least 7 p.m. So I do just want to note that in case the motion would like to have that flexibility that we will try to hear petitions from the floor as close to seven as possible, but. Okay. I, I think Mr. Brown suggests 
based on his knowledge of the material, we could potentially handle the, the uh, legislative case. And uh, I would entertain a motion to adjust the agenda, take that up, and then see where we go. Councilor Gar uh, Garcia, do you have for clarification, Mayor? I guess my only concern with that is it's approving a potential land issue before we approve the the uh, general plan amendment so that's, that's why it's in the order it's in okay yeah so and that's that's my concern is we're kind of putting the cart before the horse yeah. it's a saying, timing thing for you yeah and and i think it's kind of saying to the public we already know we're going to approve this or disapprove this so let's go ahead and hear this and i, I don't like the the presentation that gives okay. and i understand it might be a quicker process but and again, I, I completely sympathize with the public and, and uh, maybe we can figure out how to grab coffee or something, but I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't like that process and just wanted to make that comment. Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilor Garcia, I have uh, Ms. Fagali here. She can give you a little more clarity around uh, why we Connie suggested that third uh, part. So, Mr. Mayor, Councilor uh, Garcia, this would be the general plan amendment and the rezoning for the adjacent parcels. So it wouldn't be approving anything that would be dependent on anything else being approved. This would be the entire case for those adjacent parcels, if that helps alleviate your concern. It does, but I think again, um, Okay, I, I'll just. I'll just. I think we're gonna we're gonna just continue to agonize over this. We're gonna stand adjourned till seven. I apologize to everybody. We'll be back at seven o'clock. Uh, it just we 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 sort of have to be responsible to the people we promised would be up at seven, and we'll be back at seven. We'll take the matters up in the order in which they appear on the agenda.
Next test. Madam Clerk, are we uh, ready to roll? Have we got people waiting in the uh, Zoom room for petitions from the floor? We have people in the Zoom room. I don't know if they're here. All right, well, we'll find out what yep. they're here for. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. We're good. Uh, we're back in session again. Uh, Apologies to those who came down, hoping, expecting that we would have a seamless flow of business. We, like like other great uh, deliberative bodies like the U.S. Senate, we have some rules we try to abide by, one of which is that it, we try to be as close to 7 p.m. as possible for petitions from the floor, and that sometimes uh, 
interferes with a seamless flow of business. And I, I apologize, but I hope everybody got a cup of coffee, something nourishing, um, a chance to visit and have some social time, um, courtesy of our brief cool. adjournment. So, Madam Clerk, we're back uh, here. If I'm not mistaken, we go now to petitions from the floor. And you may be here tonight in the room, not because you want to speak to any of the public hearings, but because there's something unrelated to any of the public hearings that you would like to have two minutes to address the governing body on. And there may be someone or someones in the Zoom room who don't want to speak to the, any of the public hearings, but do want to avail themselves of the opportunity to have two minutes to speak to the governing body about something other than our public hearing. So uh, let's start with folks who are here in the room. If you are here for something other than one of the public hearings and you would like to call something to the attention of the governing body, please come on up to the podium and the clerk will uh, give you a two minute uh, time to address the governing body. Or if you are in the Zoom room and you wish to address something other than the, one of the public hearings, uh, Madam Clerk, they should raise their hands, I believe. Correct. And you will uh, unmute, recognize them, and they will have two minutes that you'll keep track of, and then we'll listen attentively while they speak to matters other than any of the public hearings. Correct. Yes, we do have uh, Ms. Stephanie Beninato. Stephanie. Thank you. I just unmuted. Um, Stephanie Beninato, PO Box 1601, Santa Fe, New Mexico. I sent you a fairly long public, public comment, written public comment. I hope that you look at it. But I do want to mention that the city takes credit card payments but can't refund the, on the credit card. That's outrageous in the 21st century, and I don't know why. Must make audits harder. Graffiti used to be a 48-hour turnaround. It's now been over a month <clears throat> for five properties on one block that's been graffitied, and we have no idea when that's going to be taken care of. The same thing for the alley on which most of the graffiti occurred is really overgrown. It has been one quarter of a year since the city was requested to do something about that. That was one um, month turnaround time normally. Most importantly, however, the H board, even though I went in front of the H board and did an appeal and brought this issue up to the city attorney, that the H board can only recommend exceptions, not grant them. Suddenly now when Lucchese wants a sign, the city attorney is now agreeing with that, but the board is in revolt. And one of the things that I believe is really going to be a problem if it occurs, as was told on this past board meeting, is that these cases, which are quasi-judicial in nature, that every that they're all going to be put on a consent calendar and that there isn't going to be any public hearings. That is, I believe, a violation of the charter and a violation of state law. And that was told uh, one of the board members wanted to slip in that they're allowing a significant changes to a, uh, to a significant building on St. John's College because now suddenly St. John's, the institution, is more important than just preserving the building itself. And she wanted to know if you would have a hearing on it or would it be on consent? And she was told it would be on consent. Again, these are quasi-judicial hearings. They need to be public. And if I could just finish, I, I want you to really look at the policy concerning lifeguard uh, supervisors and why you should reconsider not giving them over time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in the Zoom room who has something for the governing body unrelated to the hearings tonight? Uh, Naira? Naira, I just unmuted you. Can you hear me? Naira? Um, 
um, Nayira, who is in the Zoom room. Oh, there you go. Hello? Yes. No, that's me. Oh, that was you. I thought it was, we finally had connection. You sounded much like Nayira. No? Is there someone you want to try and maybe uh, come back? That That's the only other person with their hand up um, for this section. Um, Excuse, are you able to hear us? I can't hear her. I agree. Um, um, they're unmuting their microphone, but I'm still not able to hear. Nope. Can you see on your screen? No, I have a lot of feedback. I think, Naira, are you listening to YouTube on your end? You might need to lower your volume. Maybe we could invite um, this individual to send us a, either an email or a written comment that we can include in the minutes of the meeting if we're unable to connect with this technology. Yeah. Um, Nair, if you'd like to submit written comment. It's just not working. It's not. They're unmuting, but I think they have audio all the way up on their end. Um, and so I unfortunately feel like we probably need to move on. Well, I would encourage uh, a written or an, a, in, as a, 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 deli a deliver a letter, send us an email, uh, leave a comment in the clerk's office, call the mayor's office and leave a comment with... Uh, <laughs> with uh with my uh assistant and we don't mean to go um blow uh, just go by you without giving you an attempt to speak with us but it's not working with the technology we have right now so anyone else in the zoom uh room with a hand up no is there anyone else that would like to speak for petitions from the floor joining us on zoom please raise your hand Not seeing anyone, Mayor. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll move on then. We've we've given it a good effort, and there are ways to get in touch with us tomorrow or later this evening if you want to send us an email. We'll we'll be very attentive to it. With that, Madam Clerk, I believe we go to the first of three uh, public public hearings. We're going to, according to the City Attorney's Office, we're able to hear them as a single. Uh, hearing, but three separate motions will be required. If you want to read for the record and for those who may be listening uh, or watching what those three uh, cases are, um, and then I'll walk through the process. Yes, the first item is 19A. It's consideration of a resolution, uh, case number 2022-5763. This is the Midtown General Plan Amendment. The City of Santa Fe agent owner requests that the governing body approve a resolution to amend the existing general plan future land use classification from public institutional to transitional mixed use for the 64 plus acre Midtown property at 1600 St. Michael's Drive. Why don't you do B and C and then we'll take them all at the same time. Perfect. Um, item B is consideration of bill number 2022-24. This is an adoption of an ordinance. This is case number 2022-5765 for Midtown rezoning. 
the city of Santa Fe agent owner requests that the governing body approve an ordinance to rezone the 64 plus or minus acre midtown property at 1600 St. Michael's Drive from R5, five residential dwelling units per acre to C2 PUD, general commercial planned unit development. The property is within the Midtown Link Overlay District. And item 19C is consideration of a resolution. This is case number 2022-5764, it's the Midtown Master Plan. The City of Santa Fe agent owner requests that the governing body approve a resolution to adopt the Midtown Land Development Plan, a master plan for the plus or minus 64 acre property located at 1600 St. Michael's Drive with innovative street design standards per SFCC 1987, section 14-9.2B, section 3. The property is currently zoned R5 and within the Midtown Link Overlay District with a proposed zoning of C2 PUD. Please see case number 2022-5765. That's the first batch of three. Before we uh, open it up to the actual proceeding, let me just, for everybody's benefit, walk through the process we'll be using. Um, first, because this is a, a quasi-judicial hearing, which means we are operating uh, as if we were judges rather than legislators. Um, I'll ask any the members of the governing body if any for any reason they cannot be fair and impartial due to an ex parte communication, they would be asked to excuse themselves. Uh, after that, we'll go to the staff report for uh, hopefully a 15 minute, no more than a 15 minute presentation. We'll hear from the applicant uh, for another 15 minutes. Then we'll go to the public and there'll be sworn public testimony. Uh, we will suggest that people try to stay within uh, two minutes of comment, please. Uh, then when we've done that, we'll turn to the governing body for questions, more questions than, than uh, statements because after the questions have brought out more information, we'll close the public hearing and turn to a motion and a second and then discussion among the members of the governing body before we turn to a vote. So with that as an understanding about how the process will be uh, undertaken, let me first give everybody on the governing body an opportunity to indicate if they are uh, in any way unable to be fair and impartial because of ex parte communication, now would be the time to recuse yourself. Good. We're all prepared to be fair and impartial. Now I will turn to Mr. Brown and staff. I think uh, Heather Lamboy will be coming forward as well to open up with a staff report. Mr. Brown, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I just want to make an opening statement on behalf of the Office of Economic Development, if I could. Thanks. Uh, tonight, I stand before you in a unique spot uh, as the director of the master plan application team and the planning and land use regulatory team. We're excited to reach this milestone uh, to present our six cases related to the redevelopment of the Midtown site. Uh, as we come off of a successful planning commission hearing and after nearly four years of public engagement, adjacent landowner, interested developer and city council input, our multidisciplinary teams have laid out the strategic economic and legal parameters required to create an innovative rezoning and master plan. Designed with residents and for the city, this will energize the community and economic development ideas in the Midtown Link. Our application team envisions a rezoning and master plan for a new Midtown site that provides guidance and requirements for developing the site and is complementary to the community development plan, which was introduced tonight. Uh, this is a plan that reflects public policy to achieve objectives based upon elements of place-based sustainable development, environment, economy, equity, and culture. Our planning and land use team will take you through, in three parts, the master plan and associated applications, the Midtown Link Amendment and the general plan, and amendment for rezoning for adjacent parcels to be acquired through a land swap. Uh, if approved tonight, uh, many will ask, what's next? Uh, on Friday, we will re release uh, three RFPs uh, for redevelopment of our legacy uh, 
parcels, which are the Garson Performance Theater, the Vision Arts Center, and the Garson uh, Production Studios. Uh, we will take the community development plan through the committee review process and work to begin parcelizing the site to begin phase two RFPs for housing and mixed use development. Uh, we would not be here tonight, though, without the input, support, and guidance of our residents, community, development partners, you, the governing body, and our incredibly committed staff. Most of them from internal and external teams uh, in the city and uh, with our uh, engagement partners. I especially thank, want to thank them all for their tireless efforts over the last four years, including inside a COVID pandemic, uh, to bring these cases before you for final review and consideration. And with that, I would like to ask the teams to take it from here. And after the presentations, uh, stand ready to address your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Lamboy. Let me connect just one moment. No hurry. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. It's a pleasure to be with here with you here tonight to um, recognize a milestone that we have reached with the campus we've known as the College of Santa Fe, the Santa Fe University of Art and Design. And it, you know, it's been changing over time and um, this is the next step in the evolution of the campus. So as the clerk read, we are considering tonight a general plan amendment from low density residential, three to seven dwelling units per acre, rezoning residential, five dwelling units per acre, to general commercial, this is CU, C2 PUD, so it's a plan unit development, and the master plan serves to implement that plan unit development. So it will function as a standalone zoning document in addition to chapter 14. And then of course, the Midtown master plan. This represents a lot of work that's been done by the community, and for that, we are grateful. Um, it's reviewing the record and just understanding where we've come from. In 2016, there was the establishment of the, the um, LINK ordinance, which called for redevelopment along um, the entire St. Michael's corridor, as well as on the Midtown campus, but the Midtown being the focus of that. In 2017, a resolution was passed by the governing body to pursue discussion with the educational users and pursue expansion of the existing film facilities on the site, including post-production and sound uh, studios, develop workforce housing, and adaptive reviews of the Fogelson Library and to create a master plan for the campus. So we launched into a public planning process pictures of which you can see here, the message that we received from the community that the core values were equity, econo economy, culture, and environment. And those are the core values around which the master plan is organized. So in 2018, the establishment of the planning guidelines were um, adopted by the governing body, which was a result of the engagement as well as a design charrette you can see a picture of here. Um, from that time. In 2022-12, the city staff was directed to develop a community development plan and complete the entitlement processes. So that's where we are today. I remember sitting in my mom's office at the College of Santa Fe and just looking around and realizing there's a lot of space here and there's a lot of really interesting things that can happen with this site. Uh, so, you know, it's really exciting for me now, a little, just a little bit older, to, <laughs> to come and be able to present the Midtown Master Plan. This is an aerial photo. Let me orient you to the site. St. Michael's Boulevard in the yellow is, um, is to the east, generally. The Yano Street is um, a boundary that is um, associated with adjacent parcels that we'll be discussing tonight. Um, this has been a result of our collaboration and consideration of comments we've received from adjacent property owners, as well as, oops, I'm sorry, as well as the um, abutting property owners in the Smith Shopping Center, the overall shopping center there. The college, um, you can see some remnants of the Bruins Army Hospital The on um, this aerial. The um, barracks were still there and have since been removed. 
And then there's the different dormitory buildings, as well as the Fogelson Library and the Gregarson Theater and the Art Institute. The existing future land use for the site is public institutional, which stands to reason because it is a college. And so when the, or the um, future land use map was developed in 1999 with a general plan, the thought was to keep this as public institutional to support those uses associated with the college, but also with a, a, a budding state and um, local facilities, as well as the school um, facilities. The context for the general plan uh, for the, these categories include community commercial along Srios and St. Mike Road, St. Mike's Roads. There are parks, um, Franklin Miles Park is there, as well as low density residential across Ringo Road, and then medium or high density residential um, abutting uh, Camino Carlos Rey, and then further on up uh, across um, Seringo Road to the east. So what's proposed is a change in the future land use category to tra transitional mixed use. This provides for creative infill and development, and which is the also the purpose of the master plan. It permits office, commercial, and residential development, and sometimes they can be in the same building. It promotes affordable housing and economic development through flexible land uses and falters, fosters alternate transportation options. With reference to the existing zoning, in many cases, institutions like educational institutions, as well as with churches, for example, uh, the underlying zoning was residential and was permitted to stay as residential. And so that's why over the years, the residential zoning category has, has remained for the, the Midtown site. The context is, of course, commercial uses C2 on St. Mike's Boulevard, as well as Cerrios, or I'm sorry, Road. Um, R21, the multifamily residential across Carlos Ray, the R7, medium density residential along um, Seringo Road and Llano. And then also there's a shopping center, the pink patch there over to the right of the graphic is a shopping center zone district. We find those also along St. Francis Boulevard. The proposed zone district is C2 PUD, as I mentioned, the master plan is gonna be implementing that planned unit development. And it's intended to, for the, the purpose clause of the um, PUD zone district, it's intended to allow the creation of planned districts, each conceived as a unit of cohesive development and integrated uses in either a single development operation or a planned series of development operations. And so in this particular case, as we're setting the stage sort of at the 10,000 foot level with the master plan, that will help to inform the individual developments on the site. And it also encourages innovative site planning. This is a photograph of the old Bruins Army Hospital from back when it was surrounded pretty much by nothing. And um, so you can see the airport to the south and uh, west of the site, which uh, a lot has changed over time. But the heart of it is, it's now part of our heart, our heart of our community. Uh, so there's been, you know, after the, the decommissioning of the Bruins Army Hospital, a lot of that land became, was purchased by the Christian Brothers, and it was given to the Christian Brothers for the College of Santa Fe. And then also there's other states and, um, and local um, ownerships around there that result were a result of the decommissioning of that base. And then the Christian Brothers ultimately sold a portion of the land um, to the adjacent to Cerritos Road uh, to help support their um, college activities. And so originally there was an access to uh, the campus from Cerritos Road. So the vision of the master plan is to identify strategies to create a sustainable, walkable community provide employment and housing opportunities, provide mobility options, and access to recreation, public spaces, and cultural venues. And just to give you a little bit of a taste of what's contained in the master plan, um, there are, it gets down to specifics as to what are the streets gonna look like? What types of things um, do we need for, to support you know, environmentally conscious um, stormwater uh, drainage and retention and, and reuse? 
uh, it illustrates separated bike lanes and sidewalks that are comfortable and it separates the car from the people, which is incredibly important in a walkable community. The master plan also has a form-based type of approach where the building forms are important. So since we're gonna have a mix of uses, what we need to do is provide for diversity and variety on the campus and accommodate these different types of uses. So the, the building form is what takes precedent here, but there also will be, you know, the rest of the city code with design standards and the overall look and feel will be very much Santa Fe style. And you can see on the development parcels, the individual development parcels, the different types of, of formats that can be used. I know that affordable housing is a very major concern associated with our community um, as somebody who you know, owns a property and city employee. It's, it's a very big concern for me too. So the master plan calls for 30% of all units to be affordable. And um, of the 195 homes that are estimated right now, this may change, it's just a, an estimate, um, of those, 105 would be rental and 90 would be for purchase. So it gives options to people to actually own a home. Um, there will be deed restrictions and the like to control for the affordable housing, make sure that it's somewhat perpetual. But, um, you know, that's, that's an important opportunity in affordable housing. And four parcels of the entire site have been set aside for fully affordable um, subsidized housing. So that is a very important value that is carried through onto this master plan. And then like um, Mr. Brown was mentioning, uh, the, there will be weighted RFPs. You know, that's sort of the next phase if the governing body finds that they would like to approve the master plan for the land disposition. And what the city is in the driver's seat here. So the city can require affordability, amenities and sustainable development um, practices. So this isn't just the master plan and everybody else is just, everybody is going to, the developer is gonna come in and do whatever they want to. This is actually a land disposition that's done by the city um, and will have benefit for the community. That's the overall aim of the master plan. So with reference to approval criteria for the general plan amendment, it is consistent with the growth projections and um, economic development goals. It is consistent with other parts of the general plan. It provides for coordinated and harmonious development and is not inconsistent with the prevailing use and character of the area. Those guiding policies that are implemented include a mix of uses, affordable housing, connectivity, human scale form, and pedestrian oriented neighborhood centers. With reference to the rezoning, this is gonna be the second motion. There will be a change, or this represents a change in the surrounding area. And as I mentioned earlier, there's been a big evolution in Santa Fe and specifically on this site. There's a different zoning category that is more advantageous to foster the redevelopment. It is consistent with all applicable general plan policies and um, existing and planned infrastructure improvements accommodate for the future development on the site. And then final, the, finally, the approval criteria for the master plan is consistent with the general plan, with the purpose and intent of the underlying zoning district. It will contribute to a coordinated and efficient development of the community and existing and planned infrastructure can accommodate for redevelopment of the site. There's been a lot of study about the infrastructure and how it can accommodate the changes that are on the um, Midtown site. So the Planning Commission found that all those criteria have been met and made the recommendation for approval unanimously for all three items, for the general plan amendment, the rezoning, and the master plan. There was a condition of approval at the, at the Planning Commission meeting. There were concerns that were raised by adjacent property owners that I mentioned earlier. And so staff recommended this condition of approval that was adopted by the Planning Commission any text or graphics included the Midtown Master Plan proposal and associated case documents referencing proposed, desired, or long-range improvements that include or illustrate circulation, connecting networks, or other planning concepts and features on properties external to the Midtown Master Plan area shall not be considered as part of any recommendation or final action related to the Master Plan. So in short, there were concerns about connections being made to uh, adjacent properties uh, without um, 
you know, express consent or, um, you know, there might be possibility for these things to happen in the future, but we just don't know. So it was requested that we remove those things, which we have. Uh, we met with the abutting property owners representatives on October 28th. And we discussed the note regarding um, the external connections. And we came to agreement that um, this is sprinkled throughout the master plan that the following note be added. No external connection shall be constructed, dedicated, or made a condition of approval of any development application on adjacent property without the express consent of the affected adjacent property owner. So that is how we've resolved that. And we've received communication from um, that group that uh, addresses their concern. We also received communication from other uh, pro abutting property owners, which includes Santa Fe Public Schools. We've been meeting with Larry Chavez and um, different members of the public schools uh, uh, administration. And um, they there's been a general level of support, but ex concerns still expressed regarding the potential connections and other issues that might impact their property. Milagro School is right there and apparently they've had some security issues and the like. And so there are all other not master plan related things that we can do as a city to support them. And so um, we're gonna continue those conversations with the superintendent and his staff. So tonight, the available resource staff that you have, if you have questions at the end, include uh, Regina Wheeler with Public Works, Alexandra Ladd with Affordable Housing, Dee Bengesner from the Civil Technical Review side of things, Carly Piccarelli, Piccarello with Historic Preservation, Eric Ani with the MPO, uh, P. Fred Herebrandt with Wastewater, Melissa McDonald, Parks and Open Space, Geronimo Griego for Fire Life Safety, and Alan Hook for water. We're in a mix of in-person as well as on Zoom, but they're available for any um, questions that you may have. And that concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. And, and excuse me, that takes us to the applicant, which is uh, who will be represented by Lee Logston. Lee, assume you want to have a minute to connect as well. Is the applicant. Um, Mr. City Attorney, are we swearing in Mr. Logston? Yep. I think that's advisable. Yep. The city clerk will do that then. <clears throat> Lee, I'm going to try something really new for this. Give me one sec. It's what I was working on. Um, Uh, ben, can you do my screen share on the TVs? Oh, no, I should still, there it is. But now you can't see it. Um, can you put it on all the monitors? Let's see, Lee. I'm trying to get you a square and sheet so that you can raise your right hand. But you might, you can't see it, huh? Yeah, we have to be on it. There. Oh, there we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. I was going to try this new everyone because I'm sure we're going to swear in a lot of people. So um, there you go, Lee. I was just working on that. So you raise your hand. Yep. And say, I. I, Lee Logston, uh, residing at 727 Galisteo Street in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, 87505. Uh, solemnly declare, declare and affirm that the testimony I have in reference to the Midtown uh, Master Plan and Associated Applications shall be the truth and nothing but the truth. And I do this under the penalties of perjury. Hey, that was fun. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank sure. you. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Weber. Uh, Councilors, it's an uh, honor to be in front of you tonight. And on behalf of the applicant team, I want to uh, express that we are beyond pleased to be standing here tonight bringing you these various applications uh, associated to Midtown. Um, 
It has been a lot of work over a lot of time involving many citizens and our consultants. Uh, I do want to uh, make known that we do have members of the applicant team here tonight. We have uh, Dina Belzer with Strategic Economics in the back. We have Stefan uh, Pellegrino or Pellegrini from uh, uh, Opticos. Uh, we have myself, uh, and of course, we always have Daniel Hernandez from Proyecto. Um, for my part, I just want to say that I have been uh, both humbled and honored to be a part of this project. Uh, my history in this town does not go back as far as many. Uh, I have no memory of the College of Santa Fe as a living institution. Uh, I have only the vaguest memory of the uh, University of Art and Design. They basically quit operating right about the time I got here. So I never saw the campus myself as a living, breathing institution. Uh, and there are many in this audience tonight and many of the people that we worked with through our engagement partners uh, that have shared very many memories that went into what is in this master plan. I just want to give a quick shout out to all of our engagement partners because I invariably can list two, three or four and then I kind of get tongue tied. Um, our engagement partners with whom we could not have or without whom we could not have done this are Chainbreaker, Earthcare, Little Globe. Uh, Santa Fe uh, Art Institute, YouthWorks, uh, Fathers of New Mexico, Friends of Santa Fe Library, La Familia Medical Center, and the Santa Fe Indigenous Center. And they were able to reach populations that we, as city staff, sometimes can't with our normal means. And we're really proud of the work we did here. One of our engagement partners, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Daniel uh, Hernandez after this, but one of our engagement partners, YouthWorks, put together a short video that I'm going to play for you. And it really speaks to me, once again, bringing back to life those memories you'll hear from the people. Uh, this was filmed during the block party. And so, you know, people expressing memories and then young people who don't have memories of the campus expressing, you know, because they didn't go to college there, you know, yet they're too young, but they have their own aspirations for the site. And so I want to play this short film by Little Globe. It's only about three minutes, and then I'll turn things over to Daniel Hernandez. We all need to just come back together and we need to come up with solutions for all of us, not just for some of us. The values would be inclusive of uh, many walks of life, many different backgrounds and kind of be accessible to a lot of different types of people. I would want the Midtown site to feel um, comfortable and to where like it's fun and like you like enjoy being there. It's integrated into the life of the community in multiple ways. It's like a common place where people would be for lots of different reasons. A place to congregate, to socialize, to learn, to enjoy. Education in, in one way or another. It could be on sort of the academic side or the artistic side. I think they need a big area for the indigenous people like a powwow grounds. We've always been about our culture, so it's like, you know, I like to see art exhibits. I like to see, you know, markets. Facilities for the elderly. It would be nice to see young people and old people. And I think it should meet those multiple needs. More public spaces where people could just go and be without always having to pay money. We have a full theater here. So I'd like to, to see the arts be integrated into some programming here. Small businesses we would like to bring in and just have kind of a multi- um, layered living structure here as well. A land trust so that it stays in the hands of the community forever. It's just sad to me because a lot of the people I went to high school with, they can't afford to live here anymore. 
probably just a matter of time, then I won't be able to afford to live here anymore, you know? And a lot of us locals who were born and raised here, we just can't afford it anymore. It's too expensive. Over the years, uh, it got more expensive and then we're forced to like basically move out of Section 8. And so I'd probably just like to see like affordable housing. So many things in Santa Fe are really oriented outwards facing towards tourism. So something that, that kind of faced inward and was like a, a, a center that, that could run into people. Better communicate with one another, be able to be creative with one another, be able to dialogue with other families with a sense of self-determination, a willingness to like be uncomfortable um, and in that space of learning. It is up to us that decides our future. Right now, we must let the youth and healing lead the way. Don't know this program super well. Let's <laughs> close it. Let's close it. Let's reach out. Do you know this? No. Looks like it's not yet. This didn't happen at Planning Commission. Altif. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> there was literally no option to quit or exit or anything. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. So where are we at this point? Yeah. Hmm. That was just the introduction. Okay. Uh, be mindful of the clock, yeah. please. Um, Do we need to swear? Mr. Hernandez in, please. All right. Your slide should be, you switch over to the, there you go. Thank you. That far. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll go quickly because um, uh, uh, Heather was able to bring up a lot of the points that uh, we as the applicant wanted to bring up, but I wanted to say um, good evening and thank you all for just welcoming uh, the applicant, us, the applicant here. Um, I've made many presentations over several months to you on just to get us to this point. Um, so it's an exciting moment for, for the entire team. And, uh, and so again, thank you. Um, this was all really provoked early on um, by a resolution that you all passed um, that really guided what you requested us to do or directed us to do as a team, which was to rezone the property, put a community development plan together, issue three RFPs, which will go out this week, um, reuse the Fogelson Public Library as a, Fogelson uh, Library is a public resource, a public library. Um, sorry. Um, it, and, and to do studies for the potential of a government services building on adjacent parcels at Midtown and to acquire through a land swap, the state-owned properties um, that are adjacent to the site. 
So those are all be being fulfilled this week. Um, it was a culmination of a lot of activity over the course uh, since you passed this earlier this year to bring us to this point. And I do want to recognize all the amazing city departments that guided us as well through this process and the consultant team, um, including who, um, who weren't mentioned earlier, but the folks at Wilson and Company um, that provided all the assessment on the infrastructure at the site. But I think that the main point that we want to make this evening is this plan, while there was a lot of technical pieces within the plan itself that we needed to follow, the plans were really created with people. And um, as Lee said earlier, I think that we entered a major pivot point in the way that planning might be done in the future in Santa Fe with the support of community organizations and supporting their work in reaching voices that we don't typically hear in public policy making and planning our cities. Um, and so it was an exciting moment for us to actually work and think through and we, we put pen to paper, or yeah, pen to paper, um, their voices were continually guiding um, the decisions that were made along the way to create a sustainable uh, redevelopment, a set of redevelopment plans. So again, there are two companion plans. One is the community development plan, which is really a policy plan that captures a lot of what people said that they wanted to see there. So it or experience there, I should say. So it wasn't about the physical environment as much as about the social and environmental life that will be there. I remember earlier, early discussions I had with some community folks was like, we don't care about the height of a curb or the width of a sidewalk as much as we care about, is there gonna be affordable housing? How will we know the jobs that might be available to us? And how will we access them? Will they be for us? Will this be a place for our communities here in Santa Fe, which is much different than the physical um, aspects of what we're here for tonight. So, but we have to create that framework, that physical environment through the Midtown um, redevelopment plan. So the other element was the land development plan, meaning the master plan and everything else that you will be voting on tonight. Um, so um, I think the other piece that is important in this is that we heard from the community about the importance of health and environmental sustainability at the site. So we used the United States Green Building Council leadership for energy and environmental design. There's one specific for neighborhood development, meaning at the district scale. We use that to guide all of our decisions. And we also work with the sustainability office because whether, you, I don't know if you know or not, but Santa Fe is a gold lead city, the leadership in environmental design. Um, so they worked with us on establishing the credits that were really important to maintaining that gold lead certification. So I'll walk very quickly what's inside the plan. There's six chapters, um, and um, I hope that you've had a chance to at least review it, if not read it from, um, from uh, front to back, but I'll walk through it fairly quickly. Um, so the purpose and intent really was to describe um, why this plan was important, and it followed, uh, it describes the planning process that we went through from 2018 when the university closed its doors to tonight, um, and all the planning that happened within even the past year. Um, it lists the preferred, preferred uses. Again, those preferred uses, what we heard what people do not want to see there, but more importantly, what people do want to see there. So um, it describes the all of the uses um, that, the, that are allowable as of right, um, as well as ones that we um, will, may require an additional review. Um, it describes the background and setting of the site, and Heather covered it a bit, uh, just about the history, the amazing history of the site. And as we discussed at the Finance Committee on Wednesday, on Monday night, that it was an asset that the city purchased, not necessarily sp strictly for a financial purpose, but it was really to maintain a public asset at that time, education, and now redefining that public asset for a public place, a civic center in the center, geographic center of the city. Um, and so we followed a lot of the direction that were set through resolutions. Those resolutions are re restated in the master plan so that we understand the context and direction that the governing body had given um, uh, to create the plans and what guided their those decisions. It talks a lot about the con existing conditions um, and the existing conditions that are challenging. Um, it sits as an isolated uh, site. Um, connections were really important um, in the way that people described their access from adjacent neighborhoods. How will they get there safely? So we talked a lot about, again, our relationships to adjacent neighbors, um, how in the future, as we continue thinking about and as how the link overlay corridor will continue to develop, um, we want to promote um, ongoing and ex uh, additional connections um, to the outside 
um, city and adjacent neighbors and adjacent property owners. But again, we we we're, we want to work with them um, as they consider redeveloping their parcels as well. Um, the infrastructure is outdated. So there will be the part of the uh, master plan and putting it together was understanding a phased development approach based on where existing infrastructure is and how we can begin phasing development over the site. We also have to parcelize the site. There's no existing parcels for development. So the pl master plan um, really addresses all of the challenges and how we might move forward through that. Um, there was urban, the urban design elements um, really talked and Heather uh, reiterated this, but um, we wanted to promote a multimodal transport and circulation pattern throughout the site. So when you look at the site, you'll see that there are large streets, smaller streets, and actually paseos where only bikes and pedestrians will be able to walk on. And they're very flexible in the way that they can be developed on the site, but their requirements um, uh, throughout the district um, itself and the, and the different types of districts that are even within the site. So the notion of comfort and walkability um, was very important in the way that the streets were designed um, and in ensuring uh, pedestrian and walkability. Again, we heard a lot of uh, discussion about health from people, and um, we had to interpret what that meant in an urban design framework. So the block patterns, for example, we have small dimension blocks, similar to what you see here in the historic district in Santa Fe, so that you can decide different routes to get to your destinations. You are not walking a huge um, block in order to, which is uh, often detracts people from walking. Um, and so to get to your destination, we have smaller block patterns. Um, we also thought about the stormwater management as a way to deal with water because we heard from adjacent property owners flooding problems, um, but we also wanted to use the stormwater management system as open space where we can program and we heard, as you heard from earlier from the woman about powwow grounds, but other concerts and movie nights and other things that can happen in these civic open spaces that are also part of the stormwater green infrastructure. The site is really formed around a plaza. Um, and so there's higher density in the plaza area with commercial uses and residential above. And then there's districts around that plaza, um, the residential districts, commercial districts, and then further south, um, the expansion of the film studios. So again, as you see in this slide, that's a section of the, of, the, of the entire site, meaning that if you're looking, just if you slice right through it, you would see that we've concentrated higher density in the middle of the site. Um, where the plaza is so that it, you create a room with the buildings and you feel protected, similar to the way that the plaza here is when you're in there. Um, the, the space is defined by buildings that surround it. Um, and then as you begin uh, looking to, towards uh, away from the plaza, um, there's residential districts um, that become less dense. Um, again, you heard earlier that this is a place-based place approach meaning that we were not strict in the, in the type of architecture um, or specific um, architectural requirements, but we were very clear on the urban design scale types of requirements, setbacks, sides of streets, the heights, and we use the heights that are existing in the link corridor right now um, to dictate the, the height limits also within the, the, um, the district. Um, so the, in the district, you'll see there's different subzones, which is also very an important thing to create a comprehensive neighborhood. We've been asked about, well, if, if uh, how does this happen? If it happens organically, how are you going to actually create a sense of place? Um, so that, again, there's urban design guidelines that will be followed, but there's also these districts and the kinds of things that can happen within the district. So. Um, we also, during the planning process, had to study just what the development capacity of the site was in order to design the infrastructure to uh, to be able to um, uh, uh, the infrastructure that would be able to sustain the type of development there. So here you see commercial development, uh, retail and restaurant, about forty four thousand square feet. Institutional uses, we're pro projecting about 120,000, office 90 to 100, hospital, uh, hospitality and lodging, we projected 100 rooms, um, and then the film expansion um, to about 10.46 acres that, again, will be uh, part of the RFP that goes out this week. But again, these were for study purposes only. The purpose was to design the infrastructure to be able to support this type of development. And this can range um, over time as development happens and the types of demands and um, interest that we get from the development community, but also the types of things that we will hear from the from communities going forward 
and as your um, people who follow in your footsteps and sit in your chairs into the future, they will make additional decisions about these kinds of issues as well. But there are some there are some things that are bottom line. So while there is a range of housing from 100 to 1100, 900 to 1100 units, we also um, uh, have set a baseline in the master plan saying that 30% of all the residential units will be affordable to low and moderate income families. So one of the things that the Office of Economic Development will do will be to monitor um, throughout time how we are around that 30% um, to make sure that we're maintaining that 30% um, uh, based on the number of actual residential units that gets built. Um, again, the total open space area, the plaza is about 1.22 acres, um, plus there's additional 5.1 acres um, that are scattered throughout the site. Some will be on private properties, but again, you see the long green strip over to the right, the central plaza, um, and there's room within the design guidelines, urban design guidelines for smaller parklets um, uh, on private property, as well as on public streets. Um, the way that we're going to achieve this affordable housing strategy, you heard a little bit earlier, one, the inclusionary zoning will be applied at Midtown. Um, we, are, we, are, uh, identif we have identified four parcels um, that will be through an RFP uh, 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 disposed um, to affordable housing developers so that they can be competitive in securing the really limited resources and financing. This will give them an edge by discounting the land value so that they can be competitive in securing uh, and leverage other private uh, financing sources. Um, and the, one of the first ones we wanna get out is again, uh, is an affordable housing RFP probably after the beginning of the year. And we also immediately wanna get um, one out for a housing trust, um, <coughs> a housing land trust, um, affordable housing development as well. Um, we also are gonna be achieving affordability, just natural affordability in the marketplace by diverse housing types. So um, we wanna make sure that we're building townhouses, apartments, um, so that we're addressing, and, and different sizes of units, so that we're addressing a, a, a variety of <clears throat> diverse um, household types uh, at Midtown. And then finally, we'll have an RFP for live work units for people who wanna work at home and don't need or have to pay then the commercial rents um, that are always escalating, um, but they're able to then have their small businesses at home um, and that living area is different and separated from their work area. Uh, community health, I talked a little bit about it. I'll scroll through these because I know that we're running out of time. Uh, connectivity was also important and I talked a little bit about that. But again, I wanna reiterate that we have this notion of where cars will be, um, you know, that were, are designed for cars and people, and spaces are also just designed for people and bicycles. Um, and we want to continue thinking about through that that multimodal transportation strategy um, as uh, uh, as Midtown gets developed. I'm going to go through these, but I talked a little bit about um, the different districts. Um, so even the street patterns in the districts will look different. So a neighborhood street will have a different type of sidewalk um, than, for example, in, around the plaza. Um, so these different areas have different design standards to create the kind of unity um, that we can see at Midtown and not just sort of this disparate uh, design pattern. Um, so there's guidelines that will help regulate uh, and to create a, a sense of place at, at, at Midtown. So again, here's design guidance for the civic space, the plaza area. Um, and I talked a little bit about park, park, pocket parks. So civic, more civic buildings. Um, uh, and here's some design guidelines, for example, for the plaza. So the plaza area will have um, the portico um, areas so that, um, again, that portico type arrangement, the way sort of what you see downtown as well, will surround the plaza. Um, here's neighborhood paseos. So again, the residential development will be lower density. Street patterns will look different. Um, and here's an image of the stormwater systems um, that streets played a really critical role in the way that we'll be managing water. There's appendices in the, um, in the plan itself. It we'll have a series of maps um, that show the entirety of Midtown. And then finally, which you have seen this slide several times, we keep people updated. Um, the plan is on the website, uh, midtowndistrictsantafe.org. Um, so we uh, uh, posted earlier versions of the master plan, um, and the, the current one that's before you is also posted on the site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Logston, any concluding remarks uh, before we go to the public testimony? 
Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, no, uh, we'll be happy to take questions when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, we now turn to sworn public comment. I wonder, uh, Madam Clerk, is there a way to swear in folks as a uh, have them stand and raise their hand and do it as a entirety of anyone who wishes to come forward so that we don't have to do it individually? Good question. So you don't think we're uh, permitted to do it as a as a as a group? Well, let's do it. She's trying to show it to the people in the audience. <clears throat> She can do that too, but I think we just, uh, the question at the moment is what. Madam Clerk, I would suggest that you read it out loud and people, it's not in Spanish for everybody. Not everybody's going to be able to take it off the screen. If anyone who wishes to testify, we could do it as a whole group with you leading them through it. I think we'll get there. That's fine, but let's get them sworn in now. Mr. Mayor, one thing we did change is they don't have to say their address. It was either address or their district. Street. Street name or district. So let's let's see. Anyone who is going to testify tonight will do a swearing in as a group. Yes. And Madam Clerk, you need everybody to raise, uh, stand up and raise their right hand. Yes. If everyone could just stand up and raise your right hand, I'll walk you through what the slide says. And then when you come up to speak, you still need to state your name and your address so we know who's speaking. Um, so if you could all say I and state your name. Residing at and state your address. This is so fun. Solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony I have in reference to, you guys could just say the Midtown campus item or something, shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury. Okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, when you walk up, if you'll just state your name and your address. Thank you. Does that work for you, Mayor? So we're going to uh, ask everybody to uh, either line up or when there's a, a space in front of you, you can fill in. Um, we're going to try to uh, try to uh, keep the comments to about two minutes per person. If you can do that, that would be great. And the clerk will be keeping a clock so you know when the time is expired. Um, but please do take Take your time to make your statement, uh, and we'll try to be uh, understanding that not everybody can squeeze it all into exactly two minutes. So do your very best, because we have a lot of folks who want to testify. So please step up to the uh, microphone, state your name, address, and the clock. 
Uh, my name is Cheryl Odom. I live at 1152 Huelta de las Tasequias, um, District 4. Um, I taught at the college for 30 years, so I'm very attached, and you guys are probably already sick of me. But I did have two things I wanted to mention. I have two, two requests. One is that the memory of the Christian brothers not be forgotten. They've been in this town since 1873. And that is a big deal for a lot of people that live in Santa Fe. And the other thing is, I noticed in your uh, proposal that you were partnering with PNM. And I want to point out that because the architecture on the Midtown campus is mostly mid-century, everything has flat roofs. Flat roofs. I have a flat roof. Gets what's on my flat roof? Solar panels. So I don't see why we can't take advantage of all of those flat roofs to be even more sustainable um, to the community and better for our climate. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Andrea Dobbins and 2278 Kai Cuesta. So good evening, Mayor Weber and City Council uh, members. My name is Andrea Dobbins, and I serve as president of the Santa Fe Association of Realtors. On behalf of the association, a trade organization representing over 900 realtors, along with nearly 100 affiliated organizations, I'm here this evening to share the association's support for the proposed Midtown, Midtown Development Plan. More than 10 years ago, the association recognized Midtown as a gem in the geographic center of Santa Fe, that was ripe for redevelopment. We believe the corridor in alignment with the Midtown Development Plan can offer important benefits for multifamily and retail developers while providing substantial savings in fees, water, and permitting, including generous density and height allowances. Creative concepts for retail on ground level and apartments atop, multifamily and offices sitting along a landscaped boulevard where massive parking lots now sit, mostly empty, is encouraged. Re-energizing these large parking lots with restaurants, shops, coffee houses, or entertainment venues for the community is welcomed. The association is pleased that the Midtown Master Plan has identified the need and ability to provide 1,100 housing units, many of which will be affordable for the community. Even better, these affordable units can be mixed throughout the district. The plan recognizes the need to address effectively and efficiently existing property or infrastructure de uh, deficiencies moving forward and that the city of Santa Fe is working to identify state level funding to help with infrastructure and efficiencies, as well as creating a digital framework for growth. This funding should be a priority. The association encourages the city to spur redevelopment within the Midtown District through economic development outreach, especially to those entities who express interest and offer proposals. Lastly, to the extent that opportunity zones abut or impact the Midtown District, the Qualified Opportunity Zone program brings business opportunities for realtors as well as opportunities for them to be involved in the planning of the new developments. Um, thank you for the opportunity. We have a lot more to say, but really we just support this. So thank, thank you. Them. Please, if you have a written statement, just leave it with the clerk and we'll make sure it gets into okay, the- Okay, I'll uh, send it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Point of information. Quick question. Um, I'm going to be translating statements for members who are speaking in Spanish. I myself am not actually testifying, but I'm still Kathy Garcia residing and renting at 2600 West Zia Road. Thank you. Buenas noches, soy Raimundo Herrera. Vivo en el 2000 de Hopewell Street, del otro lado de, del campus. Eh, yo conocí este campus caminando con mi perro y veía todo abandonado, casi vacío al 100%. Me gustó caminar y yo decía, ¿qué caso tiene tener todo esto vacío? Eh, eh, pertenezco a la organización de cadenas rotas desde meses anteriores y empecé a, a ver el estatus en la situación en que se encontraba ese cap, campus y he estado en talleres participando con... Lee Longston, Alexandra Lan, y me he enterado de cómo está la situación. Y nos gustaría apreciar estos esfuerzos que, han hecho, que ha hecho la ciudad, porque esto demuestra participación y autenticidad en la comunidad. Y un modelo de liderazgo para desarrollar The Midtown, que esperamos que continúe a medida que avance el proceso. Yo estoy aquí para animarlos a aceptar 
el desarrollo de los 64 acres de Midtown y continuar con la siguiente fase y seguir interactuando con la comunidad. Gracias por su atención y comprensión. Buenas noches. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Raimundo Herrera and I live at 2000 Hopewell Street. I've been a member of Chainbreaker for several months now. Chainbreaker is an economic and environmental organization. We work to expand access to affordable and sustainable transportation and housing. Um, uh, where was I? Me perdí. Sorry. Um, before I knew about the campus, I would go every morning and walk around with my dog, and I would wonder why this lot was so empty and not um, not being built upon. But as a member of uh, uh, Chainbreaker, I have been participating in Midtown uh, workshops uh, where me and my neighbors learned more about the status of the property, where we recently heard speak Lee Logston and Alexandra Ladd, who uh, listened to what we said and responded to our question. Uh, we wanted to appreciate these um, efforts um, by part of the city and because these efforts demonstrate authentic participation in the community and is a model for leadership development in the development of Midtown, which we expect will continue as this pro uh, process advances. I am here today to support um, the rezonification and the plans of change uh, amendments to the plans on the 64 acres of Midtown so that we can continue the next phase of development and continue interacting with the community. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Uh, buenas tardes a uh, los participantes, alcalde, concejales. Mi nombre es Cipriana Jurado y vivo en Sierra Vista. He sido miembro de Rompecadenas por más de cinco años y eh, eh, participé en la asamblea junto con más de 500 personas que se hicieron para empezar a, a discutir el, qué se iba a hacer con la tierra de, de la Universidad de las Artes. Desde entonces, desde el 2018, he estado tocando puertas en la comunidad este, eh, para informar a la gente de los alrededores de la universidad qué es lo que está pasando. He organizado el enfoque que, que queremos es hacer que esta comunidad este, sea tomada en cuenta con las propuestas que se, ya se han hecho en diferentes reuniones que hemos tenido con quienes ha, han presentado el, el, la propuesta. Hemos hecho talleres comunitarios con este, Lee y con Alexander para que los mantengan informados de lo que está pasando y las decisiones que ustedes están revisando. Mi propuesta es que se apruebe la zonificación de MITAM porque tenemos la esperanza y por eso luchamos de que se forme un fideicomiso de tierras, de tierras comunitarias para el seguimiento y el desarrollo. Necesitamos en esta ciudad vivienda digna y accesible. Santa Fe se está convirtiendo en un problema de vivienda que pronto va a explotar si no ponemos un punto ahí. No hay vivienda accesible para la, la gran familia de, la, de esta comunidad. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Cipriana Jurado. I live in the Sierra Vista Mobile Home Park. I've been a Chainbreaker member for over five years. I participated in Chainbreaker's 2018 Assembly, where over 500 of our members discussed what should happen to the uh, land of the then Santa Fe University of Art and Design. Since then, I've knocked doors in the surrounding neighborhoods, informing the community and organizing around our desires for our community. We want the results of the community engagement process to continue to be taken into account, as well as the proposals that have already been developed with the community in various meetings. We've organized meetings recently with Lee Logston and Alexandra Ladd to stay informed of these processes. I propose that you approve the rezoning of Midtown because of the hope that we have in developing a community land trust, which will be part of the next phases of development. We need affordable and dignified housing Santa Fe is on the verge of a crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening. My name is Evelyn Herrera, and uh, I live in 2000 Hopewell Street, and I'll be reading on behalf of one of our members that unfortunately couldn't make it because um, of work. 
Um, okay, so here I go. Uh, good evening, City Council and Mayor. My name is Elder Cruz Lopez and I live at 2020 Calle Lorca. I've been a member, a Chambercare member for a while, almost two years now. I became a member of Chambercare when they knocked on my door at my Midtown apartment. I learned that Chambercare has been organizing in my community, community for many years and has focused on the development of Midtown since 2018. Through Chainbreaker, I filled out a Renho application and have come to understand more about what is happening, happening around my community. I lived in Santa Fe for 20 years and, and I always lived around the area of Midtown in a variety of apartment complexes. I have attended meetings that Chainbreaker has organized with Lee Longston and Alexandra Ladd, where they have provided information about Midtown and its development. I would like the council to approve the rezoning of Midtown because my neighbors and I have hope in the formation of a community land trust in the Midtown development. Um, sorry, and the possibility of more affordable housing for the community, controlled by the community. For my part, I have dreams of owning a home in this neighborhood. If not me, then my ch children. And so the development has direct impact impacts on my family and my future. I will continue organizing and engaging with members of my community as the development of Meta moves forward to make that possible. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Miles Conway, 495 New Mexico, 592, 87506. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, I am a board member of Santa Fe Habitat for Humanity and New Mexico Interfaith Housing. I'm delivering a, a statement and uh, speaking as the executive officer of the Santa Fe Area Home Builders Association. Um, we appreciate how all the major issues of sustainability, workforce, and affordable, affordable housing and creative community development are all addressed in the plan. And our association acknowledges and uh, uh, really appreciates the difficult balancing act that the council performs when deciding how to structure the city's prospective return on investment, uh, whether or not to exclude fee and lieu, um, options, uh, the option for development, what percentage of residential housing shall be mandated to be truly affordable by the definition. Um, so from an industry perspective and informed by the primary findings within the recently released uh, New Mexico Mortgage Finance Authority's Housing New Mexico Call to Action Report, um, local, state, and federal governments need to make deep investments in housing. Now, regardless of how the return of an, of an on investment looks on the balance sheet. Um, now, uh, briefly from page two of the report, capacity and resources, as the market has changed the gap between the cost of development in the private market and what low and moderate income would-be buyers could afford has widened considerably. We estimate the gap ranges from 110,000 to 195,000 per home based on recent sales transactions. So I think it, it, part of the plan in the RFPs, we look forward to seeing this financial gap or chasm between affordability and development costs, especially for affordable rental or owner occupied housing needs to be closed. For starters, this will assuredly entail deep discounts or donations of land innovative tax abatement schemes, other incentive programs to spur the construction activity that's needed. And I'm certain recent uh, historic knowledge proves that these tools such as fee and lieu can't be completely taken off the table without the consequence of stifling the development. Uh, that we encourage the approval of the resolution. Look forward to seeing the request for proposals to put Midtown in motion. My first memory of coming to Santa Fe is going to the College of Santa Fe, had a buddy that was there. We we're all in the middle of the campus. There was like war hoops going on between IAIA campus and the College of Santa Fe. It was a lot of fun. And I can't wait you know, to be there again in a really fun, vibrant uh, center of our city. Thanks, y'all. Thank you very much. Adam Johnson, 121 Arroyo Honda Trail, 87508. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Adam Fulton Johnson, and I am the executive director of the Old Santa Fe Association. We have followed the Midtown development with keen interest. We believe that Midtown redevelopment has an opportunity to forge a unique urban core 
reimagining 64 acres to serve the needs and interests of Santa Feans and to do so in a distinctly Santa Fe style. OSFA provided feedback to Mayor Weber and Rich Brown in a meeting at City Hall expressing concerns about design guidelines and height allowances, while also expressing our enthusiasm for the potentials of this project. Mr. Brown later connected us with Daniel Hernandez and Lee Logston. We again conveyed our support and asked pointed questions about housing affordability and the historic buildings currently present on the Midtown campus. We applaud the inclusion of historic preservation and design considerations into the forthcoming RFPs. And we hope to be included as community partners in future decisions about the look and feel of the campus, especially how it serves longtime Santa Feans. We support a Midtown that fits both the Santa Fe that we know and love, as well as opens a new chapter for a cohesively designed urban village. So we support approving the rezoning and master plan tonight. Once we move to the next stage, OSFA urges you to commit to design standards that fit with the rest of the city, pledge to protect affordable housing at the site for all Santa Feans, and ensure compliance with these standards on the part of the developers who are ultimately selected. We look forward to watching this project come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Bridget Dixon. I live at 4147 Las Brisas. I'm also the president and CEO of the Santa Fe Chamber of Commerce. The chamber has been the voice of business in our community for over 100 years, and we represent over 800 member businesses. Since 2018, the chamber has been in support of the Midtown project and excited to see it move forward in a productive way that feels inclusive and has been developed with input of the community. The Midtown project will provide numerous jobs, innovation for entrepreneurs, and diversified housing options. I would like to commend Rich Brown, Daniel Hernandez, and his team, as well as the mayor and the members of this council for all the hard work that has been brought to this project and bring it to, and brought it to where it is today. Again, the Santa Fe Chamber of Commerce, along with our board of directors, endorse this project and look forward to the coming to fruition. Thank you. Thank you very much. A mayor, city councilors, my name is Glenn Schiffbauer. My address is 519 Vera Drive, 87501. Mm -hmm. I'm the executive director of the Santa Fe Green Chamber of Commerce. And um, our tagline is uh, adhering to the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. We have been confident and following along with the plans uh, for the last four years and uh, knowing that things evolve as uh, developments are built, that the affordable housing was going to um be very important to this development as well as the potential for economic development in the midtown area the one thing that was missing for us and for myself was the comfort with sustainability this plan addresses sustainable design in its vision and having the us gbc and lead certification has given us a level of comfort that there's going to be a sustainable and sustainability bent towards the development of this project. I mean, just the fact that there's stormwater management uh, has been very heartening for someone who is one of the organizers of the Next Generation Water Summit. But the real thing that sealed it for us was a uh, future or upgrading to electrification, because we know that going carbon free, the best path is going to be through electrification. And we've been working with Senator Heinrich's office on his Electrify America resolution. We've also been working with the Beneficial Electrification League. So we know how important it is. One of the things that this will allow is renewable energy to be the source of power for this development. And one final thing, when you talk about affordable housing, it's not just the entry into that house, it's being able to stay there. And we know that the energy burden for low to middle income families and people is much greater than for the rest of the population. So as an organization and as an individual, we support the adoption of this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Mayor, Councillors, I'm Ray Landy at 610 Bishop's Lodge Road. I'm also a, a board member of the Santa Fe Art Institute and chair of its Midtown Committee. And on behalf of our board chair, Maria Wilkinson, and our executive director, Jamie Blosser, uh, we are thrilled to support this legislation. Uh, it's been a lonely existence for us on a corner of the site of Midtown. And the fact that we can look forward to neighbors soon is also a thrilling uh, uh, aspect for us. But what, what is more thrilling is that we can assist the city uh, in achieving one of its core values for this general plan. And that's a vibrant and diverse arts and cultural hub. One that really recognizes so many organizations in the city that can that usually would not be able to have a place to reside, would not be able to benefit from the synergy of multiple arts organizations in Midtown. And we look forward to uh, playing a role in that. There have been over 2,200 residents in the arts that have moved through Santa Fe Art Institute since 1985. Uh, we believe that that diverse population of artists from all over the world can really provide something significant to the city uh, and other organizations who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to reside at city at Midtown. Uh, so we, we look forward to it and we thank the hard work of Rich Brown and his staff and, uh, and the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. My name is Forrest Thomas. Uh, my address is 1040 Camino Manana, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87501. Um, I am here to say I'm very grateful to be present and in strong support of what the city's efforts are to create an avenue to redevelop the campus. Um, the city staff made major, major efforts to work with the neighboring property owners. Uh, we're very grateful for all the efforts and uh, consideration that they have given us as neighboring property owners. Um, I'm very encouraged and hopeful to see younger people, typical, normal Santa Fans being able to stay in their city. It's a challenge. I left Santa Fe immediately out of high school and as I joke, the land of entrapment has brought me back, and I am very grateful to be here. Um, I think that it's going to be some time before we get to a place where the uh, campus is energized and full of people and activities. I strongly encourage the city to make some sincere efforts uh, to help deal with the crime and the problems that have become outrageous you know, along St. Michael's Drive, and I hate using that word, but uh, we have people coming to our shopping center, shooting up in the parking lot daily, right in front of the business's front doors. Um, it is a real problem. We can't really get assistance uh, with the police. It takes too long to respond. These people come in and go out, um, but it is a very serious problem throughout the city. But I think because of the campus's lack of activities currently, um, there is a considerable draw for people to be in that area that are not up to good activities. We've had numerous of our businesses broken into. So I plead on their behalf, um, help try and do some more to uh, bring some more police presence uh, in the meanwhile. And I am very excited again to support this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Uh, members of the governing body, my name is Matt O'Reilly, 3229 Calle de Molina, District 4. Um, I'm the vice president of Thomas Properties so that owns a significant amount of land around the university um, and wanted to take this opportunity to thank uh, city staff, particularly the staff of the land use department for their amazing efforts to address uh, what were some pretty serious concerns that we had you could tell from some of the information in your packet, those concerns have been addressed and uh, we are in full support of this master plan. A couple of things uh, just I think it would be important for the city to remember. With regard to affordable housing, Tierra Contenta, which is a project that I was involved with 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, um, we started Tierra Contenta, is over 45% affordable housing on a dwelling unit basis. So the 30% affordable housing that's proposed for the campus 
should be seen as a floor, in my humble opinion. Um, we can do more than that on this campus, and the city's in a unique position to do that. Um, also, I uh, wanted to point out that um, although changes to the Midtown Link ordinance are proposed tonight, some changes will still, the Midtown Link will still apply on this campus in, a many, in many areas, including the requirement that any fee in lieu that are paid in the Midtown Link area have to stay and be used and applied in the Midtown Link area, which could include this campus. And uh, finally, I uh, just wanted to say that a lot of people have been sharing their memories of the campus. Um, I can honestly say that I've been through every square inch of every building and on top of and underneath every square inch of this building, <laughs> in, these buildings, including the secret passages in the Garson Theater. And some of you know what I'm talking about. But one of the things that is really cool about Garson and I've discovered this by researching the building back in the day. The Garson Theater used to have turquoise inlay on the corners of the building, and now it's been stuccoed over. So food for thought. That would be pretty cool if that was able to come back. So, thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else who wishes to speak at this time who has not had a chance yet? Madoika. Ah, uh, it's ah, but it's I ba. The nani it's a Karen Bullard. The county cut na district one. As chair of the Santa Fe Indigenous Center Board, I'm pleased to speak to you tonight here on Tewa Land. The Santa Fe Indigenous Center supports the adoption of the Midtown Community Development Plan for the Midtown Redevelopment Project. We at the center look forward to watching this project grow, and we are pleased that you listen to our native voice. Edda, thank you. And I have zero time. I don't think I talked no, for two minutes. You have, you have a whole minute. Okay. I would also like to invite you to the Indigenous Bazaar Arts and Crafts December 10th at our center on Cerritos Boulevard. And we will have um, Native artists selling their goods and arts and paintings and jewelry. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else who is present or on Zoom who wishes to uh, speak to this public hearing? If, if there's no one left in the room, Madam Clerk, are there people on the Zoom uh, screen? We are waiting for the Zoom. We are waiting for Zoom people. Um, we also, Councillor Chavez is helping hand out uh, public comment that was received to be distributed okay. from Heather. Okay. Uh, we do have three individuals uh, right now in the Zoom room, Zoom room on Zoom, uh, waiting to speak. And so we'll start with Miss Stephanie Beninato. Thank you. Uh, hold, on. Stephanie. I'm also. You may have seen it. I'm going to do a screen share, um, so that you can be sworn in. Stephanie, can you see that? Yeah, I, Stephanie Beninato, residing in District 4, solemnly, de I mean, excuse me, District 2, solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony, whoops, it just went away. Uh, I'm Stephanie, we can't hear you. Oh, I've unmuted. I've unmuted. Stephanie? Yeah, I've unmuted. I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. Oh, man. Is that oh, Stephanie, now we can hear you. You can hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, well, I haven't changed anything, so I think it's on your end, not my end. Um, well, let's, anyway. Let's, uh, 
We need to get uh, Ms. Beninato sworn in, I believe. Yes. So maybe she can repeat after you. Do you want me to just, yeah, why don't we do that, Stephanie? It will might be faster. Um, okay. If you could say, I state your name. I, I Stephanie Beninato, residing in District 2. Solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item. Solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony I have in reference to Midtown Campus development. Shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury. Shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and I affirm that under penalty of perjury. Thank you. Um, I know that you're going to rezone it and I know you're going to approve the master plan, but I really think that a lot of the detail is where we're going to get hung up on as usual in any plan that the city of Santa Fe adopts. And that is based on 47 years of history in the city and watching certain projects. Um, I'm concerned um, that, uh, first of all, we have this inclusive zoning issue, which I understand to mean is you can buy your way out of affordable housing. I appreciate my, Matt O'Reilly's stance that that should be the floor uh, and not the ceiling. Uh, that is 30%, but if you're monitoring 30% and not really assuring 30% of affordable housing, I think that could be a problem. And the city has always backed down when developers whine about the costs. I'm also concerned that there's no higher education. I mean, it was a site of higher education. I taught there for some time. Um, and I wonder about the library and whether the book collection uh, will actually come back uh, to that library. Um, and I don't think uh, 64 foot buildings really recreate the around a plaza area, which is what my understanding is the actual height of those buildings on the interior will be, that somehow that will recreate the feeling of the downtown plaza. In my humble opinion, that will not even come close because the plaza buildings are two stories high and you get to see the natural environment behind them. The 64 foot buildings around a square, what you're gonna create is a lot of shadows and a lot of wind, wind coming through. Um, and then I think that a lot of people's support is because of this community land trust. And I'd certainly like to hear a lot more about community land trust and how the city is uh, keeping this uh, really affordable. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh, and I'd like the council to give more direction about, like, is it going to be developed in a series? Uh, you know, just how that development's going to occur. Is it one big thing that's going to happen? Are you going to focus on the northeast corner or plot? Uh, uh, you know, again, a little direction to staff so that they're not, you know, swimming around for four years as they have in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Others in the Zoom room? Uh, yes, Juana. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, you need to as swear exciting as this pro can you hear me? Excuse, excuse, oh, I'm Juana. sorry. We have, sorry, we have to swear you in swear as in. part of this process. Yep. If you could uh, say I and state your full name. I, Juana Lemus, residing at 1918 Hopewell. Solemnly. Santa Fe 7505. Perfect. Thank you. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the I truth? I solemnly and swear and affirm that the testimony I have regarding this item is true. Shall be the truth and nothing but the truth. The truth and nothing but the truth. And do this under the penalties of perjury. And I do this under the penalties of perjury. Perfect. Thank you. This is how I Thanks. truly feel. Uh, Thanks. As exciting as this project sounds and the possibilities of it reaching into the future, I agree with the first woman who, who spoke in saying that there seems to be a, a movement now that we forget our past or we glamorize it. So the Christian brothers and the army and everyone that was there, I hope in some ways included in this development, that we don't forget that part of the history there. I worked at both the College of Santa Fe and at Art and Design 
So there's a lot that went on there. That that ground is haunted. So let's not let's not forget that as we make this new vision. I'm concerned about the fee in lieu of because everybody talks about affordable housing, but then when the time comes, suddenly it's not there or not as much. So when that gentleman said 30% should be the base, I agree with that. Let's hope for 30%. But my biggest concern and one I think that we should all be concerned about is that if we're going to have it be affordable and hopefully multi-generational, that there is some con there is some thought put behind accessibility for those that are mo mobily challenged. Because if you're going to have a three-story building, and this has been an issue with home ones, they offer these buildings, live workspaces, but if you have any mobility issues, you cannot access that space. So have they considered, at least in some of these buildings, having an elevator? so that people can get to the third floor, that everyone is not relegated who has mobility issues to just this one little spot, whatever it may be. So no one has talked about that or at least has not mentioned it in, this, in the meetings that I've been to. Uh, the other thing I hope stays is the mural. Bring back the turquoise on the library and save the mural. My time's up. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Miguel. Good evening. Hey, Miguel, I need to swear you in. Okay. Um, why don't we do this? I will, I will ask you and then you can confirm. State your okay. name, I, and then residing at and state your address. I, Miguel Gabaldon, residing at 2344 Las Casitas, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87507. Perfect. And I'll just ask, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. Um, as a resident of a nearby neighborhood to the College of Santa Fe campus, now the Midtown campus, I have been following this progress of the proposals um, for the development of this property since the University of Art and Design closed down. Uh, the biggest concern that we want to stress, I think, is our neighbors, my neighbors here in this area, especially those along Syringo Road, is that we continue to listen to the input from the neighborhoods adjacent to this property. Uh, it is all grand and um, marvelous to talk about the endeavors that we have at this, at this location, but we need to also remember that the quality of life of the residents who have been living here for over 60 years um, are not um, overlooked, um, are not overburdened, and are always considered as this project moves along. We have a lot of issues to address in the city of Santa Fe and to then put all of them onto a 64 acre parcel of land just because it belongs to the city and we have an opportunity to do so um, needs to be done carefully and without affecting those who have already established their lives, their families and um, their comforts of a quality of life that don't change so drastically once this project is developed. We look forward to participating with the city and future developers as far as traffic impacts, um, property value impacts and other things like that as we continue to move forward. There's a thing in Santa Fe that's very prominent. I call it, everybody calls it the NIMBY, not in my backyard. And that, ha that tends to happen a lot in District 1 or District 2. But the thing in District 4 is WIMBY, why in my backyard? Everything seems to get pushed down District 3 and District 4. So let's not forget the, neighbor, the people who are neighbors to this property as we move forward. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on this project. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else on Zoom that would like to speak to this item? Uh, you know now. how to raise your hand. Oh yes, please raise your hand if you if you would like to speak. Anyone else in the Zoom room? Naira did raise her hand just now. Give me one sec. 
Nayera, are you able to raise your hand and unmute? Nayera. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. It's about um, time. Thank you. Let me. Um, my name is Nira Hitana. I am proud and grateful to reside in Santa Fe at 996 Camino Riso 87505. Perfect. I'm going to read. Um... I'm going to read in if you can affirm. So do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this Midtown item shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? Yes, I, I, it'll be the truth. Okay, thank you. You're Go welcome. Ahead. Um, <clears throat> I have three issues. One, the masthead is not very inviting. The octopus circles do not sufficiently indicate what really is going to happen during this project. The midword is a sunken hole surrounded by gray and uh, medieval uh, architecture. So many artists in the city could be convinced to submit masthead ideas with more color and pizzazz. I'm not pleased with the Midtown designation. Yes, Virginia, there is a Midtown. It's in New York City not in the city different. In the 1920s, the distinctive architecture in Santa Fe was, by the powers that be then, designated the city different. I propose city different center, Santa Fe city center, and if all else fails, El Camino Real city center. Two, the city paid millions of dollars to the Christian brothers to acquire the property, but has anyone sat down with any of them who spent decades there and inquires if, if there's anything they may have missed or wish they added to the property? It would be an interesting conversation in any case. <clears throat> Last but not, not least, master planners themselves admit that the project will not be done next week. It will take five, 10 to 15 years to complete. There are three trucks, sorry, there are three schools which are extremely close to the project. What has been done to minimize the concrete trucks, jackhammers, demolition crews, traffic, dust, and debris in the vicinity of private homes, commercial businesses, and the three schools? The traffic issue alone is a budding nightmare. If money to make the change of the name is an issue, a project of this magnitude deserves the best possible entree into the minds and hearts of the citizens of the city different. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who else is in the Zoom room? Is there anyone else that would like to speak tonight? If you're there, could you please raise your hand if you want to speak now? I'm not seeing anyone else raise their hand. Okay. Is there anyone else in this room who hasn't spoken but would like to? If not, uh, we'll turn to the governing body where uh, we'll take questions at this time. More questions than statements or uh, positions because we will be having an opportunity for that after there's a motion on the floor. And I would encourage if we maybe we can do it in a couple rounds if each person uh, looks at the clock and takes about 10 minutes to ask their questions, uh, we would have enough time then to have a second round and or go to uh, other other statements. Announcer Mayor Worth, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so we, so I, I guess we just direct our questions and people will arrive at the podium well i think you may know who's the best uh, person uh, you're addressing it to but if not they can try to parse it okay um i guess i want to talk about affordable housing for a bit we've got alexandra ladd and other and, members. and just as a to begin uh mr hernandez the slide presentation that you provided us i don't think is in the 700 pages that 
is in our packet looks slightly different and had some interesting ways of grouping the information. I would be interested in getting that presentation and I'm imagining my colleagues would as well, if that's possible, if we could get that emailed. Not that we need really more, but you did something different, so. Uh, okay, so we the, the plan talks about 30% affordable housing. There's been lots of comment tonight um, about that should be a floor. And can you just confirm my understanding from reading the 700 pages in our packet is that that very much is what is contemplated here, that that be a floor. C can you speak to that? Mayor Weber, Councilor Romero Worth, that is true. The 30% is considered a bare minimum. Okay. And can you also speak to the fact about, um, it's my understanding that in this, in this kind of a development where we have multiple objectives, this is not Tierra Contenta where we wanted that whole parcel to be affordable homes. We have multiple objectives, including community uh, a community plan, which was sort of introduced tonight. Um, can you speak to the 30%, you know, is that high? Is it low for these kinds of things? Um, are we pushing the envelope in, in establishing a floor at that level? Mayor Weber, Councilor Romero Worth, it is considered quite high if you were to look at inclusionary zoning requirements from other communities around the country. Um, the 40% goal and achievement in Tierra Contenta was also made easier because that's greenfield development. Redevelopment and what has to happen at Midtown is a lot more complicated, um, but the other desire through this kind of urban form is to create an option for developers to build moderately priced market rate housing in addition to the deeply subsidized affordable housing or the, the sort of middle range affordable housing. Okay, and I guess, um, just lost my train of thought again. Uh, affordable housing and, oh, so we have four tracts of land that are being um, set, set aside for, how, how do you characterize it? 100% affordable housing, those four tracts in the over, arching development. So they're smaller piece of the overarching thing, four tracks for. Mayor Weber, Council, Councilor Romero Worth, that is the intention is to set aside the four tracks, um, much like we donated the land for Siler Yard, uh, much like we helped with the donation for Slayer Station. The idea is that it would be 100% subsidized, income restricted, price restricted, um, project. And is, and we've also heard talk about a, a land trust. My friend over here is hungry. Um, <laughs> Always. That's not uh, we, we've heard tonight about a land trust and, and the need for a land trust as part of the tools that we use in developing this property. Is the land trust envisioned for one of those four tracks? Mayor Weber, Councilor Romero Worth, that is the most likely scenario. Um, we think that the city's role for a land trust would be to provide the support for the actual organization and long term governance because that piece, managing the land trust, is not in the city's um, function. So, um, and then deeply subsidizing or donating the, the land would then create even more affordability on top of the, the, what a land trust does is it takes the cost of the land out of the cost of the housing. And so then if we also double, doubly take the cost of the land out of the project, you know, we can achieve some, some very significant affordability. Yeah. And I guess I should have started with uh, what a land trust is. And I don't know if you want to add to what you just said, um, be because we, 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 bant we use that term a lot, but I don't know that everybody has kind of the foundational understanding of what exactly it is and why so many people are interested in seeing that as part of this development. 
Mayor Weber, Councillor Romero Worth, I think what's important about the land trust, so in in very simply, the land trust separates the value of the land from the value of the housing. So um, we have a land trust here in Santa Fe. The Santa Fe Community Housing Trust was set up to have properties held in trust. So the eventual owner of the home or renter of the of the home does not is only paying for the cost of that home that is related to the actual building. So um, the but I think the more powerful aspect to a land trust is that it is controlled um, by the stakeholders, which are ultimately the residents um, of, of the property or other stakeholders who have a vested interest in the community control of the asset versus um, a, a different kind of corporate ownership structure. Okay, and and we are very much envisioning that that tool, I'll call it a tool, that concept, that structure will be employed on the Midtown campus. Um, that is part of the thinking. Mayor Weber, Councilor Romero Worth, that is correct. Okay. Uh, all right, I, since I only have a few minutes, I just want to move on a little bit. Uh, Eric Ani, is he here or popping in through Zoom or? Mayor and Council. And, uh, and I don't know whether, I, I want to talk about transportation. I, I don't know who else. Uh, uh, Regina Wheelers. Eric is here. He's on Zoom. Okay, so I'm not really sure who this is for, but how would you characterize what we're trying to do on, on this property with regard to multimodal transitions? Well, I mean, I'm sorry, multimodal transportation. It seems like we're being really progressive, really um, uh, modern, really up to date, really, you know, what is that? innovative, like we're, uh, or maybe bold, bold and visionary. I, I don't know. How would you characterize it? Uh, thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Romero Worth, um, Regina Wheeler, Public Works Director. I would characterize it as implementing our complete streets, our vision for complete streets, where all users of our rights of way are safe and have complete accessibility to all different forms of transportation. Really built around encouraging bicycles, uh, pedestrians, transit access, and anybody with any kind of mobility issues to be able to get around safely and efficiently. Yeah, and complete streets is a, is a term a little bit like uh, these masks are really hard to talk in. Uh, complete streets is is a little bit like land trusts, right? So um, maybe speak a little bit about complete streets as a concept and why that's so cool in today's. Hey, Regina, sorry, it's me. I should swear you in because you're providing public comment. Um, do you want me just to say it and then you say? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I state your Regina name. Wheeler, um, residing at seventeen oh six West Alameda Street. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference to this item and questions you're receiving shall be the truth and nothing but the truth, and do this under the penalties of perjury? I do. Thank you. So a little bit about complete streets, uh, Mayor um, Councilor Romero. Thank you for that question. Um, well. It, it's really cool because the governing body just adopted complete streets as our governing yep. policy for design of our streets. And what, what it means is that there's ample sidewalks that feel safe and allow side by side and families to walk down them and often are buffered from the traffic. It means ample uh, bicycle paths that often also have buffering uh, so that they feel really safe and, and separated from the traffic. Uh, it means the use of street trees and um, landscaping in the design so that there is not only drainage management that way and water capture for our stormwater management, beautification, cooling, but also um, landscaping also slows traffic down and makes people feel safer and makes them actually safer. Um, and then basically designing the street so that it minimizes speeding in other ways, narrower lanes for travel, um, the landscaping, contours, um, various things like that, that um, reduce car speeds because they naturally respond to the changing environment and slow their speed and, and keep everybody that's using the roadway safe. Thank you. And the report, and I forget, I was writing down page numbers and I can't remember which is which, I, I think around page 89, page 92, and I'm not sure if it's 
the the page of the book or the page of the packet. So sorry, talks about prioritizing other modes other than the vehicle or the automobile. Um, and so I I think that's kind of an important point, right? I mean, there there will be cars, automobiles, vehicles, but they're really we're going to be priority according to the report prioritizing other modes whether it's walking biking um other ways of getting around correct that's correct um, mayor councilor romero worth an example that you can see of that in the city right now is that um, the rail yard was actually designed with that same intent of minimizing the sort of accessibility for vehicles and maximizing the accessibility for everybody else. So you see big, gigantic walkway boulevards and very small street networks, um, and also very little parking inside of the um, area of the rail yard, which reduces sort of the incentive to bring your car down there because it becomes kind of inconvenient once you get there. Okay, thank you. And I don't know if Eric, uh, I, I did kind of call on him. I don't know if he had anything to add. Um, to what you've already said. You seem to have covered it pretty well, but just wanted to give him that opportunity if he's on. Uh, yeah, um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I just want to reiterate what Regina said. She she nailed it, just wonderfully said. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, okay. So then I guess that speaks to connectivity, and maybe this is for Mr. Hernandez, which has been said several times tonight, the importance of this con connectivity. Can we can we talk about that a little bit more in terms of, you know, the campus was a campus, right? And it was sort of in its own little bubble or silo or, you know, envelope. And now we're doing something totally different. And so I think, you know, the vehicle piece speaks to this we're going to need to figure out how to get it integrated into the area that it is. And I understand the concerns of some of the local pro property owners, you know, wondering what the city, the big bad city was going to do. Um, and so I'm glad we've worked that out, but just wondering um, what, if you just speak to connectivity a little bit about what, what you mean, again, that's another term, right. Yeah. That we banter about what, what are we caring about with that? So I, I also want to uh, make sure that you recognize that Stefan uh, Pellegrini is here, who's the urban planner, urban designer for the for the site too. So um, if if I miss something, help me out. Um, but uh, the Midtown plan was designed to think about different ways of mobility that there are ways that people would get around the site, and we are hoping that we set the precedent for the ways that uh, that connect that connections can be made to adjacent parcels and then ultimately to the broader city. So it can happen through new roadways that we hope that we can begin thinking about as part of the infrastructure uh, plan um, that would lead out to some of the larger boulevards from the center. The other ones are thinking about just soft connections as well. So uh, SFAI is here and knows that that big wall sort of separates them from the rest of the world. And just to get over there to, is, uh, is something that's really close to them is hard to get to that commercial area. So soft connections could be thinking about areas along that wall that break through to get to the site. And that could just be for pedestrians and bicycles. So the more connections that we make from a multimodal perspective is what we're trying to sort of, what we're trying to do as precedent setting inside the site. So that as people on the exterior of the site begin seeing like, oh, it's just not about cars, it's about bikes and, and pedestrians, um, that they can begin thinking of other ways to make connections to Midtown. Well, and if you're on the external part of the site and you see that there's cool stuff going on in the yeah. site, you might want to be able to move back and forth, right? Yes, yes. So, and you know, I mean, to also just build on the adjacent parcel, uh, adjacent property owners. We met with adjacent property owner this morning um, that completely interested in, in exploring ways of uh, making stronger connections to his property. So um, we know that there's going to be interest in making sure that Midtown is connected to the adjacent properties. Okay, and my time is probably up, so I just want to ask one more question, and it's it goes to stormwater and um, kind of uh, uh, how we make the area look nice and how we can really utilize and channel that stormwater in in positive ways. So 
um, there was mention, and I forget what page it was on, about rain gardens. And, and we know that we have been doing some rain gardens across the city and how important rain gardens are for capturing stormwater, for helping control stormwater. But they also are going to really help us uh, plant trees, have green spaces. Um, and I, I think back to the earlier point about how if you make it look nice and stuff, people want to slow down and admire it and stuff. And I, I don't know if, if somebody can just speak to the, the stormwater piece and, and how that works to utilizing and retaining the water in, in, in ways that are going to be have a, a, an extra benefit. Um, just I just want to emphasize that point. I'm going to ask Stefan to help, but uh, from a development perspective, um, we're, we thought of the every inch of open space as both a water retention opportunity. Um, but again, the ex experience of being in Midtown was the development perspective that I was thinking that if we're creating these great streets, how do we make them actually use the open space usable, but also part of the water retention and detention systems. But Stefan, you want to? You're going to need to swear you in. Hey, Stefan. Good evening. Stefan Pellegrini, 2100 Milvio Street, Berkeley, California. Perfect. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you have in reference uh, to Midtown and any questions related to it shall be the truth and nothing but the truth and do this under the penalties of perjury? Yes, I do. Okay. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, so just a, one comment about stormwater I wanted to make is that during the community process, we uh, heard a lot about past issues with flooding and that the Midtown campus, because it didn't have its own stormwater facilities, uh, was actually uh, uh, creating, uh, exacerbating flooding problems on neighboring uh, neighborhoods. And so it was important to sort of plan, uh, make a plan to uh, allow the site to treat and uh, its own stormwater. Um, and so that was sort of a key to sort of uh, uh, integrating that. Uh, one of the additional items about the stormwater plan is that it is uh, anticipated to be uh, built into the uh, public space framework. So streets and investments uh, in other public spaces can have a dual duty to uh, provide space for people, but also uh, treat and manage stormwater. I mean, then finally, sort of the, 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 the plus about keeping the water on the site and making it available to greenery within uh, the ground sort of has a really wonderful environmental impact and uh, uh, beneficial environmental impact uh, for the site. Um, and over time can even work to uh, provide sort of a more livable microclimate as uh, trees and other landscaping uh, can grow into the area. Right, because I, I think those are two things that I know I've worked on and the community is concerned about both how we use water making sure that we're being very efficient with what we have. And then also, you know, the need for, as the climate warms, we're gonna need trees and we're gonna need to be smarter about how we sustain those trees. So I think this use of stormwater and what, what's being proposed here will help address uh, both of those ideas. All right, one, one last thing really quick, Mayor. The US Green Building Council, can somebody speak to, that's, I think that may be the first time I heard about that. And how does that interface or guide us? Can you just tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so the, the, um, the US Green Building Council has a variety of uh, uh, certification programs for buildings, um, and in this case for the neighborhood or district scale. Um, and it proposes, um, well, first of all, it looks where the site is located and then how the site is designed so that it becomes, so that you're using the systems, like the water retention and detention systems that we just heard about. It also addresses issues around walkability. So there's a series of credits that you can get um, and, 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 and that you, if you apply their parameters to your design, then you begin to accumulate credits that qualify you to be certified as a lead um, project. Um, you'll see more of it in the community development plan um, because that's actually actually one of the exhibits in the community development plan is the checklist and all the checklists that we uh, that the the master plan complies with, but also ones that we're going to include in RFPs as either requirements or high priority. So example would be that it's not in this plan, but we're there's four credits around water uh, efficiency and water reuse. And those will be requirements and RFPs for new development that we sent out. So that's an example of how we'll continue to use that program 
uh, to uh, get the types of green buildings that we want to see in the future. So it's a little bit like a like the LEED certification that you can get when you're building buildings or exactly. as a city or whatever. Yes. Kind of sets the standards for what, what you have to achieve in order to have particular levels. Yes. Great. Thank you. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks for keeping an eye on the clock. Uh, Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you all for joining us and and providing your testimony. And those of you that have been with us through this whole process from the very beginning, I really appreciate you. And those of you listening and those of you that weren't able to be here today, um, I will save my comments and some of my like pros I love and things I didn't love. And really, I'm just going to ask some questions right now um, on some of the sections of the of the plan. And then we'll start with page 81 of our packet, which is the affordable housing section. Um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about um, the section that talks about inclusionary home ownership. And then it also talks about forms of long-term community control. And then there is a section that says developers may not opt out of the regulation by one developing in other areas outside of Midtown master plan area, two or making cash contributions according to formulas including included in the Santa Fe Homes program. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more, like translate that. What does that actually mean for um, as it relates to affordable housing? And it's page. Um, of the document, it's page 64. Mayor Weber, Councilor Villarreal, the idea here is that, um, I think it was alluded to earlier as well, that any alternate compliance on the Midtown campus has to stay, the benefit has to stay either within the campus or to benefit the surrounding neighborhoods. And it, Talks about time frames too, though. Um, of well, in particular, rental units, the city will protect affordability through deed restrictions or covenants for a fixed affordability period to be not less than thirty years. Can you can you explain how that's different from how our current rules and regs are, Mayor Robert, Councilor Villarreal? It's um, it's different in a couple ways. Right now, with uh, home ownership. Homes, the affordability control is a lien that captures the difference between the subsidized sales price and the market value, and that never goes away. So it's paid off if the home is sold or transferred, um, and then it's used to subsidize another buyer to, to buy the home. Um, or on the rental side, for most of our subsidized rental projects that are built really anywhere, um, but these days, particularly with the tax credit program, the affordability period is going to be anywhere from 35 to 45 years. I believe it's 45 years on at Siler Yard. So the city doesn't try to layer on another covenant on top of that because that's that means that the compliance for that affordability period is taken care of by the, the tax credit um, monitoring agencies. And so um, the for what we've looked at and we haven't put it into place yet because we've we haven't had any developers who have built any um, rent restricted units in a market rate project, but what we wrote in the ordinance for places outside of Midtown was that the affordability period would be 10 years for those projects. And I think with rental housing, it's a little different because even a, a fully 100% subsidized rental housing has an end to that affordability period because what it does, the affordability period restricts the value of the property, um, which is made up for using other kinds of subsidy. But over the long term, if a property owner gets to the point where, wow, this place is really falling apart and I would like to refinance it to raise some money to to um to to re, re rehabilitate it oftentimes the subsidy provider will say okay well that we'll give you more money if you will continue an affordability period um so but if they didn't have if there wasn't the end of the affordability period the value in the property would be so much less so they wouldn't actually be able to 
access the equity to to improve it and make it better and and actually keep it affordable. At some point, they just have to throw up their hands and say, "I got I got to get out because I can't maintain this property when the value continues." to be restricted over time. So that's why there's always an affordability period with affordable housing, with subsidized housing. Um, so this 30 year affordability period is three times longer than what would be a market rate project with set aside units in the rest of the city. Okay. I guess I was assuming that this is actually more um, flexible for Midtown specific, but you're saying this actually it exists throughout the city or is this specific to Midtown? Mayor Weber, Councilor Villarreal, this is specific to Midtown, this 30-year term. This is assuming that this is a non-subsidized project um, and that because all of the subsidized projects will come with their own affordability restrictions. Right. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, on, I'm sorry, I have it all based on our packet material pages, but page 84 is about universal street design. Um I'll tell you what page that is. Start. It starts on, yeah, something like that. Where, sorry, I have to move my, I can't get this mouse. Our prime grab is so frustrating. Okay, you can find it. I'm basically just going to talk about it. The universal street design, it includes sidewalks, lighting, tactile, and audible cues. And so I'm curious, that's how we packaged it. Are those the responsibilities of the developers or the city? It, I guess it just depends on the street itself, but um, we, we set a standard for the ways that streets would be designed. So we anticipate that the major streets that, that you see on the plan um, will be part of where the main infrastructure is gonna go in that the city will be building out. Um, but these design requirements will go throughout the, the site. So if you have a developer building multiple sites and there's streets within that, they would be responsible for implementing the same street design guidelines. Okay. Um, so how are we going to require that what is built still follows and flows the infrastructure design guidelines so there's continuity and consistency? Because, you know, these would be, based on piecemeal development. And I guess I just trying to envision how that works. Um, so there's continuity. This is um, Matt, Matt, Mayor, um, Councilor Villarreal, it's sort of a combination public works land use question because that's what we do every day. Um, we actually support um, private development that aligns with the neighborhood, um, with our codes, um, with the existing flow of traffic, the existing uh, trail networks, um, parks networks. And so that, that's part of our process now um, in making sure that private development fits uh, and it's developed appropriately for where it's being developed. Mayor, Councilor Villarreal, um, once again, Regina hit it on the head. And um, it is a responsibility that staff takes seriously in terms of thinking of the community and our role in implementing chapter 14 and you know the general plan for that matter. And so um, we do get feedback from all the different agencies, life safety, from traffic and so on. And we have um, intentional dialogues with the applicants. And so this is going to be our guidebook for that. Thank you. Um, parking was a big piece of this. Um, it's on the packet materials, like 92 and 103, but it's talking about um, how the public and private sector will be responsible for parking, um, particularly the construction and the ma maintenance of parking and the structures. And you referenced a parking demand management strategy. Um, and I, I'm curious, do we have something like that now? And how, if we do, how is that integrated into a new development like this? Um, thank you for that question, Mayor, uh, Council Bria Real. Um, we do sort of have a demand um, management strategy now. What we do is we um, limit the amount of time that people can park in spaces in different areas so that it creates the turnover that's needed to support the business in the, in the area or the, you know, whatever the access is that people are trying to get. So we have two hour time limits downtown get a little further out of town, out of the downtown, it's four hours. 
Um, we do it well. So with pricing, the, you know, the first hour is only a dollar that might incentivize you to get out of that space and let somebody else have it. So we have a little bit of that. You can get more um, complex with the with that type of um, strategy. You can have time of day pricing um, that can diff help you manage your parking. So I think those are there's you know there's a lot of um, levels of sophistication we can go to. We've kind of chosen not to do that um, at, at until now. I think at the city of Santa Fe, so that as people adapt to even just having to pay for parking. Um, so I the demand management. That's the answer to that question. There are different uh, strategies that you can use. Okay. Um, and then as far as private and public development, of course, there would be a roadside parking in some places. If we're developing a major a roadway, we might um, develop parking in that area. But I think one of the visions is, is for a parking garage that's privately developed and, and operated. Um, I think we think that could be a winning strategy for both supporting parking as well as having a really successful parking garage that um, you know is economically stable and gives really good services to the public. So I think we were looking at that combination. Thank you. And I'm assuming that's later on in phases because I wouldn't think that we'd start doing paid parking when we're in these beginning phases. That's just a guess. <laughs> okay. And then um, I see your head saying yes. Okay. And um, and then I guess just as a comment that we would build upon our lessons learned, you know, with our parking structures downtown and what has worked and what hasn't worked. So, um, so moving on to civic spaces and plazas and parks, you define these areas where um, where they will be located on your conceptual maps. Does that mean that these are fixed spots where these amenities will occur or be located? Or how will they be negotiated if another design um, for a building is proposed differently than maybe what you were envisioning? Uh, thank you, Mayor Weber, uh, Council Member Villarreal. Um, the, the regulatory framework and the plan provides some flexibility with where those civic spaces end up, but they're supposed to remain close to where they are sort of located. And so the idea is if a parcel or future parcel of land was made available to a developer and a civic space was actually noted on the plan, that the expectation would be that would be incorporated into their development um, uh, as uh, using the minimum design parameters and dimensions that are described. Um, but there's also the expectation that there can be some flexibility uh, with the outcome, and that will be up to uh, land use to sort of help uh, ne negotiate that that outcome that aligns with the plan. Okay, thank you. And is there a minimum percentage that they'd be required to build, required or related to the civic spaces? Uh, the, it really depends on the disposition of the properties and sort of the way that the site is parcelized and developed. Um, I will say that there is there is a open space requirement that's tied to new development, which intends to provide common open space. And that is a sort of different form of civic space. It's shared space to be used um, in the way that shared spaces in Santa Fe are used in courtyards and sort of other spaces. And that is above and beyond the civic spaces that are denoted on the plan. Is that the 25% that we that's correct. Right, 25%. Okay. Um, as it relates to frontages, there was a big section on frontages. Um, and because I still think about things being developed piecemeal, how do we keep frontages consistent since we will have piecemeal development occur? So the way, that's a great question. And so what the plan is trying to do is sort of balance some degree of predictability and consistency with flexibility and the ability to provide a series of choices that developers can pick from. So uh, the uh, different sort of subzones of the site, they each have a set of allowed frontages. And then the expectation is that developers will need to pick at least one of those frontages when they're designing their building. And it, could be that they are developing a small parcel where that can be met with just one frontage. 
um, it could be that they actually might be developing several buildings um, in one uh, sweep, and then they actually might be introducing uh, more frontages to that. Um, but this, the, the choice of the frontages also aligns with the expectations for what's happening in different areas of the plan. Um, Daniel mentioned earlier that at the core, around the plaza, there's the expectation that there's ground floor retail. So the plan basically provides guidance or frontages that are compatible with ground floor storefronts and retail activity. And some of the other portions of the plan where um, residential addresses are expected, then uh, the developer can choose from a suite of compatible residential frontages when they're uh, designing their development. Thank you. Um, I know we touched upon stormwater management, and I was actually impressed by this section. It addresses proactive stormwater management. Um, and I'm curious if you could explain how this is different than what our current standards are. Um, and I guess I, I'm just wanting, I think it is maybe because it's taking a different approach. It might not, because I thought it was beyond looking at just 100 year storm events, which is what we do now. And I think that's unrealistic given climate change. So I, the way I read it, maybe I read it wrong. Is there something different that we're looking at? I know you mentioned some of them um, with the question about I mean, you mentioned three different things. I don't know if this is different from what we do now, but it's built into the public space framework. I don't think we do that now as much. Yeah, I, I, um, I can try to speak broadly to that, uh, which is that there is an intent to take water that falls onto the site and slow it down and sort of keep it within the local ecosystem uh, to the greater extent that they actually can provide a benefit and um, um, establish a basis for local irrigation and, and sort of new plants that can uh, be created in public spaces. Um, and that's sort of an important component also to sort of enhance the habitat and the ecosystem that's there, um, but also to sort of mitigate some of these issues that were due to runoff um, uh, that um, have have happened just due to the fact that the site is largely hardscape uh, today. Um, and so those are sort of real different approaches. Um, the last thing I'll say that there are is there are some pretty, there are large stormwater amenities at the perimeter of the site uh, that are already in place. There's one in general, Franklin Miles Park. Uh, there are additional stormwater retention facilities at the southern end of the site. Um, and this provides an opportunity to sort of connect to those and send the stormwater where naturally the flow should send it, as opposed to across streets and uh, across other areas. Uh, and that can be another benefit of uh, the stormwater plan. Mayor Weber and um, Councilor Villarreal, I'd like to add a little bit to that. Even just in the four and a half years that I've been here, we've changed our strategy around the whole entire city as we work with stormwater to be more like this plan talks about in the old days, you paved a concrete channel and you got the water out of there, right? And then, and then when the water got really big, it tore up the channel. And you know, so we've we've learned a lot, I think, over the years. And just in the last, you know, four years ago, we shifted to really trying to slow it down, use it on site, use infiltration to clean the water, um, and capture it a little bit. So yeah, it's definitely different from how it used to be. And and we're doing this around the city more and more. Great, thank you. Um, and then last, the two points I'm making, their comments and, and um, suggestions. Um, there's various sections of the plan that reference acequias. And we don't have acequias there. At least I'm not, I don't know if we have an, an actual historic acequia. When I say acequia, I'm talking about irrigation canals. I'm not talking about arroyos, although sometimes they serve that same purpose. Um, so we reference the sequias throughout the plan. And so I think it's misused in this context because the Noroyo is different and the sequia actually is used for irrigation. And other than potentially using this for um, community gardens, we don't have a sequia there. And I don't think we're gonna be creating a sequia because it requires a, a actually form of governance. So I think we need to change that whether it's a waterway, you can use arroyos, um, 
because and acequias are not aesthetics. They're not just about aesthetics. There was a section on page 187 of the plan that was talking about how acequias would be used, but it wasn't for irrigation purposes. And it sounded like it was more aesthetics. So I would suggest that you make the distinction in the document because the sequias are very specific to New Mexico, even though something may have a form that's like a sequias, um, it's very specific in our local context. Um, the other thing is there's a site history section at the beginning of the plan. I think it's on page 44 and I think it needs strengthening. Um, I suggest that you add what was stated in the staff report. That was actually very thorough and it's not, it doesn't match what was in the plan. Um, and as most of you know, I detest seeing histor history minimized in our documents and city documents and our planning documents. So I'm requesting that we tighten up that section, we beef it up, and we also make sure that the Pueblo history se sentence section is accurate. Because right now the way it reads does not sound, um, based on the source you cited, I don't know if that's the best source to cite. So I, I'd i suggest that we re write that and not rewrite it because you already have it part part of it in the staff report. But I'd like to see it um, when you do revise it because I think that's important. It sets context for this area. And as folks said in the audience history, we do need to understand the history and its significance because then we learn from it. Um, and then it informs us as we move forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Chavez. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. And I want to thank Councillor Murrow Worth for um, asking almost all of my questions. Um, and thank you to the staff for answering them. And I really debated about asking for this clarification, but I think it's important, especially from constituent feedback and community involved um, community feedback. Um, we have what I've really admired about this whole process has been the investment of community, the voice and um, the way that we've really worked hard to engage and collaborate with partners. It's been something I've admired. Everyone knows that I'm a huge community advocate. I feel like that's how as leaders we best serve is we allow them to guide our direction. But I also have felt anxiety that now that things are rolling, that that's gonna be lost. So I wanted to just start by asking how you know, we almost introduced the um, community development plan, but how are these two plans going to work together so that we keep this a community focused project? So if you could answer that first, and then I have a follow up. Well, initially, um, the R again, the RFPs that we issue out, um, it talks about in the community development plan that there will be a requirement for some level of community engagement for individual projects. So there will be ongoing community engagement uh, throughout the development of parcels in on the site. There's also discussions about the Metropolitan Redevelopment Authority and participation on in that realm as well um, of having community members have certain particular expertise in community development or real estate development or other things that we want to see. Make sure that they have a wide perspective, but an entrepreneurial perspective uh, on real estate uh, development. So. Uh, we're, those are two ways that we will continue to have community engagement. And so, and I know a lot of the community partners, I've had the honor of working with them personally, and they truly, they, they know how to capture the voice of our community better than any of us as city staff or um, developers will be able to capture community voice. So I just wanted to understand how we are going to keep the level of involvement up with those specific community partners that have already been proven to be successful and truly bringing the community in, a community, a big chunk of that community that's been underrepresented for a very long time. Um, how are we going to continue involving them so that momentum isn't lost through this process? I, I missed one other opportunity as well. There was a a, 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 a lot of meetings that we had, and one and a lot of notes taken. Um, the level of the opportunity to participate in the review of RFPs as well. So the initial RFPs that are actually going out this week, um, there's a section in there that tells the respondent to the RFP that there will be community members on the evaluation committee 
Um, so that's another way that we'll have ongoing community engagement, interaction, knowledge in the evaluation process of RFPs that we send out. And then if I can, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Councillor Chavez, uh, members of the governing body, we're also completely open to and have engaged in just additional uh, uh, events with our partners. So for instance, we've had two Saturday events with Chainbreaker where they invited us to come in. You know, they said, hey, would a couple of you guys from the city be willing to come in and explain the plan and uh, explain the community development plan was the last one we did. Um, so you, you heard a, a few of them, you know, mention Alex and I, uh, because we did do those events. Um, and we are already talking with Chainbreaker about making that perhaps even like a bi-monthly or quarterly type of thing where we go in and explain specific elements of the plan or of the code or just update them on what's going on. Um, we're already talking about doing one that's very specific to affordable housing, you know, because we're often asked, how come we can't say how much these units are going to cost? It's like, well, because it depends on all these factors. So we're already kind of dreaming one up where Alexandra kind of gives some real examples that were built in Santa Fe. And, you know, here's what the price ended up and here's the mechanism they got there. So we are very open to continuing these uh, column educational type events like that with any of our partners and the public at large. I love that. I've been, in regards to development, I've been having conversations with some community partners and how we really need to educate and understand. Like I know coming in to the planning commission, I was just blown away with the concept of all the components and factors that we have to consider and making sure that we're allowing access to housing for the community, but that we're able to actually find developers that are still willing to develop in order to do that. It's just, it's a, it's something that takes very um, detailed orchestrating and I would love our community to understand that more. So that's very exciting. I want to just end by thanking the collaboration and the relationship that has been built with the city staff involved in this project and our community partners that have really put in the groundwork and reaching out the most, the most um, going to the community, right? We always say we reach out, we send emails, we, you know, have social media, we have websites, we, you know, invite, but I know these community partners and how you work and actually knocking on doors and going to the community to draw them in. And so I just wanna end by thanking you all for being that beautiful example of what a government agency and collaboration with the community can look like when done right. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lee Garcia, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, appreciate the presentation and thank you all for being here. I. Um, I think, uh, first off, I just kind of want to start off with um, a question, and I guess maybe Mr. Hernandez, uh, um, maybe most be, be most familiar with this. So 64 acres, um, how many buildings more or less are, are kind of being uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. looked at for this one site? We, we did it mostly on acres. square footage. Um, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, we did it, we did commercial square footage, right? Not necessarily a number of buildings. Right. Um, and I would have to pull up my presentation again because I don't have them by memory. But we looked at different types that people wanted to see at the site. So an office building, restaurant retail, um, hospitality, the expansion of the film. So we don't know how many buildings, for example, when the film, uh, when we get responses from the RV for the film expansion, we're not sure how many buildings are going to propose on it, but we did square footage. Okay. And 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 I can I I don't have it. Oh, there it is. So retail restaurant about forty four thousand square feet. Institutional meaning it could be educational. Um, uh, one hundred twenty eight thousand square feet. Office a hundred thousand. Hospitality we estimated just about a hundred rooms, uh, and then the film expansion. Um, we weren't sure, but we did it just by acres there. We said the ten point four six acres that we're going to issue the RFP. Thank you. Uh, and so, I mean, just kind of visualizing uh, the amount of building square footage, uh, trying to achieve the um, the amount of 
uh, housing that we're trying to get out of this property as well. Uh, 64 acres seems to be a, an enormous amount of property, but um, uh, I guess where I'm leading with this, we're we're um, we're shooting for a 30 percent uh, uh, goal for affordability, and I think it again, I my opinion, it should be much higher. Um, how do we have the amenities um, that are going to be needed to sustain the people that will be living in this area, and and where do we find a good balance for that? Because uh, you know, we we heard from um, Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, um, the Green Chamber of Commerce, and and so on and so forth. And um, obviously, there's going to be a huge need for uh, re restaurants, shopping opportunities for food, uh, and so on and so forth. And what does that look like? Yeah. So we're again, we're predicting anywhere between 950 to 1100 units. It'll be somewhere among that. And we establish a baseline at 30 percent. City uh, a governing body can decide they want to see more in future years. But again, what we wanted to do is just establish the baseline. It's not going to ever go below that. It will be 30 percent and it could go higher based on decisions that, um, that, that policymakers uh, would determine and direct staff. Um, the amenities we thought of more as smaller retail, commercial, neighborhood serving spaces, because it's, again, you know, it's surrounded by fairly large uh, commercial areas. So we, we didn't want to try to absorb and take away from the existing commercial. In fact, we felt like if we're building new residential and office and all this commercial space, that there's more of a marketplace for them to tap. So we believe, and it would, I'm sure it's going to happen, that as, as they begin to see Midtown built out, they're gonna to wanna to be a part of that growth as well. So rather than building a new grocery store, for example, within Midtown, why not link them to an existing grocery store um, that's off Cerrillos? So we thought of this compatible relationship that, and that's why the connection question is so important to connect people who are gonna be working and living there to that surrounding neighborhood. Thank you, and I think it's very important that 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 is definitely um, worked uh, worked on in order to have connectivity to the surrounding neighborhoods, and and for sure the amenities, the the supermarkets, and so on and so forth. Um, I guess that would lead me to a, a next next the next concern of mine, which is um, with this development. Uh, how does public safety um, connect to this? Because obviously now we're going to have to have another, you know, so many more people, police officers, fire department. Uh, is is the amount of once this is developed out, are are we going to be in the need for another fire station, another police substation, maybe within the property, and so on? Has that been kind of looked at? Yes, that would be. Uh, Councillor uh, Garcia, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the governing body, we did early on in this process talk to. Um, we did early on in this process run this by uh, the police department and fire department, uh, basically all the city agencies that would need to provide service there, and they indicated that. Uh, at the level we're talking about, uh, you know, a number of heads, number of uh, new buildings of various types that the existing stations and services around can accommodate it. Um, I think that so we're in good shape there. It's not necessarily going to call for a new substation right now, but I think what the governing body and the city will need to keep in mind moving forward is uh, as the link overall up and down, you know, St. Michael's is catalyzed and we should be thinking about it redeveloping too uh, in its own right. You know, at that point, uh, maybe those things will be required, but we were uh, given assurance that the current fire and police could handle uh, the head count, call it here in Midtown. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I, I, I would think that uh, once this is completely um, built out, uh, that we probably are going to be looking at the increase. But I mean, it's just my own common sense thought process. Um, I guess one of the other just major concerns that I have is that um, I, the collaboration with neighbors as the process goes forward. Um, and uh, 
it's great to have this plan, this conceptual plan, but um, as we move forward, can, I don't know who, maybe Ms. Lamboy, um, explain to, to me the process of the ENNs or the community outreach that will happen as, as the certain, as certain phases start being built out and uh, what's that gonna look like for um, the business districts that are connected, um, the public schools. Um, Santa Fe Public Schools has, uh, I think three properties that are near this and um, how is the increase in population gonna affect them? I mean, there's, there's a lot of foresight that needs to be really thought out. Uh, and my guess is, uh, I guess I would like to understand more of how the processes will be um, through either ENNs or community outreach for those neighbors as, as this develops. Mayor Weber, Councilmember Garcia, with reference to the ENN process, that place that remains in place. So we will have engagement with um, homeowner associations as well as uh, property owners within the vicinity for all specific development projects. But as I mentioned in my presentation, there's also the opportunity for the citizen advisory group as part of the request for proposals for these individual uh, parcels of land. Remember, the city owns the land, and so we have the ability to say what we want there um, and what how it's going to implement the vision of the master plan. So, and then just one other quick comment uh, with reference to public safety. Um, I know one of the reasons that there's been a lot of issues on the campus to date um, is because of a vacant campus and not people not being around. Once we get more people living on the campus and working on the Midtown site, then um, there's more eyes on the street as well. Sorry, there's more more people, more people living there. Um, they take care of each other, and so um, I, I can see that uh, um, that concept. Um, I, th I think that's about all the questions that I have for right now, and I'll go ahead and yield the floor if anybody else. Has. Thank you, um, Councilor Garcia. You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think. Uh, Good thing going later is a lot of the questions I had were asked by my colleagues. So, so thank you all for your your great questions. Um, there were a couple that I guess I would like further clarification on regarding uh, affordable housing. Um, it was mentioned that there would be some type of monitoring component to ensure that the baseline of thirty percent is met. Can that be clarified for me a bit? What that looks like, process, procedure, et cetera. Councilor Garcia, um, generally the way this is done, we would follow a similar model to the TR Contento model, which is that with each disposition, and this is TR Contento was done obviously by a nonprofit, but um, the the affordability could vary by disposition. But what they would do is then track if one parcel was slightly lower than the 30%, then the next parcel needs to be more than 30% and just continually visit to ensure that that percentage is being, is being met. Um, what the, the leverage we have as the landowner is that we don't transfer the land if the project isn't demonstrating that it's going to achieve the affordability that the city requires for that specific parcel. Um, and, it, you know, we have several tools in our tool belt for inclusionary zoning. We hold, we can withhold permits. We can, we can do all sorts of things when something isn't in compliance. I mean, generally we don't have to, I mean, generally it, it's a very clear cut process for the most part, but but we can we can take those measures if we need to. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And can you remind me again what are the current requirements, whether it's for uh, permanent housing or rental housing? What are the uh, requirements for affordable housing unit development? Councilor Garcia, do you mean by percentage? Yes, by percentage. Right. 
Uh, for home ownership housing, it's 20%, and those homes are priced according to three different income tiers. So there's a very affordable, a, a middle affordable, and then a, a um, I don't want to say a less affordable, but I guess it's a higher priced range. Um, for on the on the rental side, you know, we have two models, which is the 100% subsidized model, where the subsidy is coming generally from um, a, a different funding source, and then the city is supporting that either through a land donation, through fee waivers, and sometimes through direct cash. And that's um, that's proven to be very helpful because we're able to kind of plug our resources in to fill the gaps, the the gaps in the um, financing. For those projects because they tend to be quite complicated and then um, on the uh, market rate rental side with the set aside units as i said before you know we're just we just have our first two coming online um and those rents are set to be affordable for the renter earning 80 percent of the area median income so it's a it's a workforce rental level um, because we know that the needs of very low income renters aren't met very well in that setting, they really need more support services and, and more community and more um, uh, just uh, under, understanding and where they're living and, and helping with other social services needs. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Land. But so 20% for home ownership, but I didn't get the percentage for each, each of those other models. Can you Oh, uh, Councilman Garcia, sorry about that. The the subsidized model is 100% always. Okay. Um, I mean, occasionally we have had a couple of tax credit projects that had a very small number of market rate units, but they were be they were well well below market, but they weren't restricted by the incomes of the people living there. But it was like five percent of the total units, and that was in response to the priority that was set for that year for the funding priority. But that has not been in place for a while. Um, and then for the Inclusionary units, so these are the units built by a market rate developer, it's a 15%. Okay, and so this is what we're proposing that each developer or potential purchaser for permanent housing, 20% would be bumped up to 30, market rate 15% doubled to 30. But with the caveat, there still is that opportunity for them to pay the fee in lieu of Mayor Weber, Councillor Garcia, we don't really know what our, you know, because we own the land and we'll be controlling the dispositions through the RFPs, um, and, and we're doing this as we've talked about many times, not all at once tomorrow, um, we're going to have much like the tier contenta model where it can fluctuate by the disposition. So there are going to be certain aspects that are going to favor more affordability and certain aspects that where we may have another community benefit that we would like to achieve on that parcel. And so that may be where that comes into play, where we would allow a market rate developer, for instance, to build the community plaza on that parcel in lieu of providing units on site or providing the full 50, full 30% on site. And then the next project would be maybe they would also do low price dwelling units. So it would go over the 30% requirement. So it's it's not it's sort of not a zero sum game. It's going to be, you know, this is going to be a living process and it's going to be evolving over time. Understandable. Thank you for that clarification. And I guess my follow up to that is to ensure that the 30% is met and I guess I just want to give a potential example and and this uh, clarify if I'm wrong in the understanding is that for the first developer, we're going to say 30% minimum affordable housing. But there's that option for fee in lieu of, which then if that developer chooses to pay the fee in lieu of, that 30%, that requirement doesn't go away. That means somebody else down the line is going to have to pick up that slack. And, and I think that's what concerns me about this model is that by not ensuring that it's done on the front end, that this baseline can be pushed all the way down to the end of the road. And um, I think that leaves the the giant bag for the last person developing to ensure that this 30% is met, that we're, we're the threshold we're meeting. And so I think that 
the public needs to be well aware of this model in regards to if somebody opts out, that doesn't mean it goes away because somebody else has to develop that, whether it's private or city from my understanding. And I think that is, it, it can lead to, if it, the city is the last property owner and we said we're going to develop 30%, then the city is going to require to develop that 30%, meet that threshold, which ultimately means the taxpayers are going to be shelling out for that versus us implementing the process where the units are available as units are developed. So I, I, I'm very concerned with that proposed model. Um, with, Mayor Weber, Councilor yeah. Garcia, I just want to clarify one thing. Sure, sure. Um, right now under our rules, the only option to pay a fee in lieu of by right is for rental housing. So you're never going to have a home ownership project. They don't have that option unless they come to the governing body and they get approval of an alternate compliance. Um, we have fully intended that the first disposition will be 100% affordable because exactly to your point, we want to make sure, and this is a little bit what happened in Tierra Contenta. Um, Mr. O'Reilly spoke about the 45% achievement because the very early phases were predominantly affordable. So they had, um, over time, it, it came out to closer to 40%, but the very early phases were, were highly affordable. So that's how we anticipate beginning the development. Um, and, and I have to, you know, I have to tell you that that is a much more financially feasible model to do 100% subsidized to get to the affordables rather than trying to do the market rate inclusion for rental. Homeownership works in a completely different way. And we have a lot of success in this community with that being a viable business model without requiring a bunch of extra subsidies. So, you know, we're looking to lead off with that 100% affordable. Um, so to to address that concern. Thank you. And, I, and I'm glad to hear that because I, that's one thing that I've been hearing for years from the community is with this space, there needs to be home ownership opportunity. So th thank you for clarifying that there is going to be those opportunities. I guess this may be a question for Daniel. Out of the proposed 1,100, 900 to 1,100 units, how many of those are proposed to be market rate rental? Uh, well, wait, ask the question again, I'm sorry. So so out of your, your maximum 900 to 1,100 units, how many of those are proposed to be market rate rental units? Well, if 30% of them are going to be uh, affordables, that leaves 70% to be market rate. Yeah, so, so with that being said, there is the option for at minimum 15% of those units, seven, out of those 700, we would hope, I mean, my, my hopes are that a developer would not opt in for the fee in lieu of and develop the units. But with that being said, there are there is the option that 15% of that won't be available because of the fee in lieu of. No, the 30% the includes the, it, so in the community development plan, it, there's a there's a footnote that sort of uh, identifies which units are being generated out of inclusionary, homeownership, rental, and land trust. And so that 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 formula is what we'll be working with and around, but the 70% is market rate, the 30% includes the inclusionary number itself. Does that make sense? No, it, it doesn't. I'm trying to, so... And I, and I guess I got the 15% wrong because based off of prior answers, it was 30%. So 30 from, from, and if you can help me understand how out of the proposed 70% or roughly 700 units, that would be market. And we're going to be asking 30%. So just doing quick math. Uh, I mean, that, that is hundreds. I, I think you have the calculator. Um... 70 so 700 units will be market rate that 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 is generated from the market rate inclusionary projects um that 700 is will be market rate out of the inclusionary program some of those units will be part of that 30 percent calculation so the 30 percent calculations that is generated from inclusionary 
home ownership rental land trust. Okay. I guess I think I'm just I'm, I'm having a hard time to figure out how what I want to figure out at the end of the day how many units will not be available if a developer opts to not that it will always be the 3070 relationship that won't change if a developer opts out we'll still be looking for op other opportunities to reach that 30% so, so what if every developer opts out? It, that won't happen. We won't allow that to happen because we're 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 we have the art, we have land we control. Okay. So if we need to, you know, right now we've identified four because it gets us to that 30% parcels. We may need to go five, but we'll always have that flexibility, or we'll issue an RFP and say we want you to exceed the inclusionary requirements here um, and ask for more percentage in that project. So we'll always be balancing out as the development occurs over the site. I guess that then gets to my understanding of the process. So as we move down the process, we will issue RFPs that will say, because we haven't met this threshold of 30%, we're gonna, we have to issue an RFP that says, you've got to cover this much. Mm -hmm. And if folks apply for it, great. If they don't, then what happens? We because I mean I, they I guess, will I mean we will we won't dispose of the land until we continue to sort of manage that thirty percent, and it's not any it's not a it's not difficult. <laughs> I mean that what the way that we you'll if you look at the community development plan you'll see the number of units that are generated from these different that strata of inclusionary home ownership rental land trust. It's not difficult to achieve that. I mean we will achieve it. Um, and it's easy to monitor as well. You know how many units are building by each uh, disposition, and you know what percentage of units in that disposition are, are affordable. You'll continue to monitor it and make sure that you're not far off from that 30%. Right. Okay. I guess I'll just have to uh, trust the process, so to speak. It's a familiar one, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. Earlier, it was stated that uh, thirty percent is usually a that, that's a higher than above normal for affordable housing. Um, um, Mayor Robert, Councilor Garcia, let me let me clarify that comment for inclusionary zoning programs. So, right. inclusionary zoning is where we're asking the development community to offset, just like we ask them to pay impact fees. We're asking them to offset the economic impacts of their development by providing affordably pr price restricted units because the market rate development creates a need for the price restricted units it's not we're not asking them to solve all of the affordability problems in the entire community we're asking them to offset what their development is is causing so that's inclusionary um you know af that's that's very different than affordable housing generally is 100% affordable or 50% affordable it's it's a much higher level because it's built by mostly by nonprofits or by developers who specialize in those subsidy sources and therefore don't have debt on the property then they can restrict their prices because they don't have to worry about paying paying debt service okay thank you for clarifying that i appreciate that and and maybe uh, miss lad uh, just to follow up to that, is that hold true? Or is that usually private uh, property or how does that pertain to publicly owned property? Because as it was stated earlier, because this is city property, we can control it and we have a lot more flexibility with this. So um, I think with that being said, my question is, is that 30% pertain to private versus public such as we're dealing with now? property ownership. Mayor Weber, Councillor Garcia, I think your question is the for inclusionary zoning generally it will apply to privately owned land. So a developer buys parcel they want to develop, the regulation is applied to their parcel. So the 30% in that scenario is high. Right. We do 20% for home ownership and 15% for rental, which is much more in line with with other inclusionary programs because we used to be at 30% and it just we couldn't recover our building community did not recover from the recession at all and so that that was a reset to be a little bit more realistic. 
Um, but in this case, with publicly owned land, we can leverage greater affordability because we have the, the value of the land to play with. So we can, and we have other incentives that we can provide to a landowner, such as reduced development costs and fee waivers and cost of water and, and those kinds of things. Okay, thank you for that clarification. It's really helpful. Um, I guess my last question is because it was brought up earlier was talking about the RFPs that will be are proposed to be released later on this week. Um, and I don't know if Mr. Hernandez, who's leading the process for that, I guess this RFP question. Okay. In the RFP, is it stated that the city is offering to sell the property? No, it, it just says that the city is um, uh, interested in developers uh, to redevelop and operate and that they can provide the disposition strategy for uh, the city's consideration. Um, it doesn't prioritize sale or lease. It just says for city's consideration and for the city to determine the best proposal that will benefit the project and the city. Okay, thank you. And the, and my, the reason I ask is because um, what I've heard from folks prior to this whole process beginning, even prior to me being a counselor, was uh, the 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 want from the community was that the city do its best to maintain ownership of the property. I mean, I think it was even in the video that the, it said we we should maintain ownership of this, and um, I, I think. Uh, as it was noted that uh, the rail yard just celebrating its 25th anniversary, it shows how successful when how uh, development can occur, even when the city owns the property, whether it's development of retail that's occurred there or development of housing, which has occurred in the rail yard. Um, I don't think we need to solely be looking at this process through the lens of disposition and sale of property. We should look at it through multiple lenses, whether it's dis disposition and sale or a hybrid of disposition and sale and, or lease or solely lease, um, I think, or land trust. I, I, I think these are requests that this the community members have been asking of their property. And for us to move forward with one perspective is not a benefit to the community. So I appreciate that it, the RFP is not moving forward in that direction. So um, I, I do appreciate all the time effort. I mean, I, I, this has been a heavy lift for you and your team, Mr. Hendes, Mr. Longston, everybody else involved in this, Mr. Brown in the back. I, um, what have we been at this? In the, I mean, since since I began, I mean, uh, almost three years. So uh, th thank you. Um, uh, I, I think I'll have comments after. This is question portion. I'll have comments after this, but... Uh, that's all the questions I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cassett. So much, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for a lot of wonderful questions. I just I just have a few follow-ups. I do want to follow up on one of the questions that came from um, a public speaker about the link and the fee and lieu staying within the link. And um, Alexander, maybe you can best speak to that about how that could actually um, how that might be able to be leveraged at Midtown um, with the fee and lose staying in the link. Mayor Robert, Councillor Cassett, when the link was put into place, um, we decided that we wanted to ensure that any any fees coming out of that redevelopment would, would benefit either the redevelopment itself to um, deepen affordability or help the surrounding neighborhoods uh, to help prevent displacement and and serve some of the underserved neighborhoods around that area. Um, and so that's written into the affordable housing trust fund section of our code that any fees in lieu of in that area in the link district stay within the link. Okay. So I'm thinking a little bit about, you know, some of the discussions that we'll be having specifically around the neighborhood stabilization plan. Does that mean that you know, as I'm I'm thinking about a lot of the concerns that my constituents have had around uh, displacement due to Midtown. And so it, does that component that if there are fees and lose that are generated through Midtown development, 
that I, I think the primary way that we usually do, you know, displacement prevention would be, you know, the grants for home repairs. And is there anything else that I'm missing that 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 actually might be um, beneficial to prevent displacement in the surrounding neighborhoods? Mayor Weber, Councillor Cassett, displacement begins with disinvestment. So there is a broader viewpoint to um, just home repair. That's a, that's important. But we would look at at particularly if we go the metropolitan redevelopment route. Um, really, a lot of infrastructure and amenity of improvements as well. They kind of go hand in hand. Um, but then there are a, a, a lot of other strategies and. Daniel might be able to speak to some of the strategies that he's seen in much bigger cities because we, we haven't done it deliberately specifically here, but, but we certainly would, would have the capacity to develop a very strategic plan working in partnership with Chainbreaker, um, which their, their group came up with this idea of the, the, um, I am tired. What's the word? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the overlay district that looks specifically at um, prevention of displacement and protecting current residents. But I don't know, Daniel, did you have any other? I, I think the only one is, you know, production. Um, I mean, we're gonna be producing affordable housing at, at Midtown. The other one is uh, production and looking at stabilizing existing housing in adjacent neighborhoods that are experiencing transition and displacement. Um, so part of the strategy of thinking about a, how the, the land trust is how that app, that, uh, that framework might be applied to a neighborhood like Hopewell Man. Um, and I know that there's a lot of interest in, so we just have to figure out how to deploy that interest into an actual structure, uh, for development and ownership. Um, the other thing is, and we'll can talk about more at the community development plans is that, uh, in there, there's a commitment to, uh, to develop a neighborhood stabilization plan and to create that neighborhood stabilization plan, similar to the way that we did the public engagement so that we're supporting the efforts of community organizations to participate with a planning company or planning firm that has expertise in anti-displacement and neighborhood stabilization strategies. So that's in the community development plan is one of the commitments that we're making. Right. Okay. So that, that conversation to come probably yeah. more relevant in the coming weeks than, than tonight. So I'll, I'll jump off for now. Um, so I wanted to, to understand a little bit more this discussion around urban form versus architectural design standards. And um, Stefan, I'm looking at you. I'm feeling like this, this might be your arena. So if you could please um, elaborate a little bit more on that and how that really then translates on the ground into what we can expect uh, Midtown to visually look like. And, and the reason I bring this up is because my district is, is you know, one that, that has seen a lot of development. Um, and a lot of my constituents will say, this doesn't look like Santa Fe. It does not have a sense of place anymore. Um, this looks like it could have been built anywhere. And uh, feeling as, as to one of my constituents said, you know, the why in my backyard <laughs> type of, um, a viewpoint. So I, I was hoping you could speak to that a, a little bit more in some more detail. Thank you, May Weber, uh, Councillor Cassett. Um, the plan sort of directs the regulations and the guidance for architectural form on the urban design elements that are characteristic of Santa Fe. And it is it's silent on um, more aesthetic issues of architectural style. And I know it's late in the evening, but the way I like to think about this is using the Mr. Potato Head analogy. Is that all right? We all love Mr. Potato Head. So, uh, Mr. Potato Head is you can think about Mr. Potato Head as the sort of the urban form. But the things that you put on Mr. Potato Head are the things that are guiding the architectural style, the stylistic outcome. And so, what we're trying to do is pay attention to the elements that are characteristic of Santa Fe, but allow for a greater diversity of architectural expression. So one way to sort of think about this, I think, is that on the campus today, there are mid-century modern buildings, which are distinctly Santa Fe, but they are very different from what we see in Old Town. There is a postmodern interpretation of that in the Legoretta buildings, which are, we wouldn't do either one of those today, but we want to think about how we can give the design community 
an opportunity to elaborate on what Santa Fe style is. So that's what we're, we're trying to sort of direct uh, that attention. Um, the urbanistic qualities are really paying attention to the things that make a sort of walkable place possible. So that means a lot of frequency of entrances, a lot of interest at the ground floor of buildings, uh, buildings that are scaled so that you can kind of take them in visually uh, without needing to strain your neck or feel like you sort of are in places where buildings are too tall. Um, all of those things are things that sort of make Santa Fe very characteristic and very distinct amongst American cities. And we are trying to distill that and see how we can actually create that place um, uh, uh, at Midtown. Interesting. Thank you. And and thank you for bringing Mr. Potato Head into our meeting today. I, I really, truly appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> um, um, my co-counselor did, did bring up those future opportunities for community engagement. I know there was some discussion about this within the, um, within the planning commission meeting about uh, some things that would be administratively approved by the land use director or land use department. And, um, uh, concerns that the community wouldn't be aware. My understanding from our my understanding from our conversation today is that that's really part of this ongoing work with the Midtown engagement partners. Am I understanding that correct? And if not, or or are there other avenues by which the community would have opportunities to weigh in as we continue to develop? Mayor Weber, Councilmember Cassett, um, the community will absolutely be engaged and involved both through the NN process as well as um, as we go through the RFP process. And um, so there will be uh, multiple opportunities for each development to, to have community input as well. Okay. Thank you. I just want to add that, I mean, the many of the chain breaker folks are here, but it was they questioned why they couldn't be involved in the RFP evaluation process. So I worked with the city attorney's office to make sure that we had a phrase in the RFPs, and you'll see it coming out this Friday about the composition of an evaluation committee that we will be managing. But it talks about community participation in the reviews. And I think we'll also deal with your question about architectural styles. We'll want, you know, we'll want community opinions on proposals that we get back, make sure that as Midtown gets developed, it's developed in ways it feels like Santa Fe communities. Interesting. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing this because it's definitely a, a very different way than we have done RFPs in the past. So I um yeah we're we're, we're pushing the envelope. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that it'll be really wonderful. You know, we'll get to comments in a minute, but you know, Midtown has has been really a learning process for the city as well. So I, I will be curious to see both how we adjust the process for Midtown or how y'all adjust the process for Midtown, but also how that starts to inform some other opportunities throughout the city. Alexandra, you have that look of more to add. <laughs> Mayor Weber, Councillor Cassett, I also wanted to add that through this whole process, we've figured out a way to support community engagement that we don't normally do, right? Like this is hard for community members to be at this meeting. It's hard for staff to be, you know, um, you know it's, this is, and, and we don't have dual language and we have all sorts of barriers for people to really know what's going on. And so, one of now that we've one one of the ways that we looked at this model was how do we rather than being extractive like high community group please ask your people these questions because we want to know the answers which feels like oh, through this sponsorship program which is really what we based the whole midtown engagement partners on the city's role was to actively pay for and support the community engagement work that was designed and implemented by the groups themselves. So it wasn't the city saying, well, here are my survey questions. Could you ask your people these questions? Like that's, you know, that's that's not meaningful. And it and so I think like as we go through this, we may have these touch points. Maybe it's at the release of an RFP where a, a community group can say, hey, we really care about this. We want to hold a block party and and bring our people around and and play some music and and have these conversations, and you know I would be honored as city staff if I were invited to to partake in that and and to talk about the project. So you know because we piloted this model and we feel like it was super successful, you know that is something. This is a new tool we have, and we're going to intend we intend to continue implementing it as we move forward. Wonderful. Thank you. I mean, and thank you. To, I mean, I know that was just such a different way of 
doing this work and it took a lot of thought and process. And I, I really appreciate that, you know, this team was really willing to go out on a limb and uh, do things that were, took a little bit more time and a little bit more thought instead of just the way that we've always done it. So I, I truly appreciate that. Um, last, I think I just had one more question. So we've had a lot of conversations around affordable housing. And of course, I didn't think about this literally until tonight when you were having the presentation. It would have probably been handy if I thought about this four months ago. Um, we've talked a lot about affordable housing. And another thing that I've started to be thinking about a lot um, just from conversations with community members and constituents and uh, being chair of economic development is affordable commercial space. And I know probably some of these answers are similar to what we're talking about with affordable housing. We own the land. So guess what? We get to, to start to make some decisions, but there's also some very specific um, land use decisions that have gone into place to make affordable housing occur. And I'm, I'm curious if there has been similar contemplation for affordable commercial space for, you know, startups, local entrepreneurs, people that just don't have the capital for um, some of the commercial spaces around our city, but, but could really be bringing important businesses to our community. The answer is yes. Um, and I, 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 it's in the community development plan because we talk about uh, affordability in, uh, in commercial spaces. For example, uh, we want to see at, uh, in the RFPs we're about to send out, we want to see a mixed rate of uh, affordability so that their operating budgets even out. But it's the same way that affordable housing works. You have higher income and uh, or higher uh, lease rates and lower lease rates. And so that way you can meet your operating budgets in the middle. So we want to see that kind of structure for operations of, of those buildings. But in commercial buildings or mixed use buildings as we move forward, we want to see, uh, and we will write it into the developers uh, as, as priorities into the RFPs, that we want to see developers who are willing to provide space at various income ranges as well. Now, again, this will be public policy decision because it, the land values will fluctuate based on, you know, just how affordable we want those commercial spaces to be. But we definitely want to uh, work with developers who are interested in providing affordable commercial space, especially for small, you know, uh, business and uh, business entrepreneurs. So yes. <laughs> and I would imagine just thinking about knowing that there's going to be some mixed use spaces, you know, this, the, the housing conversation is always so complex and, and um, you know, I, I, one of, one of my constituents had mentioned it before that like, we can't solve all of the city's problems at Midtown. Um, but I, I would imagine that in some arenas, this were where some of that market rate housing actually might be beneficial. Cause if we give somebody, you know, full market rate housing, they might be able to provide some really good affordable commercial. Like these are the balances that we're going to have to be thinking about, correct? Yes. And we'll, we'll formulate those kinds of questions or priorities that we want to see. For example, we may want to see in some projects, <clears throat> a childcare center uh, or a senior center, which needs subsidy in order to, to operate. So we will put that into the RFP and we'll, and usually what ends up happening is a developer will not even underwrite those spaces because the rents that come in from those are so low. So they'll figure out ways of maximizing the rents of the residential units in order to subsidize that childcare space. So those are the ongoing balances that as policymakers will have to make together. Interesting. Okay. I look forward. I mean, I really look forward to this. I feel like with affordable housing, we really thought of, you know, we've thought about these mechanisms quite a bit. We've set standards, we've set percentages, but we really haven't thought about it um, with affordable commercial space. And so I think in general, again, the ways that Midtown um, cannot solve the problems for the city, but but also forge paths for us to look at different opportunities. I think this is another area that um, it's gonna be really interesting to see how uh, this continues to provide pathways for solutions, so. <laughs> Um, I believe that was everything I had this evening. So, um, I will yield the floor for question time. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, I have a, a, if you don't mind, just a couple of quick things on my mind. Um, it's been said a number of times that there's a minimum of four parcels that would be put aside for 100% affordable units. Do you have any estimate about how uh, on those four parcels, what the number of units might be that would be 
uh, aggregated on those four par minimum of four parsons. Yeah, if I had the community development plan in front of me, I would know, I'd be able to give you exact numbers. <laughs> I can give you those numbers because they're written into the community development. Plan. Okay, well, I think it. I think because our because our council members and I are very concerned about the math of affordability and achieving that a minimum of 30%, it might provide some sense of confidence that at a, uh, if we have a at a minimum four parcels that are 100% affordable, that would carry us a good way toward achieving that baseline, as you called it, or uh, minimum level of 30% simply by virtue of living into those uh, those parcels. Is that a re is that even close to the math that you all were working through? Yes. I mean, that's exactly how we calculated and how we would achieve 30% threshold. So again, it, it identifies how many units those four parcels would produce. Um, and then the others we calculated based on meeting inflationary housing requirements. And so along with the notion that uh, Alex mentioned of starting out with RFPing projects that would be uh, guaranteed to meet the affordability criteria, we would essentially have in the bank, in the affordable housing bank, uh, the achievement of that, that minimum number of units. After that, everything is gravy, as opposed to thinking of it as we'll never get there because we're delaying it. The fact is we'll get there immediately almost by virtue of setting aside these parcels to ensure the meeting of that baseline minimum. Exactly why we did that. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question about uh, infrastructure. Um, what, what makes this uh, project go at the end of the day is the infrastructure. At the, uh, we have to be able to invest in the developability of the of the uh of the site is the, uh, do you have a sense of the scale of the infrastructure investment and the phasing of that as a working hypothesis well actually dina's here um i, I i'm going to turn it over to her to answer that all right we're gonna to have to swear dina in now okay. unless you held up your hand previously as part of the mass swearing in I did not. Okay, so the clerk will have to swear you in. Kristen, my name is Dina Belzer, and I am at uh, 2991 Shattuck Avenue, Berkeley, California. Yes, I do. Okay, good. Um, Mayor and City Council people, um, we have estimated the total infrastructure cost. So this includes roads, sanitary, sewer, water, uh, <clears throat> um, parks, open space, storm water, and um, fiber optics at about um, $26 million plus or minus. And I don't have the phasing numbers right in front of me, but there are some early phase things that need to be done in sewer and water. Um, that are quicker that would have to happen more quickly and it's easier to sort of build those out all at once. The roads will come over time. The roads are the I think the roads are about 17 million of that and the roads will get built out with the development. So that will happen concurrent. I think again, some of the improvements particularly to sewer, which is where the biggest uh, <coughs> capacity constraint exists today. Um, and then there is water capacity on the site, but the water lines in some cases are not in the right place. Mm -hmm. So they would need to be moved. So those are the kinds of things that would need to happen. But we've already begun that examination um, and the infrastructure reports, particularly for sewer and water are at the back of the master plan. So you can look at those in more detail. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Daniel, if, Daniel? Sorry. That's okay. Uh, if uh, if we're going to come up with the infrastructure money to actually enable the site to be developed, 
what are the different tools that are most immediately in our toolkit for capitalizing those investments? Well, um, Monday evening, and Dini might want to help me with this as well, but Monday evening, there was a presentation made on the different sources to capitalize uh, investments uh, over time. So land disposition was one of them. And again, part of the calculation that we'll be uh, evaluating is upfront capital through sales to pay for infrastructure versus long-term that might pay down debt on a bond. So those will be ongoing economic evaluations we'll make, but I think the, the major revenue sources that we're, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at are land sales. That's the biggest source or land disposition, say, because you could get a ground lease, you could do a long-term ground lease. The one advantage to doing the sale versus the lease is you get the money up front. And again, this is the weighing out, the balancing out of these different policy considerations. So there's not a right or a wrong way to do it, um, but that's one way to think about it. Then. Um, there is the bonding capacity from gross receipts tax. Um, I've been working with Mr. Laird Grazier, who knows the ins and outs of New Mexico gross receipts tax, like nobody, not nobody else, but very few people in New Mexico do. Uh, I thought I could do it myself and then talk about outsider syndrome. Hmm. I learned quickly that one is not good to do it. Um, so, um, and Mr. Grazier is estimating citywide gross receipts tax increases over the next 15 years uh, and has projected out that the city could both pay down the existing bond that exists on the site and draw down another potentially $50 million worth of bond revenues that could be used to pay for infrastructure. Um, the decisions to do bonding would again come to the finance committee and to the governing body. None of those decisions would be made without you. And then there are a lot of other sources. The city's going to get $5 million from the land swap from the state. Um, the city's already gotten $3 million in legislative appropriations from the state. There will be other grant funds. There's infrastructure money from the federal government. So there'll be the, one of the things about a financing strategy for something like this is it will be opportunistic um, and it'll need to be sort of just in time. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, one more quick question. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of times the uh, assuming this uh, were to be adopted or uh, uh, we vote to approve this this evening, that Friday uh, there are three RFPs that are ready to go out the door. Um, why those three? Uh, and how will the RFP process work for those three uh, first out the door uh, opportunities? So it, there's two hats I wear about these RFPs. One is uh, the community process hat and the community development pr uh, uh, hat. We heard clearly that arts and culture needed to be drivers at, 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 the, at Midtown and that the Visual Arts Center was an opportunity for technology, design, arts, culture, and that's the way that we've crafted that. So that was in res direct response to, and it was an existing asset that the city has. We could never build that asset from the ground up. So it was an opportunity to address a lot of the community concerns by using that asset. Um, from the developer side, I think it's like it begins to recharge, bring people back to Midtown with the low hanging fruit, if you will, at, uh, on the site. Um, uh, it will require some investment from the developer operator who we select. Um, and so we, we it'll bring back people to the site. And from a developer perspective, that's exciting. You want to create a marketplace for people to come back. So any project anywhere always looks at the low hanging fruit and what you can do to begin stimulating the market and creating interest. And that's the reason we chose particularly the Visual Arts Center. Same thing with the Performing Arts Center, the Garson Performance Theater. Um, we want to see that as an opportunity for synergies possibly between those. So again, addressing what we heard is big priorities, arts and culture at Midtown. The RFP for the film expansion, there are people knocking at Rich and my door talking about their interest in uh, in, in uh, the disposition of that site to be able to expand those studios. We want to, and they have investors that have time limits. So we want to get that thing out the door to be able to attract and, and retain um, those investors and developers, operators who are interested in the expansion of the site. Also from the community development hat, 
jobs. Um, so in the RFP, we talk about career training and internship opportunities as a priority for the de developer responses we get um, so that there's uh, training for crews uh, to be working on pre-production, post-production, and production. Um, so all again, all of that is written to the RFP as well as priorities for us. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My time is up. Uh, we've all had one go round rather than 10 minutes. We kind of did 20 minutes, but it was a good flow. Is there any follow-up at this time of questions for anybody from members of the governing body? We could, again, we're at 1035 and we've only got, we've only started the first hearing. So we've got more work to do, but I don't want to shut anybody down if there's burning follow-up questions that folks feel they really want to take this opportunity to ask. If there aren't any, and I appreciate the, the uh, restraint, um, I'm going to close the public hearing, recognizing that once the hearing is closed, further questions of witnesses can be permitted, but we would have to have a motion to reopen the public hearing. And at this time, I will entertain, we have three cases in front of us. We've heard them concurrently. We'll need separate motions for each case. So I'd like to start with a motion for uh, the first case, the Midtown General Plan Amendment. Is there a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve number case number 2022-5763, Midtown General Plan Amendment. Second. And there's a second. And now I think you all were very, really, really well um, uh, phrased in terms of the questions that we were asked, but as Councillor Garcia noted earlier, there is a time for conversation, discussion, or simply speaking your, your thoughts about it without having it be a question. I would entertain discussion of the motion. Councilwoman Villarreal. It's not really a discussion, just some comments. I wanted to thank community members and the community groups for their persistence and um, commitment to the community engagement process um, and also transparency of the process. And I think it was um, having KDC pull out as the um, main developer was a blessing because I think it, it forced us to reassess this process um, in a more transparent way. And also it made us more focused on what we need and what the community desired, um, as well as our values on the property and what we'd like to see. Um, just wanted to thank staff since we don't get to thank you enough about all the Herculean efforts of putting this together. Um, there's a lot of moving parts um, for this plan. I've done community plans. This by far actually went, I think, fairly quick, quickly for a master plan. Um, and I do want to thank former asset development director, Matt O'Reilly, because ultimately he was the one that really worked hard on creating a, a strong foundation to work from related to the campus assets, the process and other due diligence that needed to happen before we even began. So I wanna thank him for that. And um, I'm also just really eager to see this development have an ability to retain, but also integrate the local and cultural context, while it's also looking at expanding and engaging in other broader social, economic, and physical contexts. So that's important to me. I think what I really enjoyed about the plan and the master plan, it covers many facets. And, and I'm saying this from a former um, community planner, that it covers many facets about smart growth tools and standards. It has a it talks about a public health component as it relates to walkability, multimodal designs, um, and it prior to, prioritizes um, connectivity. So I appreciate that because I think we don't necessarily have that across the city, and this is a place where we could really do it um, and prioritize it. Um, I do want to say that we we use the word equity a lot in plans, and um, I don't think they should be thrown around around lightly um, because equity does not equate to equality and that all things are equal for this property and how it's going to be developed. And when we talk about equity, 
It's really focused on the most marginalized people that are most underserved and also vulnerable populations. And so by using the word, I want us to make sure that we're actually meaning saying what we mean and we use equity in the way that we actually are committed to it. We did use the word health equity in the document. Um, I think we need to not just say that that's what it is. I think um, when we mean it, we're talking about health equity and we're talking about people of limited income or working class folks that actually get to enjoy the amenities on the Midtown site and not just saying that health is about people's walkability. It's actually people living there and working there of all types of incomes. Um, I also want to note that we do emphasize Hopewell Man neighborhood, and that's extremely important. And there's other neighborhoods that we don't reference. Um, Thomas Heights is one of them that's right close by, walking distance. And there may be in others that I don't know about because I don't, it's not my district. So I think we should probably reference them because there's a greater um, contiguous neighborhoods that we need to recognize. Overall, I'm I'm pleased how we've moved forward. There's a lot of work put into this and it's really from a community powered effort. And so thank you all for continuing to work with us and we still have much more work to do and we have the community um, development plan to follow this. So I'm looking forward to that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Other, yes, Councilor Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, it's funny, Council Member Real. I had said the exact same comment about KDC, well, pulling out like yesterday or this morning in a conversation about that it was really a blessing. That I, that I think that um, the the opportunity that we have now um, with this plan is is immense. Um, and and what I love about this plan, and I keep kind of talking about it in different ways is that this, this interesting balance between um, structure and direction and forward momentum, but also this flexibility piece that has been built in and, and with the city really having the control and knowing that this is going to be an incremental process and that there are both kind of the tools that are put in place to, to set the vision forward, but also we, you know, if the world has taught us anything over the last five-ish years, it's that we don't really know at all what's going to happen. Um, and so, so this, I think that it really does put us in a better place um, for what this development can be. And I think that we've learned a lot as a city, as a government about processes and that that's invaluable and, and how we start to take the midtown processes and apply them to different parts of the city, um, I think is another crucial piece of this that we cannot um, we cannot miss that opportunity to to see how it restructures uh, the way we do things as a government um, and especially the way that we interact with the community and bring people in and um, take the extra time because there what there was there was a lot of this criticism about taking the extra time. Um, uh, you know, there's been some criticism in the last couple of days about how long it took to plan this, but I, I really think that there was so much value um, in that work really being done and really leaning into that. So I want to thank our community partners. I want to thank staff um, for, for jumping into this process and helping navigate. I'm sure that we'll, you know, we'll hit other roadblocks with this. Of course we will. I mean, this is a huge project. There's no way that we're not going to have some other challenge or some other moment that we go, whoops, and have to turn around. And, um, but there are really, really important lessons. And I'm really excited at this point of, of watching us turn this corner because we are, we're turning a corner, um, assuming that we pass it, we haven't voted yet, um, to, to continue forward momentum with this. Um, I'll say it again, because it is district four. I want Midtown to be everything that it can be, and it can't be everything to the city. And, and I just really want to caution us as we continue to move forward. It will not solve all the problems of the city. And if anybody is hoping that it's going to solve all the problems of the city, um, I'd like you to, to take that thought out of your brain because I really want to look at what Midtown is as an asset to this part of the city, what it brings to the center, the geographic center of our city, the Midtown of our city, uh, what it brings to District 4, 
Um, and that it is something that really is enhancing the quality of life as, as Mr. Gobbledon had said, um, of district four and that we are not, um, and the other surrounding neighborhoods, because of course it does kind of sit on this border. Um, and that we're not ig ignoring those those neighboring communities um, because we'd like to have Midtown be the solution for everything. And, and I really want to make sure that we are looking at it as a growth opportunity instead of as a fix it opportunity. Um, and so with that, I, I just, you know, thank you to the staff. Uh, thank you for the community partners. Thank you for every member of this community who has attended a meeting or an event or written an email or picked up the phone or stopped me at the many coffee shops that I am always at um, to talk to me about this process and to, to get their voice out because it really, um, it really has made a difference. And I, I think that it's been really encouraging uh, even when, when your words were not, you know, when you weren't pleased, I <laughs> still, it's still really appreciate hearing about those. Um, and I think that this is a, a really innovative plan. I think that we are taking a lot of the things that we we frequently talk about wanting to do and putting them into this plan. So um, I will stop rambling because it is late at night and that's why I'm still talking. So thank you so much. Thank you. Others who have a, uh, Councilor Garcia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thankful I got coffee because it's, it's one of those things where um, I can only imagine how much coffee that Midtown team has gone through these past couple of years. It's uh, we. I remember when we picked KDC, we thought, "Great, we're moving forward." And then we had that bombshell dropped on us, and quickly pivoted. And uh, um, uh, Rich, I, I I don't know if uh, because you hail from the Bay area. And I, I, and I look at you now as kind of a Steph Curry. I don't know if folks get that. I mean, this is a, a hall of fame superstar NBA basketball player. And he, when the pressure gets going, he steps up, Steph Curry does. And I think Mr. Brown and his team stepped up. So hats off to you. I, I think, uh, uh, I'm excited. We're finally here. We are finally at this moment where, our future is in focus and we are all eager to take those next steps. But I think the heavy lifting is now what's before us where we now decide how do we fill this space up with great community assets. And um, with that being said uh, to uh, the, the community participants that are here, we, need you to stay engaged that this critical for these next steps your voice shifted us through this this process um your voice is now going to lift up whatever is built there through these next steps so please continue to stay engaged um it, it's it's one of these those things where um, this is going to take time to develop this space. Um, I, I was actually thinking about it up here uh, when, when we mentioned the rail yard. And I remember 20 years ago when the rail yard was a rail yard. And now it's this beautiful space. So using that kind of time frame of 20 years out, I mean, sheesh, I was like, I'll be in my 60s. And, and, and I was, I'm already thinking, what amenities am I going to need when I'm 60? Well, probably affordable housing, maybe, um, uh, arts, outdoor space. So I think that is where, um, as we are living in the now, we've also got to keep a perspective on the future. Where, where do we want to leave a space where future generations are going to say, you did it right, and thank you. And, and so with that, I just want us to think with that mindset as we continue. And, and keep the mindset of we're not working for this for now in five years or 10 years. We're working for this in 20 years, 30 years for the future generations that are going to be utilizing that space. Um, so with that, thank you to everybody. There's too many names to list, community members, city staff, contractors, everybody. Thank you. Uh, get get a good night's rest tonight. Well-deserved. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councilor.
Uh, Councillor uh, Lee Garcia, and then we'll do it at Councillor Mayor Thank you, Mayor. I um, think just mostly thanks to everyone that's been involved with this, um, you know, attending uh, quite a few of the um, community engagements um, and just looking at the process and seeing how Chain Breakers was involved, seeing how um, Earth Care was involved, seeing how uh, just the community at large came out to to be involved in this. And I think that um, that's a very important uh, piece to this puzzle in, in listening to all, all the people who, who gave their input, um, worked to gather the input and, and be involved. And again, kudos to everyone. Um, I would be remiss in, in not saying, you know, I, I really hope for the future that um, as this develops, and I think that came out in some of my uh, my comments or questions uh, during the public hearing, is that um, we as a city work really, really closely with uh, not only the neighborhoods, but I think the public schools uh, is, is a huge stakeholder in this because the amount of people that are going to live and, and utilize this space are going to need schools to go to. They're going to need places to be they're going to need public uh public safety for them and and all of the things that come along with development and um i think that it's it's really up to us in the future and again whether i'm sitting in this seat or somebody else is it's up to us to be diligent in making sure that uh, these uh these amenities are available to to the people who live here um and that it's available to all santa fe santa fans um, I also uh, would like to to maybe um, spark an interest in, in being that this is an area that uh, will be um, utilized by many uh, and a lot of people who um, will need affordable housing and I think parking is going to be a huge part of this uh, maybe in the future we look at uh, maybe creating it a no uh, no fee parking zones in this area. As well in the future, so just something that we can throw out there for for future um, consideration. And again, thank you for every to everyone who's worked very hard on this project. And uh, you know, it is a is an area that um, uh, was a and you know an area of, of higher um, education and institutional, uh, which is sad to see that go. Um, the other last comment I guess I'd like to make is. Um, I would really, really challenge us to uh, dedicate names, um, parks, something of the other to the Christian Brothers and to College Campus, uh, College of Santa Fe, because uh, that's what we all knew it as um, growing up. And uh, um, I think it would be very, uh, I you know, sad to see something of that nature go away and uh, um, college campus, something of the nature that we could maybe come up with. So those are my comments and uh, thank you again to everyone involved. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Mayor Ward. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, just congratulations and thank you. Um, I know we haven't voted yet, but sort of sounds like we're going in the right direction. Um, <laughs> uh, Congratulations to the community groups who participated. I would agree with Councillor Garcia that we need you to stay in, involved as this moves forward. Um, there are a lot of decisions to be made and a lot of input still to gather, and um, your voices have been very important. Um, congratulations to the staff. I mean, incredible when we think of um, where we started four years ago, uh, the false start we had and then a pandemic and then to be in this moment um really pretty incredible uh congratulations to our consultants um congratulations to the community and um to the people of santa fe and all the people who have participated uh in all the processes the co the concept phase there were there were a lot of people who gave um of their time and talent to to envision the possibilities and um so just I, I that seems like another lifetime ago when that started um 
so I, again, it's wonderful to see this take shape. Um, this plan will allow us to meet multiple objectives that serve a cross section of the community. Um, I would agree with Councillor Cassett that it, this site won't solve all of our problems of the city. Um, and yet it does represent one of the best and biggest opportunities we have for affordable housing. And um, I'm happy to see us being aggressive with that. Uh, also, I think it's an opportunity to develop correctly with modern thinking about all the elements that make for a thriving, vibrant, and dynamic city center. So we can really showcase the right way of doing these things and the, the most current thinking and, and really have something to be proud of. But I also agree we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but wonderful to have a vision, wonderful to have a 700 pages of things to look at and work from. And uh, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Chavez, I have a feeling you have something on your mind. Thank you, Mayor. I want to say thank you. I, you know, I had a conversation with um, Director Brown during our break where I was like, this plan is like our blank canvas. And with transparency and engagement and involvement and doing things the right way with really letting the community voice drive it, we could really paint a beautiful picture. And it makes me very excited for my kids, right? I think of myself as a youth member where I didn't feel necessarily part of something. And I feel like because the community has stepped up and the staff and the partners involved have done the work, my kids will be able to stand in Midtown as young adults and feel like they belong to something because it was created by the people that support them and educate them and advocate for them. So it's very exciting. And I want to just emphasize the power and the potential in that. And the reason why I constantly go back to community involvement and really asking for or emphasizing the fact that that involvement is only if we are we've been transparent in this process and that's why we've had success why we need to even be more so transparent as we start actually building laying foundations finalizing plans making sure that everyone understands everyone knows everyone is educated as to why this gem is being built the way that it is so I encourage uh, those that are doing the work to promote that transparency. Let's over communicate. Let's over invite. Let's go above and beyond to make sure that door is open. And community members, I encourage you to walk through that door and really be part of this process. But congratulations and thank you everyone for your work. Thank you. Councilor Cass, it's something yeah, I just have th like 30 more seconds. Uh, Ms. Belter, I forgot to ask you this question during the public hearing, so I'm just going to give your quote out. Um, you can't talk anymore. I'm sorry. We'd have to reopen the public hearing. I apologize for that. I mean, you can at the next case. Um, but uh, Ms. Belter, who's, who's done this work nationally um, in the hallway, just told me about how incredible our city of Santa Fe staff are. And, and I really think that that's important to share with the public and with staff that, you know, she just said that with everyone that she's worked with and all the different cities and all the different groups that the staff that we have here at the city of Santa Fe just blows everybody away. And I think that that's really important that the public recognize how incredibly hard our staff works and how brilliant they are and, and dedicated and creative. And um, that's not just coming from, from us. That's coming from, from somebody else who has really been work, working in a lot of different communities. So thank you, Dina, for sharing that with me. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that that staff and everybody else heard about how wonderful you are. Thank you. Any other comments? If there are no other comments, uh, we have a motion. We have a second. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Councilor Chavez? Councilor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councilor Mayor Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank
Thank you. That takes us to item B. Is there a motion on the rezoning proposal? I move to approve case number 2022-5765, the Midtown rezoning from R5 to C2 PUD. Second. I heard us two seconds, one second apart. Uh, council, Councilwoman, uh, Councilor Chavez made the second. Uh, is there a discussion about the Midtown rezoning uh, proposal? If there is no discussion, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll on that motion? Yes, Councilor Lee Garcia. Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia. Councilor Mayor Worth. Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal. Yes. Councilor Cassett. Yes. Councilor Chavez. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion has been approved. And that brings us to the third case that we heard concurrently, which is the Midtown Master Plan. Is there a motion on that item? I move to approve case number 2022-5764, the Midtown Master Plan. Second. There's a motion. There's a second. Uh, Councilor Cast. Thank you. I actually do have a amendment slash correction to the master plan. Um, you know, I couldn't get away through a whole night without talking about childcare. Um, so I was noticing in the table of uses that it was not updated uh, to be consistent with the changes that we made to the zoning codes that permits childcare centers of all um of all sizes to be allowed in all zones by right without a special use permit. So I do have an amendment that um, make sure that these that the um, uh, table of permitted uses reflects our um, our current zoning code for that the changes that we made to land use code back in April. So I would like to move that amendment. Um, what are we amending if we have that motion, um, Mr. City Attorney? We're amending Table Five Point Five Point A. Apparently. Marcos. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the governing body. I think that's the table um, in the master plan that the councilor has identified, and that's that should be sufficient particularity okay. to identify it. There's a motion to correct that table so it reflects our our current land use current code that allows yeah. yes. And is there a second to that? Second. There's a motion and a second to amend that table. Is there a discussion of that motion? We can call the roll on the amendment. Uh, Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councilor Romero Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Councilor Chavez? Yes. Councilor Lee Garcia? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved amending the permitted uses. So we have a, a motion to approve the master plan as amended. Other discussion? Councilwoman Villarreal. Mayor, just want to cl clarify the, the request for the corrections about acequias and the history section. I don't think I need, I guess I'm asking staff, do I need to make any specifications or is that something that um, doesn't need a motion or doesn't need an amendment, I guess. Mayor, Council Member Verrell, I think the way you can accomplish that is possibly through a condition of approval that those be updated and um, as to how you would like to see it again um, either we can send it to you for review and approval i'm not sure that the governing body uh, i i'm just wondering as to process how that would flesh out whether it would be an administrative type of thing that we would review and make sure it's okay and passes muster or whether it needs to come back to the governing body. But your thoughts. Councillor <clears throat> Villarreal, members of the governing body, you know, I think one way to accomplish that would be to move, to, one could make a motion to 
replace the term acequia, which is a legal term of art in New Mexico with a specified meaning, uh, with the term arroyo, as you suggested. Um, that might be one way to do it. Pat, do you have another idea? Um, no, I think that would accomplish it in that section. I do think uh, it should be a motion just, uh, that it be changed, and then staff can make sure that change happens. Can I? So does it have to be written? Does the motion have to be written? Yeah. I think so. No, I don't. The amendment doesn't have to be written. Staff can staff can take. Okay, it. and I guess the other question is: Do we really mean arroyo, or do we mean a waterway? I think it was maybe a. Somebody thought it was how we talk about small streams or small waterways, and completely agree with the city attorney, assistant city attorney, that it is a legal term of art. There, We do refer, there is a lot of law around acequias, and so we do not want to be, I agree with Councilwoman Villarreal, and I'm glad she brought it up, um, that we do want to fix that, but I'm not sure what was meant when they said acequia. I think they just meant like cute little waterway, but not realizing the deepness of that word in this state. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor, would the term water channel or something similar? Channels just seem so big. And the other thing, just to clarify, it's kind of dispersed throughout the document and it's used in different contexts. So I wouldn't be able to give you like an amendment, say change Asequia to waterway or Arroyo because it's used in different contexts that are inaccurate. We could remove the term acequia entirely and replace it with um, appropriate words per section. That would be the context requires. Right. I think that would make sense. Um, and if you want me to pinpoint or point it out later on, I just want it to be accurate. And then I want the history section to be accurate. And I don't, I just want to, maybe it's not really a motion, um, an amendment per se, but just condition with the condition that we make those um, appropriate changes. Is that enough? Is that sufficient? <laughs> it's late. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it would be, I mean, I think your motion would be to at least replace the term asakia, which has obviously a very specific statutory and case law meaning in New Mexico, um, which it was maybe inadvertently used throughout mm -hmm. the master plan. That's fine. I guess the other piece is the history and editing it based on what you are you what you had in the staff report and making minor corrections. I'm afraid that um, the city clerk has pointed out to me the governing body's new procedural rules indicate that amendments must be written and included in the governing body packet. So I would suggest either a waiver of the rules for this particular motion uh, just to address the Asakia issue, or um, I'm not quite sure how else to handle this. Well, it doesn't need to be in the packet, but we can write it, okay, put it on. which is so much fun. Yeah. When we do it, I wonder if any of this could be accomplished by a, uh, a directive to the city manager and city in, in the case of the language regarding uh, Asakia, that could be a directive to simply eliminate the word and replace it with an appropriate word. Editing the history section is a little more complicated around what is, you know. What what is acceptable to whom? So I'm not even sure how to phrase that one. But could we not simply direct that the that term is inartfully used and it needs to be altered in the document and uh, leave it at that? Or does it actually require a written amendment to make it happen? Sure that <clears throat> I mean I, I had to have an idea. I mean my my view is that this master plan is a large planning document. This is a particular. Um, um uh, inartful use of a phrase um with unintended consequences perhaps and so 
Um, I'm not sure that the motion actually is the best vehicle for accomplishing this. I um, I think the direction from this, this body to uh, staff to implement this master plan could include also revisions that are consistent with the direction that this body has given. If we can agree on that, I think we can obviously take care of the Asaki issue with the series of strokes of the pen. I'm a little less confident that I know how to solve the problem of what is a quote unquote accurate historical portrayal as we're, we've been wrestling that for a while over whose version of accurate gets to decide. Well, it's not really about like trying to change the whole thing. It's we already wrote it. It's in the staff report and it's not the same um, language that's in the document. So that's one thing. And then there's just one link, one sentence about Pueblo history that I think needs to be um, revisited. I'm fine with just hoping that staff can make the changes. I don't think it has any kind of with this exception of Asequias, it doesn't have any legal um, implications. Right. Good point. I think we can direct staff to make those corrections and uh, they will be reflected in the minutes of the meeting and the sentiment of the governing body. Is that okay, Councilwoman? I'm just looking at staff because it looked like they had some other suggestion. Um, no other suggestions, Mayor, uh, Council Member. It's the history section, we did meet with this. Uh, the state and the city historian that was intended to be quite accurate. Um, well, I'm talking about it. What's written in the actual document is different from what you all wrote in the staff report and the staff report is more um, robust and has uh, it covers more areas than what we, was written in the document. It seems like an easy fix. You all wrote it. I didn't write the staff report. You wrote it, so it's there. I think it would be easy to just transfer that into the document. Could it be maybe just uh, in the conditions of approval? I, I don't know. Conditions of approval that you remove a secus and replace it with a more appropriate word that's not like, um, contradictory to our statutes or to yeah. law. I think that's a good fix. And then we can wrestle with the difference between the staff report history version and the documents history version. But to Councilman Varel's point, it really is uh, the meat of the document is, is around the plan itself. This is trying to get it to, so it sounds right and right. passes the test of accuracy. Any other, if we can do that and agree to that, that's the direction from this governing body. Any other comments about the motion as amended on the floor? I would, I would take the opportunity to make one last comment before we vote on this. Um, I, I agree with everything that our, my colleagues have said about the steadfast participation and the incredible energy and vision of the community and the many different communities that participated in bringing us to this point. Um, we heard over and over again tonight uh, from across Santa Fe, people supporting this plan. That is in itself a, a remarkable achievement. We heard from every facet of our city how invested the people of Santa Fe are in this project. And that's a remarkable achievement for all of us, the community and the people who work to interact with and listen to the community. Um, the journey has been longer than I think any of us even know. I mean, you can talk about the the College of Santa Fe, you can talk about the College of Art and Design. I can tell you that when I walked in the door as mayor, I was handed a, an agreement that had been negotiated that would have turned the campus over to uh, Raffles and UNM, no questions asked, no community involvement, no economic study, no master plan, simply let's turn it over to them and hope something good happens. That agreement was torn up and we went to work as a governing body and as a staff and as a community to put our own stamp on what needs to happen on that site. I said when, when we began the journey that it's a unicorn. It is still a unicorn in America. There is no site like this in the United States. There is nothing that measures up to its opportunity, to its history, 
to what it can become uh, if we step into this moment. Uh, the work of this city team has been outstanding. It is world-class. It is something we should all be incredibly proud of. Um, this city team took over the work uh, at the beginning of COVID and under very adverse circumstances uh, has performed uh, it with an outstanding level of cooperation, collaboration, vision uh, to produce a plan that would stand the test of any city in any place in the world. Um, this city team coordinated unprecedented community engagement that really pivoted this project in a whole new direction, responded to economic challenges, brought flexibility and creativity to the planning process, analyzed the underlying economics of Midtown, and presented a number of optimistic and realistic options for uh, financial returns from Midtown. Far from being a white elephant, it is a huge financial opportunity. This team put the city in a position, the very desirable position, to be in charge of our own choices, our own path forward in this once-in-a-lifetime treasure of a site. And this team has produced a document and a plan that combines control of the site with flexibility and creativity in its development. It has really done an outstanding job to deliver something uh, that I believe is a uh, landmark achievement and deserves an enormous uh, debt of gratitude from not only the governing body, but all of the people in our community who've participated and interacted with staff. Um, it is a team effort of un uh, unimagined proportion and unmatched success. So I am enthusiastic. I'm excited. I think we are uh, we are at a new point where this project is ready to see the first three RFPs go out the door on Friday, uh, and more after that. The affordable housing projects, the four sites at a minimum, will soon be RFP'd, and we will see this. Uh, this opportunity begin to manifest itself. So thank you to everybody, uh, the governing body, staff, the community, the consultants, the team that really came together. Uh, this is an outstanding achievement of absolutely monumental proportions, and I'm very grateful. With that, Madam uh, Clerk, could you please call the roll? Yes. Well, Mayor, to clarify, we need to amend the motion to add a condition of approval. We do. Yes. Ah, I thought we could do it as a directive. We can't. We have to do it as a condition of approval. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it can be a directive. It just needs to be in the same motion. Okay. Would um, Councilwoman Virel, you want to add a condition of approval? As Councillor Cassett had the motion. Mm -hmm. Councillor Cassett. Oh, I have to add it. It's your um, oh, original great. motion. Wonderful. To proof. Yep. Uh, I would like to, uh, am I editing my motion? It's too late. I'm I'm updating my motion to include the conditions of approval that will replace the word acequia with everywhere that it occurs within the master plan for a more appropriate term, um, as well as update the um, the history to reflect what was written in the staff report. Okay. Is that right? And that, that requires a second and a vote, or is that yes? Councilwoman Villarreal, you were the second on that. I thought it was Amanda. I yes, I agree. Okay. Okay. So we have a additional condition and do we need to vote on that or yes, we do need to vote on that before we vote on the main motion as amended. This was the main motion as amended. Yeah, but she just added, she's just edited it. Well, okay. Yes. So we're good to go. Now we can call the roll. Yes. Please do. 
Perfect. Council Romero Orth. Yes. Councilwoman Virial. Yes. Councilor Cassett. Yes. Councilor Chavez. Yes. Councilor Lee Garcia. Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia. Yes. Mayor Weber. Yes. Motion is approved as Thank amended you. with conditions. Thank you. Good job, everyone. I, I know it's a good time to applaud, but we try not to do either a booing or applauding in here. Um, can I get a motion to suspend our uh, 11.30 uh, stoppage time. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second to suspend our 11.30 stoppage time. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? I don't know if I want to be here that late. I'm kidding. Sorry. Bad, <laughs> bad joke, Mayor. Yeah, I, I'm more interested in getting it done. I know. Um, sorry. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Perfect. Everybody, Councilor can Cassett. you hold it down, please? Yes. Councilor Chavez? Yes. Councilor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes. Uh, Councilor Romero Worth has stepped out. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Okay, so we don't have to stop at 1130, but we do have another hearing in front of us. This is not a, uh, it's not the same kind of hearing. This is a legislative process. Uh, so, but we will take public testimony if there is any uh, to be had. Madam Clerk, do you want to read this? Have you already read this item? You want to read it again? You better read it. Please do. Yep, I have not read this item. Okay, this is this is the standalone here uh, hearing on uh, label D in our packet. Correct, Mayor. This is consideration of Bill Number Twenty Twenty Two Dash Twenty Five. It's adoption of an ordinance for case number 2022-5766. It's the Midtown Link Text Amendment. The City of Santa Fe agent owner requests that the governing body approve a text amendment to the Midtown Local Innovation Corridor, Midtown Link Overlay District, SFCC 1987, Section 14-5.5D to expand the permitted uses in the Midtown Link Overlay District to include all qualifying projects, Update the name of the area formerly known as the Santa Fe University of Art and Design. Format the use chart consistently with the rest of Chapter 14's charts. Allow alternative open space compliance for institutional buildings and reduce landscape area minimum requirements around the base of qualifying residential projects within the Midtown Planned Unit Development and removing an expired provision regarding review of the ordinance. And thank you. Heather is already so, ready. Um, um, Ms. Lamboy, you will present the staff report. Uh, after that, we will uh, entertain any public input that is offered. Uh, it's not a formal public hearing as we've had with the first go around, but we do want the opportunity for people to be heard. Then we'll take governing body uh, questions and then we'll proceed to uh, motion. But the staff report begins everything, ma'am. So you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with reference to this particular presentation, the case caption actually pretty much covered it. So I'm going to be very succinct. Uh, so what is the purpose of the innovation corridor is to strengthen the built environment and the business and community relationship, incentivize multifamily and non-residential development with an enlivened pedestrian environment, and allow for innovative development and site planning. So as you know, the link covers more than Midtown. Midtown is highlighted in white in the, the graphic there. So, you know, when the link was authored, the thoughts weren't completely, um, or the idea wasn't completely formed as to how Midtown would fit into it all. It was something that was corridor wide. So the um, purpose for these amendments is to just clearly link the master plan to the legislative standards found in chapter 14. So once again, it's not the University of Santa Fe, um, Santa Fe University of Art and Design. It's going to be Midtown now. So that needs to be updated as well as clarifying qualifying projects, um, which will be structured like the permitted use table and um, clarifications on distribution of landscaping and open space. So with reference to permitted and prohibited uses, the clarification is that additional permitted and prohibited uses within the Midtown Master Plan area are provided in the Midtown Master Plan. So that's gonna be added to the table that's here. 
the qualifying projects table, what you find in chapter 14, um, are P's for permitted uses. And when this was drafted, X's were used. We wanted to be consistent. So for ease of use by the public and, and other professionals. So that will be updated. In addition, there will be um, other standards that will apply for, because of the Midtown Master Plan. So what's being added is permitted uses and development and design standards within the Midtown Master Plan area are in addition to the standard provisions of the link overlay and shall conform to the requirements of the underlying zone district of a property unless otherwise specified. Finally, open space, we have an organization of open space that's set forth by the master plan and includes plazas, quad park, the quad park, then there's pocket park. So there's open space that's also required with each individual development that in addition to these sort of overall regional types of open spaces. So uh, the uh, there has been a change to the link that's proposed specific to Midtown to be consistent with that master plan. So the approval criteria for the text amendment includes compliance with the law, consistency with the general plan and other governing body policies, and consistency with the purpose, consistency with the purpose and intent of chapter 14. The planning commission recommended approval unanimously to the governing body, and that concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. Uh, I want to open the uh, floor to anyone either present or who is on still with us on uh, Zoom who would like to comment on uh, this uh, text amendment to the Midtown link. Is there anybody present who wants to come forward and speak to this for a, a two minutes? Or Madam Clerk, anyone you're seeing on the Zoom uh, who's still with us who wants to address this issue? Um, Mayor, we only have one attendee, so I'll just ask them if uh, you're interested in speaking to this item. Please raise your hand. Uh, it looks like Subi Bowden is. Okay. Subi, if you'd like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. And they raise their hand. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good evening to the council and staff. Um, I did not actually raise my hand um, until you called me. Um, so thank you, but I do not need to speak to it. And I thank you all for such great work for our community. Thank you. That's very kind. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone else who wants to speak to this uh, amendment? Uh, from the governing body, questions for on the staff report or on uh, the proposal as it has been uh, advanced to us from the planning commission. Any questions for staff? If there are no questions, can I uh, get a motion? To approve. Second. Motion to approve. There's second. Is there discussion? Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll on the motion? Yes, Councillor Cassett. Yes. Councillor Chavez? Yes. Councillor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councillor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councillor Mayor Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. Thank you. That leaves with us with the last two public hearing cases that we need to uh, have you present to us, Madam Clerk. And then it is a, it is a, a public hearing, and we will go through the same process we used with the first bundled set of cases where in the first case it was three in this case it will be two if you could uh read us the item please you got it uh item e is consideration of a resolution it's case number 2022-5767 it's midtown adjacent parcel general plan amendment the city of santa fe agent requests that the governing body approve a resolution to amend the existing general plan future land use classification for the city of Santa Fe and New Mexico state owned parcels comprising plus or minus 24 acres adjacent to 1600 St. Michael's drive from public institutional to transitional mixed use. And then mayor, I'm going to go ahead and read item F since they all are um, kind of a pair consideration of bill number 2022-26. This is adoption of an ordinance 
This is case number 2022-5769. This is the Midtown adjacent parcels rezoning. The city of Santa Fe agent requests that the governing body approve an ordinance to rezone the city of Santa Fe and New Mexico state owned parcels comprising of plus or minus 24 acres adjacent to 1600 St. Michael's Drive from R5, five residential dwelling units per acre to C2 general commercial. The parcels are within the Midtown Link Overlay District. Thank you. So just to remind everybody, we are still in a uh, uh, quasi-judicial mode. We are in a public hearing. We'll begin with, uh, uh, I will give anyone who wishes to recuse themselves the opportunity if you can't be fair and impartial, or if you're exhausted and you want to say you can't be fair and impartial, <laughs> this is your time to uh, cop a plea. Um, then we'll have a stat. We'll have uh, Ms. Lamboy with a staff report, um, an opening statement from the applicant, public testimony and comment if there is any questions by the governing body. When that's completed, we will close the public hearing, get to motions on these two items and discuss the items and then vote. But we begin with the uh, presentation from Ms. Lamboy. Thank you, Mary. May Sorry. <laughs> I think you have proven my point about needing to recuse yourself. Right. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with reference to the uh, uh, adjoining parcels that are owned by the state, it's the applicant team thought about, well, what next already? And so the whole purpose of rezoning these particular uh, parcels is to think about, be forward thinking and preparing ourselves so that if we get such huge demand and we have lots of great opportunity for redevelopment, we'll have this in place. Um, and just so you know, the state has authorized the city to act on behalf of uh, the state in this particular case, or in these two cases. So the request is for a general plan amendment from low density residential to transitional mixed use, similar to the main uh, area of the Midtown and rezoning from residential five dwelling units per acre to the general commercial. And we've already dealt with the Midtown master plan and the link text amendments. This is an aerial illustrating the area of the parcels. And you can see here the graphic it's highlighted in a navy blue color. Those are the tracts of land that are abutting Seringa Road and sort of wrapping around the Schellenberger Tennis Center. <clears throat> so the request is to um, amend the general plan from uh, public institutional uh, to, to transitional mixed use. And that context is similar to what we talked about previously with the residential and commercial uses in the, the general area this being more resident, residentially oriented. So, and once again, the transitional mixed use provides for um, you know, innovative site planning, um, office permits, a variety of things like office and residential uh, together in a mix of uses and fosters alternate transportation options. Similarly, for the zoning, the existing zone district for these state parcels, R, um, is R5, five dwelling units per acre. The request is to um, change it to commercial um, C2. It's not going to be C2 PUD because this is outside of the master plan area. So the standards that are set forth in chapter 14, according to C2, will be what applies, not the additional standards of Midtown, unless that's amended in the future. The approval criteria for the general plan amendment is that it's consistent with the growth projections and economic, economic development goals, consistent with other parts of the general plan, provides for coordinated and harmonious development, is not consistent with the prevailing use and character of the area, those policies being implemented as a mix of uses, connectivity, and the pedestrian-oriented neighborhood center. With reference to the rezoning approval criteria, there has been a change in the surrounding area that um, this rezoning will acknowledge. The different category is more advantageous to foster redevelopment. 
the, it is consistent with the applicable general plan policies and existing and planned infrastructure will accommodate for those that future redevelopment of the site. And it will implement the Midtown vision guiding principles of connectivity and public benefits. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended to the governing body uh, approval of both the general plan amendment as well as the resigning. And that concludes the staff presentation. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Logson, you are the uh, applicant. You have a comment, presentation, something you want to bring to our attention? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the governing body, yeah, I have a presentation that's about a half hour. I'll uh, try. <laughs> Good, because I have about 50 minutes of questions for you. <laughs> uh, no, I don't have a whole lot to add. Certainly no presentation. Um, I will just say that, uh, as Heather said, this was kind of a forward-thinking action. Resolution 2022-12 did direct staff to uh, work on the land swap and so forth and acquire the parcels that we didn't own. And this just seemed like a natural step from there. As Heather said, it will also bring... Uh, some of the existing land uses on those parcels into compliance because technically they're non-conforming just like the campus was. And it it is also, uh, as she said, it's not part of the uh, master planned area, but for us as the applicants, it was just thinking of creating a larger midtown district someday, okay? So we don't own College Plaza or some of those other properties. We hope to work with them in the future. This was an opportunity for us to take land that we owned add to it and basically increase our options for the future. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, members of the public are invited to come to the podium for two minutes if you wish to address either of these two cases. And the same applies to anyone who is uh, watching on Zoom. We'd have to swear them in, but this is their opportunity to be heard. Anyone on Zoom? Anyone in the room? Uh, questions of staff from the governing body? Councilwoman Verial. Thank you, Mayor. Um, for the resolution section, I don't see the resolution in the packet material. I thought it was embedded maybe in the staff report, but it's not in there. And then we have an exhibit to the resolution, and then we have uh, findings and facts. The ordinance is in there for item F, but for E, I couldn't find the resolution. Mayor, Council, um, Councilor Villarreal, uh, I will have to look at that and I will get back to you, but we did draft that and I know that um, Aaron McSherry signed off on it, so I will look to see what happens. Okay. Other discussion? Councillor uh, Garcia. Quick question for clarification, I guess. Does that mean then we can only approve item F and postpone approval of item E until our next meeting? If the, the question for Mark. If it's not in the packet, that is correct, Councillor. Okay. So we would, we, we would uh, have a motion to delay or postpone a vote on item E and then a separate motion on item F. What? Yes. Can we approve item F without doing item E first? Because it's a rezone versus a general, I think we have to update the general plan amendment before we can rezone. So I don't think we could do either. Pat? Are we in a position where we need to uh, postpone need... both of these till our next meeting. Hey, hang um, on a sec. Let's find out from our, our lawyer. Mr. Mayor, yes, the general plan would need to be done beforehand, um, but I am not. I don't know how that didn't get in there. I'm looking to see if sometimes the one link is different than the other link. Um, Madam Clerk, are you finding it or are you not finding it? You're not finding it. Well, I would recommend in that case that we uh, entertain a motion. Well, first of all, we haven't closed the public hearing, but um, the absence of that uh, document uh, certainly prohibits us from uh, acting on it tonight. Are there other um, 
Uh, we haven't closed the, uh, you, you raised the question before we got to the, it's fine. Uh, any other uh, questions? Yeah, I know. Any other questions of staff about this item? If there aren't, I'm going to close the public hearing and I will entertain a motion uh, to postpone items E and F till our next meeting. Move to postpone until December 13th. Second. Um, it's the 14th. 14th. Second. So there's a motion to postpone items E and F till our meeting on the 14th. Is there discussion? No discussion. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Councilor Chavez? Yes. Councilor Lee Garcia? Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councilor Mayor Worth? Yes. Councilwoman Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Cassett? Yes. Mayor Weber? Yes. Motion has been approved. In that case, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good work.